I, I do agree. I think Homewell Life really had a considerable level up, but I think with another extra week T1, and this is also what happened, not in quite the same fashion, but this is literally the same thing that we saw last summer, and then they were able to get it done as well. And I, I just, I've been hurt too many times and like, oh man, another team. But when we look at the bracket as a whole, outside of DK beating KT, Basically, everything that we predicted did come true. I think the only thing that really shocked us was that T1 looked really bad in the Hanwha series. But we did predict mostly that Hanwha would win. Yeah. So we're actually still getting to... Yeah, we didn't. Yeah, we well, did, no, right? like, you, you guys did, yeah. Yeah, when we were at the, at the whiteboard. Way back. I'm not well, saying... Yeah, 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 I'm not saying the, the actual predictions. predictions. He yeah. betrayed the whiteboard prediction. I did. Yeah. <gasps> but but dun, dun. That's, that's my point. I feel like the way we got there was way more fun than expected. But we are still barreling towards yeah and the whiteboard we said at the time that t1 would come back and win this yeah. time so do I we still feel board. that way well, I, is I that do. gonna right. happen so yeah. my, my question is i i don't because the thing i saw from t1 today was that they skirmished and took sometimes poor fights the same way they did against hanwa and d plus didn't handle it well and d plus made a lot of mistakes like a lot a lot of mistakes fighting at inappropriate times for when their comp was coming online being constantly split and not because t1 like had a really nice rotation and then showmakers pushed off to the side on his vega he was just standing in the wrong place and he couldn't actually set up for cage zoning i feel like d plus really dropped the ball in that series i predicted t1 i didn't think it was going to happen this way i thought t1 was gonna level up i felt like i didn't really see t1 level up outside of some drafting adjustments the drafting adjustments were decent, but for the most part, I felt like T1 looked the same. It was a really fast turnaround just a few days ago. Obviously, they were 3 0 by Hanwa, so there's a longer period of time now leading into that lower bracket finals to where they can improve and hopefully get some solo queue games in. But at the moment, I just I wasn't inspired, and I was much more inspired by Hanwa series against Genji, where they played them insanely close. Like, you know, we were talking about how they should have won the series basically if Chovy didn't show up as big as he did and played as well as he did, especially those Azir games, um, the Hanwha might actually be in the finals already. So I compare the form I saw versus ha with Hanwha versus uh, Gen G, and then I compare T1, which felt like they kind of bumbled their way into a 3-0 through a lot of uh, mistakes from D+. I, I think like to vote for T1 now, as we did on the whiteboard, is to expect a massive amount of growth before that lower bracket finals. And yes, again, a short turnaround between the, the loss to Hanwha and the series today against D+, but nothing inspired me to think that this time around they'll have those good reads. But they've done that. Like they've The, the reason why I'm still thinking that we're just going to end up with the same fate isn't necessarily based in what we saw in terms of gameplay, because there I would generally agree, but just the fact that this roster has just been able to make every single finals internationally outside of MSI 2023 over the last two years, right? I feel like even though they are kind of clearly, I think that the, the Humble Life series wasn't great. I also agree with you that to, today was somewhat rough and there are still like carry ass performance, I think is still pretty much below where it should be, even on picks that are more normal. His Camille was, uh, I think, a low, like genuinely he got a couple worst. of later game high. Uh, he, game pre he pressed R on people. Like yeah, that. right. Yeah, that's, that's all you do. Yeah, that that's is. Well, well, yeah, but, baby. but like his flash carry out, the stun was carry, a little yeah, well, bit. Yeah, well, carry yeah, out, carry out failing E flashes on Camille. I think is not something to generally expect of this player. But I do have a lot of confidence, and I think that one of the big things that was true today is that owner is looking to be on the upswing again. I think owner is one of the players that needs to not be 
playing really poorly if they want to stand up against Hollow Life. And I imagine that it's just gonna it's it's just happening again. I hope I'm wrong. I hope you're right because I think Hollow's play I think does a big kind of difference earn it. between owner versus Lucid and owner versus Peanut or owner owner versus Canyon. I think that like that's fair. Lucid like because owner is you know still. Like his tenure in the LCK is half that of of Canyon or of uh, like of a peanut. quarter quarter of quarter peanut. of Peanut. No, most players <laughs> are a quarter of Peanut. Um, yeah. I think that like owner plays very differently when he's into a younger, less experienced player. I think that the confidence does go up, and it does make sense, right? But I think that when you're against someone that has been so successful against you, especially domestically, like Peanut, um, I think that that can get in your head. I don't expect that owner is going to be the carry. Um, but I do think that there is a high chance that we're not going to see Doran have the same good performance this time around that he did last time. I think that uh, I think that Faker is extraordinarily good, and in what we saw in the draft as well does show that you do have to ban Oriana against T1, which does mess up the uh, draft phase for Hama Life Esports a little bit more. Like I think a lot of us were a little bit confused by the perma ban on the Oriana, even though. We know that Fake is extraordinarily good at it. I didn't think it was an insta win. But what I saw today, uh, because of course, at the time of this recording, it is just after uh, T1 smash DK. What we saw today was that like they left it up and that was a whoopsie. They also played Diana into it and the early game for that matchup can be a little bit tricky. Yeah, and, true. Uh, just the way that he controlled the game though was uh, pretty impressive. Yeah, I mean, he played it extremely well and his shock waves were really solid in that game, um, especially around the Baron fight. Uh, I, I do think that is an issue. The Nico that I think was mostly used as a pick away by D+, mm -hmm. um, is another issue that they have to deal with. Um, I do think T1 has a wider berth of draft potential. Like They have a, a wide variety of, of champions they can pick and uh, compositions they can pick that perhaps they didn't show us today and they played Vayne top because they were like, oh man, this series seems done. And they just decided to do that instead. You know that Carrier, not to cut you off, but he did the interview on the space today, and he was like, "You know, we uh, we thought we were playing really hard to uh, execute compositions, so we went back to like easier kind of fundamentals today." And I'm like, in my head, I'm like, "You played Vein Top." <laughs> I mean, the fundamentals. I of mean, I guess Vayne as a whole, <laughs> yeah. I think that's like win lane win game is the fundamental. Really, maybe, maybe it is. When, when you when you yeah. think about it, isn't Vein just? It's just another form of TF. So they've played a yeah. million games with TF Top. You yeah. know, he wins lane, generates a lot of gold, and instead of seeing people with a gold card, he kills them or hits them against uh, fundamentals. Walls. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, beautiful. Just chase them down. I mean, I mean Zayas did look really good on Vayne as that well. Was, that kind of was the way that T1 won all spring and also how they won all spring last year where they had that insane run was just winning lane, getting gold leads, Faker roams, bot gets ahead, and then you just never fall behind. We had the stat today as well about uh, T1's like win rate when they have a gold lead at, I don't know if it was, they, it was a weird number. It was either eight minutes or like 14 minutes and it was extremely high. Um, whereas D pluses was actually quite low. Um, most teams kind of average towards you know seventy percent or higher when you have a gold lead at like twenty because it's pretty hard to mess that up like just how League of Legends works. But T one just they get leads, they snowball, they don't make bad decisions like D plus does for example when they get to the late game and have an advantage. But I think that the way that Hanwha plays their early games and how well they've been able to match T one in early skirmishes kind of messes with T1's whole MO. Because they're like, no, we're going to get ahead, we're going to fight constantly, and we're better than every other team at fighting early. We always win these, we have better rotations, we're faster on the play, we have perma prior with our lane uh, matchups we set up. Then they played against Hanwha, and they didn't get any of that. And they still tried to force the fights without prior and gave Zeri kills. You know, Viper is just like, oh, thank you very much for taking this fight. And I want to see that change. And I feel like, you know, today the series against D+, they skirmished a lot. Some of those skirmishes were in their favor that weren't against Hanwha. But I'm not ready to feel like they really changed too much just yet, and I think that they they definitely have more than they haven't than they have shown today because today they didn't really have to show anything serious, like they weren't pushed to the brink. But they will be against Hanwha, and it's really difficult to predict because the patterns we've seen from T1 in the past where they have improved, they have come in and, and played in front of crowds, especially they always have crowd advantage. The crowd is always cheering for them more than any other team. They have done it, but I I feel like for me to sit down and predict like. T1's done it before, so they'll do it again. It doesn't sit well with me. Like I can't, I can't physically see the proof, so I'm not ready yet to believe. 
Yeah, but haven't we seen it like every year? The, the that's my. I, I'm so. just. I'm hurt. I feel like this season is different, though. I think that Humble Life Esports made huge strides at the end of the season, especially like even in regular season, they won against T1, um, two to one, and that was kind of the beginning of T1 looking pretty shaky because they lost to Gen G, they lost to Humble Life Esports, and we're like. You know, maybe we do have a third team, and then we come into this playoffs, and still like a decent amount of people are predicting predicting T1, even though a lot of us did go for Hamalai Esports, and they get absolutely smashed. So, it just feels like a very different situation compared to other years, where it's like, yeah, we had the one where Faker came in off the injury, but that was kind of like a bit of a not an asterisk, but like a different situation from what you would normally expect, like a player coming that off was, an injury. You could see the we reason really why yeah, yeah. getting better. Yeah, yeah, we don't really know like exactly where he's going to be as well, but like as they started to play more and more and he looked totally fine, we kind of saw it. So I think this is definitely a different situation. I'm kind of with Wolf on this one. Remember, And I will be predicting Humble Life Esports for <laughs> remember that like first match. The KT uh, lower bracket finals where at that time, I think, what we think about Hanwha now versus T1, like we think much higher of Hanwha than I think we thought of K. At least, I mean, Valis and I are thinking Hanwha's going to win, right? But I think how I feel about Hanwha versus T1 right now is I have a much larger gap than I thought between KT, who I thought was going to win against T1 in that lower bracket finals in summer. And then I feel like KT messed that series up a lot uh, as well. Like Faker's champion pool was like... So it was like two champions. He played like Azir and Nico. That was it. Like that was all he could play. And then they didn't ban it until game three. And then they almost got the reverse sweep, right? And then Genji was just like pff, easy peasy, right? I feel like KT really underperformed in that series. I don't think Hanwha's going to make the mis same mistake. So one of the weaknesses of Hanwha throughout the entire season was their drafts weren't very robust. It's like his champion pool seems a little bit, you know, a little small. Mm -hmm. He's improved it a lot. So I don't know. I, I do hear what you guys are saying. But it almost feels like a, I don't, know, I don't want to say like a religious standpoint of view. We're like, no, I believe, <laughs> I believe in Faker. He will get it done. But like, to me, that's kind of like, I'm not ready to trust that he'll do it again. Because like Valdez said, the circumstances this time feel so different to me. I, I, I think that the series between the two teams has been competitive in both best of threes that they've had. I think that for me, even though Han Walive did do a really good job against them in the first best of five... I also think that was T1 for... Uh, we haven't really discussed it yet, and I, I feel like I don't yeah, really want... Yeah, we should ad address the elephant in the Yeah, room. which is right, like T1 having a lot of issues to DDoSing. Yeah. And I don't really... I don't think... Like, we don't really know, and it's impossible for us to know, so I feel like we've just not been I talking about it. I refuse to predict until I see some solo queue games on their <laughs> accounts. That's that's what I'm going to do. Um, <laughs> but but I, I think that not necessarily because of the practice, because, again, like, we it's impossible for us to know what impact that has. And also think it takes away from Hanwha, who, as I agree with you guys, have actually look, leveled up considerably. But I do think that the mental part of it is something that I can imagine is a lot better now that it, they've gotten it off their chest and they're kind of uh, in a situation, hopefully now, where they're still bringing out new picks like we saw today, even though I don't know if the vein top is going to be brought out against Keen. Uh, if they do actually end up making it. I mean, it. Keen would be jealous if they brought it out. Keen loves playing Keen, that Keen, stuff. Keen, Keen would love to himself Keen as well, would see yeah. it and be like, I'm playing Quinn next game and then insta locks it. That's what that's but, what happened. Yeah, but for me, it's the same reason why I was very confident that Gen Yu was going to win because I feel like Chovy has proven again and again and again that when it's do or die, he can make it work. Domestically. Domestically. Yeah. Why would Thanks, you? Reddit. I just why would you? Why would you? Why would yeah. you that, that, yeah, I mean, all, it hurts all of us, but it's a absolutely true. But domestically, he has. And for me, T one. It's only a four-hour flight to Chengdu. <laughs> it's not. It's I like it's. <laughs> you know, it's on the same continent. No, no, but he it was in true. Korea, and it still didn't work. Remember? True. It's but not if about you ignore that. <laughs> you know, then maybe there's like a better chance now. It but wasn't also, Seoul, though, right? No, but it wasn't Chovy's fault. It was outside of Seoul, so... Yeah, that's true. And, and the reason there was... You know, that's that's why... Because, like, as soon as you have to travel and you're on a team with Peanut, things go a little bit wrong, you know? Because mm -hmm. he has to change living environments. He wouldn't ride the like bus that. the other player. He rode his motorcycle to Busan. It was super weird. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> oh. Yeah, glad we got to uh. see the fan cam of that. Just Peanut, you know, hairs in the wind. Like, imagine if, like, so Genji just motorcycle. very easily sweep their way through MSI. We'd be pretty sad. If uh, Peanut doesn't make it there and doesn't get to prove I don't know. There's there's, there's no way I want to say anything when it comes to that. But yeah, I think for me, that series I really look forward to. 
it is partially faith, but it's also I think that T1 has the the thing that I really really appreciate about the play today is that they're still very willing to play what makes them good. And I think that if they can get everyone on the same page, if some of the individual underperformances of Caria, most notably, I think, today, and even Guma, I think, has still looked kind of like a... Guma's like a, Ash was crazy, man. Yeah, it's, it's, it's not even... like it's not, I don't even know if it was crazy good or crazy bad. Probably more towards... It was more just towards. crazy. It, was, it wasn't a, a direction. Yeah. It was just... He was, he was just being <laughs> he crazy. Was, he was really he being was crazy. He was kind of roped in by Caria a little bit. Like, yeah. Caria was like, all right, I'm going to bail you out quite literally. Yeah. Um, mm. you, you, go get him. I think that series is going to be really fun. I think it'll be very competitive. And I think that even if it ends up being like a free one, which I think is most likely, it'll be like really intense. And then whoever wins just gets free zero by Gen.G. I, I actually don't, know about I don't that. think there's any chance for either of them. I don't think Hanwha Life Esports come back and do anything. I I, I don't know about that. I, I feel like if Hanwha goes to the finals, so. they play 10% better or Trophy just happens to play 10% worse on the day. I feel like it's going to be about what happens on that day. I wouldn't predict Hanwha right now, but we'll see how they play, obviously, in the lower bracket finals. If they crush T1, though, they have the momentum. And I think Chobi if Hanwha win, day, like, they stand a chance against Gen.G. Yeah, I, I think they if do. If they T1, lose, I, think, no. I don't think Hanwha are going to win. <laughs> That's what I think. It's guaranteed. <laughs> True. Sorry, I had you to. got maxed. <laughs> so, so, the, so, you know, they will play in the lower finals. So that, you know, that it has is a been a benefit so it far. Is that buff. has been the buff. So maybe I do have to change I, my stance a little bit. Well, it, I mean, it hasn't, it hasn't. I I think that I've we've seen examples of Gen G last spring where it was a buff. And then last summer, we saw why it's not a buff. Because if you're overly reliant on something, in the finals, you get banned out and you just lose. It's true. So true. maybe T1 will ban Nautilus. I just feel like Hanwha Esports really pulled down all the stops in that series, and they got stopped by one player. And that one player is still there. So, like, you're going to develop, you're going to get better, you're going to learn more from the drafts, maybe, but also Genji will, and then you're going to go up, and then it's like, well, Tovi's still there. Can we even beat this guy? I mean, we played our best, and it really felt like Hanwha Esports were playing, like, a sick best of five. They should have won, and the joke was like, well, Hanwha Esports won four games, but Tovi, you know, won three of them, so, you know. He just won it for the entire team by himself. And I think that that, so. on one hand, it was a really impressive performance, and it's the MVP performance. That's the that's the series where you're like, that's right, like the MVP is certified, like it's proof. Mm. We've we've had past seasons where the MVP comes through, then flops in the playoffs, and we're like, ooh. Um, Got it, Woods. Yeah. <laughs> KT. Has, yeah. has <laughs> all pro number one. We'll get to that later. <laughs> oh, um, boy. But I do think that the fact that Toby had to do it on his own is not actually a strength of G uh, Gen G. Now, obviously, if the rest of the team plays, you know, 10% better each, then obviously, I, like, they Keen, smash, really right? Also well, Keen and Kenyon that, were right? also fine. No, like, I feel like the bottom lane was was really rough. And Kenyon was just, like, Sejuani. Yeah. Well, yeah, well, that's, but that's potato, not as a potato. Like, yeah. yeah, but that's because... And he, that's not his fault. Yeah. Yeah, but actually, like, this Sejuani. is something that Trovi actually spoke about as well. He was like, when we did the interview after the game, he was like, I carried today. Like, yes, today it was me. But the thing about Gen G is the fact on any given day... Whoever's performing can be supported by everyone else, right? And Trevi's had games where he's played Karma, right? And it's Pays that's popping off. Uh, he's had games where they've just jumped on the the keen carry train of his Cassante monster type situation, mm -hmm. right? Like we've seen that many times. They could play Brand Jungle again, and Canyon could have his time in the sun if they'd like to. We know that he can carry on Lee Sin if you want. Like I think that in their series against Hanwa, they relied on Trovi because on the day Trovi was feeling it. And I think when you do have someone that's like in really good form and like even though they may have lost game one or something like that, they're like, guys, I'm playing so well today. Like, just give me the resources. He almost Let's go. carried game one by himself. But that's as what well. I mean. That's exactly <laughs> my point, right? So like that happens and they're like, all right, all aboard. Let's hop on the Trovi bus. You I know? think there's going to be some big adjustments for Hanwha because, you know, Trovi relied on one champion in the series, which is probably a boon to him if they ban the Azir, then he gets to do something else. But yeah. also, um, I think there's a lot to study from that, and they, they saw it with their own eyes right in front of them. And I think there were some big errors of judgment from Viper, who played far too aggressively after game one, I would say. And That, that uh, one dash forward on Zeri will yeah, be etched in, in my mid, brain, yeah. dude. It's yeah. very Jackie Love. Mm. Both him and Pace did a lot of, did a lot of that. So uh, I feel like I'm not ready to predict that series until I see Hanma Life's form. Right now, would, obviously, if someone put a gun to my head, I would lean towards Gen G. Um, but... I, I just I don't know. Like I uh, before what about this, he won't make it. 
before this series or before this playoffs, I would have told you guys, as we did on the whiteboard, like Genji win this no matter what. There's like no chance. It's three zero. Like I even I was the guy who wrote the three zero on the board. Now I'm not so sure. And that's exciting because it's, you know, we've gone to most of our finals the last few seasons knowing, okay, we know exactly what's going to happen. But I, spring was a big upset. Spring last year was cool. That was surprising. Yeah. That was the only one in since we joined. Because no, when we joined the LCK, it was just double dumb one. And yeah. then it was yeah, all uh, according to plan. If T1 beat Homolife Esports in a best of five, do they get stronger? And have a chance against Genji no, I think or Genji three zero them, and it would be an eleven zero if given the chance. I think that the problem for T one is I that agree. event. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, is that eventually like these type of? I think that T one have a great chance of beating Genji when they meet at MSI. I'm not even. I'm yeah. not even joking. That's like true. it's a, like, uh, and with with stuff like this. I truly, truly, and I think a lot of people, I've seen even a lot of fans of other teams say this, and people that aren't fans of the LCK, I really hope Chovy wins an international title, because the reality is this guy didn't win anything for like three years, and then since he won, he hasn't stopped. Like, he's just been... But wait, if he gets the win. download on MSI, an international tournament... Well, that's my point! Does he just win forever? Yeah. Well, I hope so. Because, like, he's forgotten how to lose in the in, in the LCK. Yeah. And so, like, if he learns how to win internationally, is, isn't it, like, every single reel going to be, like, Chovy lifting, like, every trophy? Like, we just cut forward to, like, 2035, and it's, like, just Chovy with a couple of gray hairs lifting another trophy, and he's like, aha, another one to put in the back pocket. Oh, God. I would subscribe to that. That sounds fun. I'm kind of scared of that reality. <laughs> Good I Lord. I feel like one thing about... T1 that I felt since playoffs started is they don't have a one single player who you can trust is going to pop off. Like Hanwa had a uh, Viper, you know, uh, KT we thought was going to be probably BDD. Um, didn't end up coming true. And some thought Pyoshik, to be honest. I thought Pyoshik. Kwangdong, we knew Cuz was there, right? You, you knew that was going to be the guy. Genji has Chovy. And T1. They kind of live or die by each other. Like, I feel like there's not one player. Like, it used to be Faker. You know, we were like, oh, this guy is so incredibly good. His decision-making in terms of his side lane pressure, where he's able to turn team fights. I haven't felt that from him that much in, in playoffs. Obviously, in regular season, it was a lot of that. But that's one thing that I feel like is, is missing to me about T1. I think it's still Zayas, even though he's also sometimes to his own detriment. I feel like he's one of the most warping players that's still in the in the playoffs at this point. I think actually this big strength for, of Hanwa for me is that they are probably, and I can't believe I'm saying this about a team with Doran, but in playoffs, they've looked like the most, I don't, like, I don't think, Viper has had the worst performance individually probably, and that's, like, he had a couple of bad moments, but also it's because the bar for Viper is extremely high because he's Viper, right? Yeah. And, and we collectively still, I think, rate him as, I think AD carries in general, haven't looked great this playoffs. Mm. The bottom lanes have just the kind bottom of, lanes have I just not like yeah, aiming the most. Strangely enough, I think aiming, I, like, aiming's I was Lucian. Like, yeah, I think aiming was the best. <laughs> Isn't Lucian. that weird? His yeah, Lucian. his Lucian. Right. Right. was pretty Ox. good too. Yeah, yeah that's yeah. fair. Yeah, I mean Zeka, arguably really a little bit more consistent than Viper. He helped set Viper up, and then Viper pops off later. But it wasn't Viper necessarily yeah. doing it on his own. And, and, like actually. As as uh, I think we all read this, Osaka well, also had a great series. I feel like Humble Life actually is the most consistent team, but I think that for T1, and that's also why if T1 do end up winning, we do have to they do have to find a way to have Zayas not just lose to Doran again for what feels like the <laughs> I don't know how many of time. That's I don't know what it is like. I swear, like Doran just has it in his brain. Like he remember just, he that knows how Zayas moves. Like he just who he just was it knows. against that he like. Mind controlled him into TPing. I forgot who he was. Was it Keen? I think it was Keen on yeah, Urgot. No, he mind controlled, like Doran yeah, he just mind stands control. there. Yeah. Doran just stands there, looks at Keen, and Keen's like, "I'm gonna TP into five people and die." <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> that was game one, right? Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. He managed to get the yerk out of his head after oh. that. Uh, shout outs to any Animorphs watchers twenty years ago. Um, yeah, thank thank wow. goodness that one. Uh, <laughs> I wasn't was a okay. watcher; so, I was a reader. But yeah, so yeah sorry. <laughs> that's dope. That's better. To uh, for, for me, the main thing why I feel like, uh, even though obviously Chovy is the obvious argument for Gen G, is that if Hanwha Life couldn't beat Gen G on a day where 
it might have been Pace's worst series. I mean, probably the DK series was probably worse than this one, but it was still like I think him and Lahens have really not done a great job. If they weren't able to capitalize in that series, I'd be pretty skeptical that they'd be able to do it when we get to the finals. <laughs> And welcome to the KSPO Dome. We are here for the 2024 Spring Finals, the lower finals here for the LCK. It is T1 up against Homolife Esports. I am Valdez. With me is Huni and uh, Mauritz Chronicler, who is feeling pretty good today, uh, pretty special. How are you guys feeling today? I mean, it's it's a, such a big event. It's like really grateful to be to participate in this such a really big moment, you know? Yeah, I, I am always mega excited for the road shows and i think this is on paper a match that might rival what we had lost summer between kt and t1 i think a lot of people expect this one to go the distance can't wait to see if it actually happens yeah a lot of the predictions you guys will eventually see will be uh, pretty fun but this is a very special day for a, a certain reason we have a guy here who is the birthday boy on this space on this desk happy birthday chronicler um, <laughs> how does it feel to be old, 30 years old today? I, I don't feel any different. I still uh, spent my life uh, talking about a video game, so I, I, I don't <laughs> think as long as that stays the same, I don't think we're really feeling substantially different. It's, oh, 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 we got the, we got the help, uh, help me out here, Hoon. Can we, can we, can we make it happen? Yeah. I don't know. Yeah, yeah. Let's give it, it a go. It works, yeah. Okay. Oh, wait, let me. Let's see. Can he nail it? Yes, he did. There we go. Happy birthday to Chronicler. Happy birthday! <laughs> Yay! So now, <laughs> any birthday wish for your um, 30th birthday, Chronicler? This does still go down. Uh, good series today and tomorrow. <laughs> Give me 10 games. 10 out of 10. Thank you. <laughs> this song, by the way, is so it's, good. It's really sending me, guys. <laughs> um, <laughs> <laughs> All right, so happy oh, birthday to Chronicler. It says happy birthday, Crony Keckler. Oh, Crony Keckler. Oh, that's amazing. There you go. <laughs> Throw some kecks in there. <laughs> Look at that. Look at the... That's beautiful. <laughs> that's amazing. There's no better way to celebrate your 30th birthday than with a kazoo. And happy birthday, Crony <laughs> Keckler. <laughs> I love the kazoo, man. It's perfect. Um... So, happy birthday to Chronicler. We do have a series to talk about here. So, on that note, let's jump into the playoff bracket and talk about what has happened so far. Biggest surprise here, I think, is specifically the T1 Hanwha series. Many of us felt like that was going to go towards Hanwha, but specifically the way in which it did, even with some of the circumstances for T1 as they were, I think was a really big surprise. And then the fact that DK made it, Given KT's uh, circumstances, I think not that shocking. Yeah, I mean, there's a lot of 3-0. Like, that actually makes even more excited. Like, HLE 3-0-T1 and T1 3-0-DK, and uh, it's a rematch. It's HLE T1, and this is, the t this is the day. So, I'm so excited. It is a rematch of the playoff match that we did have earlier in round two, actually, between T1 and Homolife Esports. And that one, the 3-0, was heavily in favor of Homolife Esports in the 3-0. And we are going to take a look at some of those highlights just to try to show off what happened because T1 weren't really the team that we were expecting them to be in this first matchup. We still saw a lot of what makes T1 T1 in the way that they were uh, very decisive of how they started fights, very aggressive when they thought they had an angle, but the angles weren't really there. And particularly against a team like Hanwha that is so insanely consistent when it comes to playing the map mid to late and playing front to back team fights with what is right now the best performing, bo uh, best performing bot lane in the league makes it really, really hard and I think led to a very one-sided series. Yeah, I mean, it's a really important point, uh, which is like, I think especially the round two, the T1 HLE series, like from there, I think the T1 take it away was like, they still had a really increased the fight selection, but at the same time, when they actually kind of locking off, HLE shows like really, really consistent, like the fight, and especially after 20, 20 minute plus the macro play, 
and the team fight as well. But the T1 was actually doing a really, really great job like from the regular season, but it's just slowly, slowly kind of going downhill of the their consistency of the just fight selection. And I mean, that's why the, the game was like so, the whole series was like really, really one-sided for HLE favor. And as per usual, there's always some talk about drafts afterward. I think the priority on some of the picks might be a little bit shifted. We saw this in the DK series as well. But to me, not unlike some other series that T1 has played in the past, it really just felt like gameplay. I think Home Life on the day just looked way better, basically across the map. Bot lane, obviously, for Home Life has been performing exceptional. And then towards the top side of the map, T1 wasn't able to generate the leads that they normally did. And that, I think, was a really big reason as to why these aggressive plays didn't really end up working out. I mean, because it's like also you make, I kind of mentioned it of the, the draft, right? Like, I think the first game and the game, game one and game two, the, those first two games is starting with the TF rookie. And that's how they, that's, that's like actually kind of the seats of how they want to play, especially from the bottom. Like, they want to generate all elite goal, like, and also the controlling of all the game, especially for T1. And that, that, that didn't really help at all. Like, the, especially for Quirky, like, sure, like, it's really strong when actually have a package time, but T1 is not the actual team that they want to only fight when they have a package. There's also Delight, and we have to talk about him because he individually, I think, was the standout in this particular series because his engages were just absolutely exceptional. The fact that he got his Nautilus repeatedly was a, was a very common talking point afterwards because I don't even think like Nautilus in isolation is like a, a type of support that you can't deal with in any sh way, shape or form. But if your fights aren't looking clean and Nautilus just gets the hook after hook, utilize always CC, it makes it really hard. And I really think that the drafts today will look very different from what they did to try and maybe play more towards the strength. For Hama though, I still think that even in the Gen G series, they didn't really get tested that much in terms of draft. And that might be the case here today. Yeah, I think um, this is going to look totally different, right? And I, I think you're going to see that in some of the predictions, right? Some people will watch this and say, OK, Humble Life Esports got the better of them in three games. But a eh, little bit of a fluke, you know, maybe T1 weren't totally uh, prepared for it. And Humble Life Esports came in very ready. So uh, hoping that this one is a bit more competitive uh, because we did see that this first series was kind of a wash. I mean, three games, a lot of the team fights were, were, were very one-sided. It wasn't really like a back and forth like we saw from Genji and Home Life Esports on the other side of the bracket. Yeah, I mean, it's just like a lot of time, like it was like question mark when actually T1 was the starting five, so. By the way, guys, uh, you know, this uh, organization pre-franchise for the side of Home Life Esports, we did have, of course, uh, the Rock Tigers, Scoot Tigers as well. These two teams played off against each other in this very same arena. Now it has been rebranded. Back then it was the Olympic Gymnastics Arena. Now it is the KSPO Dome. And that was in 2016. So these orgs go way back. It's also remarkable that the free zero that Humble Life got was the first time that they actually did win. We saw a lot of close calls, obviously the world's qualifier which is where Chovy uh, did end up making it to Worlds after all, when he wasn't at Hanwha roster, World Semis, which is a very memorable matchup for many reasons. We'll see today. I hope, as long as it's not a free zero, I think most people will feel a lot happier because we were expecting a lot when we came into that and it didn't really deliver. Yeah, I mean, especially after we franchise this, like, they actually got the final first win. And even today, I think it has a still really have a huge favor for HLE since they beat yeah. the 3-0. That experience, you can't really ignore it. Yeah, absolutely. And whoever does uh, win tonight, of course, is going to have the experience of playing a full best of five against one of these teams. And then maybe they'll have a chance up against Gen Z. We'll have to wait and see how that does go for this finals weekend a bit later on. But let's talk about Peanut versus Faker here because these two guys also go way back. They were obviously on those rosters in 2016, and Peanut actually has done pretty well against Faker over the years, especially on the recent Gen G rosters. That, that's the big thing. A lot of heavy lifting being done by both Gen G as an organization, but Peanut himself has always been talked about as how important he was to the functioning of that roster. The organization themselves really uh, throughout that period of dominance that they had in 2022, 2023, always talked about this guy is the captain, he's the shot caller, he's the one who gets things done. And seeing Peanut continue that level of form on a Hanwha that sure is made of exceptional players, 
but still being able to have the same impact when it comes to his jungle picks. Taking like two free bans basically every single game really says a lot about the form that he's in. I mean, regardless, I mean, I'm I'm from both of them, so yeah. it's like really good to see, honestly. Like, it's kind of sad to that. Like, it's kind of sad that like they're actually facing each other, so one guy kind of have to lose. But I wish, I'm, I hope both of them perform individually well. If yeah. that makes sense. I mean, that's all you can hope for. And obviously, the fact that they continue to face off against each other over and over means that they are, you know, two of the best players that we do have in this LCK. Let's talk about objective stats for these two teams in the head to head uh, because we have seen some trends uh, to either side. Big thing here is that we see that Humba Life is playing much more heavily towards the Herald, which gives a lot of early map control and a lot of early gold, which I think helps you skill really nicely when you get to the second and third fight whereas T1 has been prioritizing Dragons. The downside of that is that if you don't win your early bot lane, which unfortunately for Humble Life, I think, or for a T1 in the series against Humble, they weren't really able to consistently get, it does take away a lot of what has made this team strong in playoffs. Yeah, which is like you kind of forced to take the Void Grop because you got pushed out yeah, from Void the pro lane. lane. That's, 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 like, not, <laughs> uh, that's not, that's not so the best. That's not yeah. the strength point, but still, like they do kind of take it. And I think the most important thing, like as you said, like the Dragon taken away, it has to be done by the T1. Otherwise, it's got to be from just HLE favor. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I'm not a big fan of the consolation prize that is the Void Grubs. Um, getting first place in that doesn't really mean anything. So, yeah, at least they are first in that stat. Uh, let's talk about the points of the match as well coming into this one, because definitely a lot of stuff to talk about between these two squads. Humble Life Esports to attend their first finals since re-franchising. Uh, as we did mention before, it is a rematch from when it was, I think, Koo Tigers back then in 2016, eight years ago, and we're fighting here in the same location. Big thing here as well, T1 has the opportunity to go for six consecutive finals. They are, as far as I know, also the record holders currently with five, but they are equaled by Gen G. Would be incredible regardless of who makes it here, but I think many of us are kind of hoping for Hanwha just so that we get something that isn't T1 Gen G. It uh, hasn't really anything to do with T1 specifically, but we've seen this matchup so many times. And it would be so cool to see a new organization. And yeah, sure, there's a couple of the same players that were on Gen G. But even that, I think, really ups the stakes if those two teams face off against each other again. Yeah, I mean, it's for T1, for sure, like, they're going to be... It's like, it's, like, it's there, as you said, it's their hometown. Like, it's it's uh, actually, the even though it's, uh, it's a loser final, it's a one of the staff that it's going to the actual final. And they're going to be a, they won out against a DK3-0. I mean, that's a huge boost up for sure. Even though, like, the progress wasn't, like, actually 100% accurate. But I think it's their own the way. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, we do have these two top laners meeting head-to-head -head since uh, nine days ago in playoff round two. Zeus, Zeus rather, did play the vein top. And uh, Doran currently in pretty solid form, which is kind of interesting. I mean... That's not really the word it's we would use, but uh, I think he has been good against Zeus. That's the peak thing with Doran. Doran is just, he has been effectively the same player, and I feel like his highs have gotten higher just as much as his lows have just stayed the same <laughs> as he is Doran. But into specifically T1, I think that he really finds a way to... And, and the big thing for me isn't even just lane, where he did have, obviously, the Gragas performance last year, but it's also the fact that in some of his bad games, I don't feel like he gets to have the mid to late game impact. Against T1, even if his laning phase is rough, I swear this man just somehow always sees the angles when we get to those team fights. And I think T1 also finally they kind of figure out like what they want to do, especially with the vein top as well. But I mean, the vein top probably I don't think we're gonna see one more time. Maybe, yeah. maybe we will, but I mean it's against the. I mean it's also Doran's side. It's like he somehow like without when he actually playing without the, any pressure. Somehow I mean he actually managed to be a most important player in the game in the series. I mean that's how I, he got the final MVP. Like which is. It's incredible. Like, no one was expecting it at all. Azeus, to me, is also the player that still is the most impactful individually on T1. Yeah, you did mention that in the Pog State, by the way. Uh, shout out to all you Pog State enjoyers. Uh, let's talk about the bottom lane here as well, because Viper and Delight have been insane in late game scenarios, in team fight scenarios. Guma and Karia have definitely been known for their strange picks. Obviously, Karia picking up 80 carries, Rumble, stuff like that in the support role, but also just controlling the lane in general. But 
has been interesting to watch them develop over the last uh, bunch of weeks. Uh, we have seen this trend, I think, start, and it's come back and forth, right? We saw it last year in spring as well, but during Worlds, that was really something that Guma and Carrier started with the double AD carry, but just at some point started counterpicking in every single matchup to just try and win bot lane. T1, I think, has become really reliant on it for that to work out because Zeus plays very far forward, so if bot lane doesn't throw pre uh, pressure, it doesn't really work. And the downside to trying to play that style into Viper and Delight is that they have been so insanely consistent. It's so hard to punish these guys, and it feels like regardless of matchup, actually getting a sizable lead through bot is made so hard. Whereas versus a team like GNG, Pays and Lance have actually struggled pretty considerably in lane. I feel like Viper and the Light just aren't going to give you those same type of openings. Yeah, I mean, especially the Genji series, Genji HLE series, it's still the Viper deal, like, kind of, like, it was a struggle. It showed a little bit of it, but I think that's just, like, how meta is right now. Like, the solo laners are really strong, the mid lane is strong, oh, yeah. the jungle champions, all the champions are, has a point CC. Like, those kind of things, are, it makes it even harder, but it's even more impressive that, like, Viper not making mistake and not dying at all. Like, having zero deaths is having these consistent performances. He's been incredibly consistent. I think the bottom lane of uh, How Life Esports is going to be one of these things we look at as uh, a big plus side for them. It has been, as we mentioned many times, even over the course of the season, probably the best bottom lane duo. And we do have some stats here as well in the isolated deaths, as Kuma hasn't had too much luck, but uh, I suppose Carrie has been out on the map and stuff, whereas Viper has not really died solo at all. Yeah, and that's something that I think partially is due to Guma. He hasn't had the best, best playoffs. I think he's been fine, but he hasn't really been a standout. But it's also, as you point out, the way that he is used. He is generally just considered you pick something like a Varus that will have an impact no matter what. Karia is going to get the crazy picks. He's the one who's going to have the impact. And Guma just kind of has to take the hit so that they can play towards the skirmishes on the top side. But it also highlights the consistency of Viper. The fact that this man is so hard to take down especially if he is on something like Azari, is something that Humble Life really relies on. Yeah, I mean, like, echoing again, like, especially the Viper, if he's showing, like, a little bit of a struggle, actually, just a little bit of the inconsistency, like, if today it's actually happening, I think it would be really favorable for T1, but if he keep the zero death, having perfect game, it's really red sign for the T1. I think as long as he doesn't dash into a hey, lane in the mid lane for no reason. Time. Um, that you happened. Know, there are oopsies. There's a lot of pressure on these players, and, uh, you know, they make mistakes. It happens. Let's talk about the supports, as uh, these have been two of our best supports in the entire league for quite a while. The fight between Delight, who really is the archetypical support, just plays the classic support champions. He is a Blitzcrank that he likes to pull out, but particularly unengaged. Ever since the Breon days, this guy has been absolutely exceptional at starting fights and finding angles, whereas Karia, which you can see by courtesy of his DPM being unreasonably high for a support, loves to get creative with things like the Camille as well as the Rumble. Yeah, I mean, look how many wins like Delight actually has with the melee support, but the Karia got some the Rumble support win. And also, this guy actually rolls over in all the game. It's so happy to see it, like just solo king, so just basically solo killing an enemy carry. But I think this is not actually, it's not OP. Like if it's OP, it's gotta be banned every game or it's actually just winning every game, but it's actually okay. not. Boonie's saying Rumble isn't OP. I'm getting because, some big messages here. <laughs> because I'm not, I'm not there. Uh, yeah, obviously, because you're not. Obviously, sense. if I'm there, I'm gonna win every game, but like they're not, they're not Hoonie. So, I mean, obviously, like that's why the regular season or like even playoff, the win rate isn't like the greatest, I'll say, but still, the two on the fact that they sub a Zeus that can actually just have a flex pick with and even carry actually prove that he can actually play, it's a huge factor. I feel like every support in playoffs so far has tried their hand at this, um, whether on the on the Rift here in playoffs or you know in solo queue, and it's gone up in pick percentage, in ban percentage. This is a real support pick nowadays, so we might be seeing more of this uh, today. Wouldn't be too surprised. Let's talk about the mid laners as well, because it's here, still back, still here, unfortunately, fortunately for these mid laners, I guess, because everybody loves to play this thing. Our, our meta tyrant is back, Azir has uh, made his way, and, and obviously we've saw Chovy with, I think, one of the biggest 1v9 performances we've seen since uh, Chovy on Yone. Uh, that is something that both mid laners today are going to gravitate towards as well. For Zekka, it's just because I think Azir is a really strong pick, and they want to deny it from Faker. For Faker, it's because his role in the team is to try to be that facilitating a team lane or a team fight mid, and Azir does that exceptionally. We saw this with the Corky as well. The lack of mid pressure, I think, is something that T1 
if the side lanes and bot lane aren't playing well, they can't really deal with. So I don't think we'll see the Corky here today unless it is a high level of scaling on Humble Life's side, which to be fair, they do like their Azir, Rek'Sai, and Zeri drop. So see if that uh, ends up happening. Yeah, I mean, I don't think we're going to see like the random blind pick Corky, right? It's going to be actually about the response pick. So I think also the, from Zeka, the lose is actually it's against the Gen G. So it's kind of really understandable. His individual performances of the playmaking was really incredible. It definitely was. And I think the mid lane, as we talked about the support, I think both of these lanes are going to be huge in terms of impacting how this series is going to look and who's really going to take this one home. Speaking of which, let's talk about our predictions. Always a fun topic that everybody loves to discuss. Um, all of us have gone for three twos, except Chronicler has gone for the three two in favor of T1. Anything to say for yourself? That's <laughs> uh, I, I the odd man I, out on this desk. Yeah, I don't believe that we get to have something else. I mean, yeah, it's a DKT1 series. The T1's execution wasn't clean. Like, it was a 3-0, but still, like, I did say it's a still boost up. It's a still really good good stuff of the, what T1 did, but guess what? The opponents today is not DK. It's ATLE, brother. Yeah, I, I remember the last time we were like, oh, T1, they're not playing that well. Last summer, you know, they're not going to get it. They've made seven out of eight grand finals, including internationals. That's not just domestic. And yeah, you can talk about how they didn't win a lot of them. They didn't win Worlds! I think this team just levels up. I think it's T1 Genji again. I, I kind of, on, on, a, on a very fundamental level, hope that I'm wrong because I would love something new. But T1, I think they've pulled through too many times. I think that uh, that is what's going to happen here today. I expect that they will, in fact, level up. It'll be, it'll be tough. But I think they got what it takes to win here today. Yeah, I, I think both of you have good points. I do agree with Huni on this one. I just feel like Humble IP Sports' form currently is better than we have seen from a lot of teams in the LCK for a very long time. So I think they're just really on point. They had T1's number before. I think it's going to be much closer this time around, but still had to go the way of Humble IP Sports. So we'll have to wait and see. And you guys can see more of the predictions a little bit later when the casters come on. But for now, let's hear from the coaches and see what they have to say about the upcoming series. 네, 안녕하세요. 한승민 e스포츠 감독 댄디 최인규입니다. 어, 일단 개인적으로는 오랜만에 이렇게 큰 무대에서 게임을 할수 있게 돼서 굉장히 어, 좀 재밌을 것 같고 어, 살짝 긴장도 되고 그런 기분이고 또 T1이라는 강팀과 이런 어, 결승 최종전, 진출 최종전이라는 곳에서 붙게 되어서 어, 팬분들께 재밌는 경기 보여드릴 수 있어서 좋은 것 같습니다. 일단 플레이오프에서 저희가 T1을 이겼을 때 느낌을 최대한 좀 살리려고 했고 또 이제 T1이 잘하는 또 강점적인 부분들을 최대한 억누르는 방향으로 좀 준비를 했습니다. 어 일단 선수들은 큰 무대 경험이 많아서 또 오랜만에 이런 큰 무대 와가지고 굉장히 또좀 즐겁게 게임을 할, 한다는 마인드인 것 같고 또 오늘 컨디션도 굉장히 괜찮은 것 같습니다. 저희 이제 하하생명 e스포츠 창단 이후 첫 결승 진출 기회이기 때문에 그만큼 굉장히 간절하고 열심히 준비했기 때문에 네, 좋은 경기력으로 보답드릴 수 있도록 하겠습니다. 감사합니다. 안녕하세요. T1 감독 김정균입니다. 어, 이렇게 큰 무대에서 다시 경기를 할수 있게 되어서 어, 정말 뜻깊게 생각하고 있고요. 오늘 경기 꼭 이겨서 결승전 진출하겠습니다. 어, 지금 버전에 맞게 정말 많은 연습과 다양한 픽, 운영, 정말 많은 걸 준비해서 이렇게 또 다전제에서 오늘은 정말 좋은 모습 보여드릴 수 있을 것 같습니다. 어, 지금 당장 개개인 선수의 컨디션을 좀 제가 판단하기는 어렵지만 나쁘진 않다고 생각하고 있습니다. 정말 다양하게 많은 연습을 했고 특히 우리 바텀이 굉장히 잘한다고 생각했기 때문에 어, 어떠한 구도, 어떠한 픽이든 더 좋게 영향력을 많이 끼칠 수 있을 거라고 생각하고 있습니다. 어, 오늘 승리해서 꼭 6연속 진출 이어나갈 수 있도록 하겠습니다. 정말 많이 준비했고요. 오늘 좋은 경기력 보여드리겠습니다. So there you have it, both coaches giving their words. I feel like I could feel the weight of a lot of pressure on the shoulders of, of Goma right now, where on the other side, Danny was like, yeah, you know, the players are feeling pretty good, you know, <laughs> back at a nice big stage, feeling nice. I kind of love they did it on stage as well. Yeah. With already the crowd coming in. It's very different from the usual press room backdrop that we have. It definitely a lot of pressures over there, but I mean, that's, you know, they always beat in the pressure, so it's no worries. 
Yeah, I feel like uh, pretty much every player here can handle the pressure, but we'll have to wait and see. Uh, guys, by the way, if you missed a chance to get uh, tickets for these finals, you can visit your local CGV and watch them and have uh, a nice viewing party with a bunch of other LCK fans anywhere pretty much in Korea. Don't, don't sleep on the popcorn. CGV popcorn, we've been, we've been enjoying that a lot. It's fire. It's really good. <laughs> it's, it's fire, man. Yeah, it's, it's really good, and uh, I feel like better than just you know watching at home alone or something like that. Gathering up with your friends and watching these finals is uh, is a lot of fun. So we're just about ready to hop into this one, guys. We have done our little pre-show bit. We've talked a lot about who's going to win, what we think, the analysis, but it all does come down to how the game is actually played. So I hope all 10 players are ready to go for this final. Should be a banger. I really hope we get five games as well. Just five, one time. And we'll see you after the opening. Hope you guys do enjoy it. And we'll see you on the other side.
Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the Uri Bank 2024 LCK Spring Lower Bracket Finals. It's a mouthful, and it's a mouthful for a reason, because this is where we get down to brass tacks. I'm Atlas. I'm joined by Orcs and Wolf as we bring you this best of five. It is going to be an incredible best of five between two old rivals, Hanwha Life Esports and T1. It's been three years since we've seen T1 miss an LCK Finals, and Hanwha Life may break the streak now. Yeah, I feel like other times it's very much just been okay. You know, Gen GT1 have looked clearly ahead of everyone else, but especially with the recent matchup between these two, uh, I think a lot of people are favoring Hanwha. Yeah, and I think that that's where the smart money's at, given the uh, the brevity of the 3-0 that Hanwha Life Esports did put T1 through. But when T1's backs are against the wall, it is generally the time that they thrive. And we'll see whether that is going to be the case today. And let's dive into our predictions on that note, because uh, this is where I can um, let you guys know that I don't believe that we're going to have a different final. Uh, you can see on the Korean side, though, definitely a little bit more in favor of uh, Hanwha Life Esports here. Yeah, a little bit surprised that the Korean side went so heavily Hanwha Life favored. Myself and Valdez, I think, were the most outspoken Hanwha predictors, Huni and Ox as well, who weren't on Poxy, were also going for the Hanwha Life roads. Chronicler, kind of an odd man out on this one, the T1 prediction. Yeah, I feel like he's kind of just old reliable. We know they're going to make it back. That's his view. He's like, they have always bounced back and they've always managed to make finals in such an often occasion. But for me, I feel like you can't sort of ignore the form, especially because if it wasn't for Chovy's insane performance, then we might have seen Hollow Life already in finals. You believe yep. in Fate Atlas? Well, I mean, I just believe in Jonas Strong. I just copied his homework. Me and g Sun were just waiting for Jonas Strong to put his prediction in, and we were like, all right, well, I guess that's what we're doing because that guy is the GOAT. 73% um, of you guys on X do predict that T1 are going to be able to take this. I think it's a little bit more of a popularity contest at this point in time. Um, but Hanwha Life Esports getting 27% is actually pretty impressive to me. Yeah, uh, T1 also, you know, having that seven out of eight finals with this roster, they have only missed a single one and have otherwise just been so insanely dominant. And every time the fans count them out, every time the analysts count them out, they get it done. They did it just last season against KT Rolster. Everyone almost unanimously favoring KT Rolster to go to that finals, and T1 shut them down despite Faker's late recovery from, the, from, the, from his injury, despite his relatively small champion pool at the time. They still made it happen. They might make it happen again tonight. Also just a team who have so consistently made deep runs in internationals, need to win here to make MSI and I think we'll be very reliant. Well, first, first yeah, I got Doran coming in for Hanwha Life Esports, and I think he's had a pretty big step up. Still has some of those Doran moments, but his positive plays have been there, and a big factor for the team. Absolutely, I mean, Doran has been the anti Zayas as well in so many of these critical best of fives, especially his time on Gen G. A player we often criticize for underperforming and choking in big moments, very emotional, but he has been the rock for both Gen G and now Hanwha Life here in big best of fives. A huge task up against this season's toughest top laner. A lot of people talked about his Gragas performance in previous finals, making big impact up against this player, but. You know, the finals MVP from Wills last year, Zayas has been an absolute monster. I feel like this season, the individual impact cannot really be matched. So dominant, particularly on picks like the Aatrox, just a force to be reckoned with. So much draft attention for T1 for this guy. They'll blind him the Aatrox, they'll blind him the Twisted Fate. They put so much faith in his control over top side that they can then put the pressure bottom side. That's where owner likes to hover. They love to play those bottom 3v3s and put that fire there. Without his individual performances, those drafts wouldn't be possible. Things like the confidence to bring out the vein and then just completely dominate in playoffs. Just a great player to watch. A lot of highlight moments. Absolutely. A very exciting top matchup. It feels like sword for Zayas and shield for Doran. Or barrel, perhaps, <laughs> for Doran as well. We'll just have to see. Peanut, it's been eight years since he took the stage for his first best of five. His first place in the gauntlet when Rocks Tigers defeated KT Rolster. He's the last Rocks Tiger. Now representing the org that Rocks Tigers became in Hanwha Life. A big day for him tonight. If he can lift another LCK trophy against former teammate Faker, they've played so many best of fives against each other, and he has been so key in Hanwha's most recent wins against T1. The second round Robin win at the end of the regular season, and that 3-0 peanut was so impactful. 
And also just the fact that obviously a lot of discussion about Honor vs T1, but Gen G's legacy was really the consistent performances came down to him. And then the other side, Ona in the jungle, definitely play who has had some inconsistent performances, and it's gonna be a big ask him going up against Pina today. But him and Faker, when they're gelling, when they're on the same wavelength, definitely can come out with some big guns. The owner, a player very reliant on his lanes, winning lane. Pryo has won the way T1 has operated with its Faker's bottom dives, whether he's pushing with that bottom 2v2, the Varus, the Kalista that Guma is piloting. He has been so strong when his team is ahead, but he has often been outpassed by Peanut, especially in these critical best of fives. We've seen it across many LCK finals. T1 now have to beat Peanut to get there. And yeah, Peanut even shot calling the walkout, um, as we can see there, <laughs> indicating that Ona should start walking up with him. Uh, old habits die hard, I guess, gentlemen. It's now to turn our attention to the mid lane. Yeah, and I have to say, I feel like Zeka has leveled up so much. He still has his signature picks, you know. A lot of people give him criticism and say, okay, yeah, on the Akali, on the Yona, he's fantastic. But I feel like he started putting in really strong performances on picks like the Talia, like the Corky, which early in the season he was criticized on. I feel like mid has been so important this season, and Faker and Chovy have been on such good form. And yet Zeka really stepped up to be able to match them when it came to playoffs and be a, honestly, just a standout player for this roster. He really has leveled up quite a bit, but he's playing against the unkillable Demon King. T1, oh, that shot. their jerseys have the four stars that represent four world titles, but only Faker could say he was a part of each and every star they earned. A man who has so many milestones. T1's 10 titles are all his. Every road leads to Faker. All roads lead to this man. He has been so impactful for this team this season, even in some of their toughest losses. He made huge impacts. You can't say League of Legends, you can't think about the LCK without this player. And he might miss his first final in five, but he wants to add one more milestone, which is the first team to get six in a row. And his individual form has really been on point since last Wills, honestly. We've seen areas where Fake was more facilitator for the team, but he has been individually carrying a lot of games since that point. And speaking of individual carry, Viper, in a lot of people's opinion, he has been such a standout AD carry this season. Obviously, Will Champion with EDG, but I think him paired with Delight has just by far been comfortably the strongest bot lane in the league. And with picks like Zeri with the created carry buffs, he can easily take over games. Oh, absolutely. His Zeri as well is something that we will definitely see a lot of attention on in draft. His ability to carry late game team fights is what makes him different than his foil in Guma, who is all about the early game control. The Viper's late game team fighting is unmatched here in the LCK. And his opponent someone who's had some difficulty with his uh, his support taking away some of the limelight, but I don't think that it's bothered him too much. Yeah, and I think, really, we've seen Yuma and Carrier look to dominate in the 2v2. I remember we had the dual kill stats, and they were just leagues ahead of everyone else. And obviously, the focus tends to go on Carrier, but this pairing, if they find a window, not even a window, they find the slightest gap to punish in lane and to pull ahead, they will. And often innovating to capitalize on that, you know, defining last year's Will's meta with their bot lane play that allow them just to take lane by lane by lane, take it over, and undoubtedly looking to do that again. Absolutely. A really exciting matchup. Very different clashing styles between these two players right now. And they wouldn't, of course, be able to do any of it without their supports. Delight, one of the coolest LCK stories of the last oh, few yeah. years, went from being a player who was a standout on Breon, similar to Pleta this season, right? You look at some of the bottom teams, you don't often focus on the supports who overperform, but Delight did. Picked up a title on Gen G, started to actually roll himself forward to being one of the most legendary supports, and now a lot of people putting him ahead of Karia, his opponent tonight. He's so consistent on the map, his roams have been fantastic, his team fighting is excellent, he's got a massive champion pool, and this guy went from zero to hero so fast, it's incredible. Yeah, I mean, on the other side, Karia, this player has really yeah. just kind of open the box for what you can do as a support player. I mean, support, I feel like, doesn't even give full context to it. A lot of picks aren't necessarily always innovated by him, but he takes it to another level. You know, we saw the Ash support. He brings out things like we've seen the Caitlyn, the Callista, even this season still taking over with that. And I feel like 
it makes it so difficult. There's so much presence in the draft, but also just the ability to still revert back, still play those traditional engage picks, but then whip out something like we've seen the Camille, we've seen the Rumble, and just dominate games on it. He has been, I feel like, so attached to Guma's success as well. I feel like Viper can get a lot done on his own, and Delight will often roam and, and have a lot of success even in the top lane. But it is Guma and Kerry who are linked to that, together in that bottom dominance as Genji oh. waits on to find out who's going to be joining them tomorrow. The stakes could not be higher. Not only tomorrow's Grand Finals, but an MSI spot on the line as well. And this moment here, Captain's coming out for the fist bump. So much history between yeah. these two players. Peanut and Faker, of course, they were teammates. But first off, they were against one another on this stage eight years ago. Absolutely amazing to have them back. Fist bump, and we'll see who is going to be facing off against Gen G, who are sitting here in the stadium to await their opposition. Both of these teams, so much on the line. Will it be another T1 versus Gen G, or will it be once more? A lot of Gen G players yeah, playing against people, one another. Like, this is the, the crazy thing about Humble Life Esports versus Gen G just in general. So they have more Gen G players from last Gen G's roster than Gen G do. Yeah, <laughs> right? A lot of talk about that and the fact that obviously the countless wins that Genji being able to rack up are attributed to three of the players on Honor Life Esports right now. Peanut has stared down T1 multiple times and dispatched them domestically and is looking to do so again today. Honor Life do have higher seed. A lot of the focus is going to be on draft here because T1, they have their specific style where it is trying to control early. And they have often made the mistake of leaving up some of the big bio picks like Delight's Nautilus, for example, yeah. which was a huge boon for Hanwha and a huge disaster for T1 when they met up earlier on in the playoffs. So, uh, you know, some of the other picks we'll be talking about here are the Azir, uh, you know, it's right now sitting at 8-2 and two in playoffs. You know, if you look at the players who played it, you know, well, Zekka, Chovia, and Faker, those are the three players I'm focusing on here. They're 8-2 and two collectively on it. Zekka 3-0, Faker 2-0. It has been the most impactful mid-champion in our playoffs. Everybody remembers that Chovy series where he was able to single-handedly carry his team to victory and the Grand Finals on said pick. There's the man himself right now. He's watching on. Yeah. Genji waiting to see who their opposition is going to be. And the man you were just talking about there, Chovy, in the middle. I could, You can barely tell their expression because they are wearing the Genji masks um, here just to make sure that they stay safe. But... I'm not sure, guys. Uh, I just don't know who their opposition is going to be. I know what my prediction oh, said, but I think it, I flipped a coin, basically, and then just went with what Jonas Strong said, because I, I feel like that's where the smart money's at some of the time. Pretty safe bet, but uh, I think something that really stands out for me is Last Wills, you know, when T1 said themselves they were reevaluating their draft priorities, really shifted things up, changed gear that helped them end up winning a title. I feel like they've had some issues in draft and also obviously had some massive issues in their series going up against Honda Life Esports. So, would be surprised if they've kind of reevaluated and have a bit of a different prior from what we've seen so far. I, I really hope so. And that's for me what T1 needs to prove tonight is they've made bigger adaptations than what we saw against T, plus a much weaker opponent. Now, for Gumi Yushi, the focus have, has been outside of his Senna, which he's now banned away. Lucian, Callista, Varus. Those are basically the only picks he is playing right now. He's lost the Callista, he's lost the Lucian, and if you give Viper the Varus early, Guma's not the type of player who likes to play Zeri into that. He's played Zeri one time. One time this entire season. He's 0-1 and one on the pick. So a really easy way to draft this for Hanwha Life is to try to focus, limit the champions he can play, and then say, well, you're going to play Varus into Isaria, or I'll just take the Varus away. Well, this is a lot less focus on Peanut than we've seen for a lot of other players, uh, a lot of other teams. The Rek'Sai is going to be banned, though. This is what I was going to talk about. If you're going to talk about homework to be taken away from the first series for T1, for me, it was Rek'Sai and it was Nautilus. This time, the Nautilus is left up. Archery is going to be the focus, as we can see here. Varus going to be locked away first up for Viper, but I think that if T1 can get rid of the Nautilus and they banned away the Rek'Sai, then I'm, I'm giving them ticks, you know, like the little red ticks on the homework, that's uh, that's coming straight up. Yeah, they're yeah. going to be able to get their hands on the Vi. It was interesting, we're hoping the Ash team Ash Rumble be a really strong duo, but uh, not committing to that yet. And again, as you said, Zeri not being as popular for the side of T1. They also have had these tendencies to go in different directions ready for the draft. We see a lot towards CD carry, but they're going to commit this to Leia. A strong combo with the Vi, obviously, point and click CC combined with the knockback has a lot of value here. Uh, and Hunter Life Esports.
can just look to match mid jungle in these next few picks. Now, I think the Azir is, is a very likely pick, even though Talia has been kind of a soft counter to it. It's been one of the biggest responses. However, oh, it's Dekka. Oh, oh, oh. Now we're just going straight into Sejuani here and the Yone. And now the problem with T1 with picking up this Talia early is you don't get to have a strong bottom duo anymore. It is going to be split, best case scenario. And unless you've got a really strong secret plan for that bottom lane prepared, you're going to be limited further in the second banning phase. So let's see what they decide to go with here, as it's not an easy call. I think Nautilus being still up and available, they could lock that one away, but this makes a lot of the sense. The Rek'Sai yeah. has already been banned. I think it's the only thing that has survived lane against uh, the Twisted Fate, and especially Zaius' Twisted Fate. So it does make some sense here. They can now ban away the Jax. Counter-Strike has worked in the past, even if uh, Jax isn't necessarily the laner that he used to be. And so we'll just see what their focus is going to be moving into the next round of picks. And you know, it has been a trend for T1 to put all that focus towards Zaius. You know, and Sherry's the good matchup and obviously banning away the counters now, but the AD carry pool is heavily getting thinned out now. And in the virus, you know, so much presence in the lane in phase, the fact that you have that advantage in range, have that poke pressure, it is going to be problematic. So we'll see what they opt for. The Ash is still something that's available if they want to try to go something like the Ash Rumble, but we'll see. Jinx is an option. Ooh. The Draven, another pick that we have seen Guma play. It's his debut pick back from the World's Qualifiers so many years ago. Looking to lock the Rakan here, potentially, to I see. Really don't like Neither of these feel great for T1, and it feels like this is the issue I had with committing to the Talia here is Faker has a massive champion pool, but now you're putting Guma on this area. His second Zeri of the season. And he has just not normally been very comfortable on this pick. He's not a bad Zeri player, but he often avoids it. This is not T1's playstyle. Yeah, you have a strong top side now. You can play through a little bit here. This is going to be scaling bottom, and that has never been for the last two years T1's MO. The difficulty, the Ash Varus up and available here if uh, Humble Life Esports would like to go With for With Sejuani as well. It feels yeah. amazing here. Yeah, and so, much pressure, so much engaged potential. And the fact that, you know, for me, you know that Viper and Delight are going to have huge value when it comes to team fights. They are just those players. But to, <laughs> to also give them a laning phase where they're going to have the pressure advantage definitely feels like a bit of an issue. I mean, there's so much dive potential with this Hardened Life Esports composition. Yes, you have the TF and the Talia who are, are decent at keeping threats at bay, but I feel like there's just so much overwhelming engaged potential for the side of Hon Life Esports. I think for T1, your best bet with this composition is to snowball early, and it is a Zeri comp, but we can have some of those moments around the early objectives, the early Herald fights, the early Dragon fights, where you can get Gumiusi online by setting up big buy ultimates into some shoves from Faker. Maybe Guma gets a kill or two, he comes online early, and you just become too big to fail. Otherwise, this composition kind of does two different things for T1. On one hand, you have great engage, but it's not burst damage follow-up you have with the Zeri pick. And the re-engage and the disengage potential here for Hanwha is insane because if they go in with a Vi ult into gold card, the Talia wall hits Kasante, for example, bam, Rill comes back in, Magnet Storm comes down, the re-engage is so fantastic, they have so much damage they can layer on top of this. T1, I think, can win in the late game, even if they go even, but ideally they'd like to win a lot of mid-game fights and start to snowball this game so quickly that Azari becomes too big to fail. Yeah, I think if you get in the late game, there's just an element of finesse that you're going to need. You're going to need to have so much control over every fight. You need to have the vision set up. You're going to be on objective first and be able to see where everyone's coming from because the fact that you have multiple threats you can look to aggress on your on your backline, if you're not able to lock them down with TF, with Talia and Ravel Dirt, you're really going to start having issues, especially this Yone. We've seen Zeka have such fantastic presence of this champion and with the backing of picks like the Sejuani, like the Rel, who can really set you up just to knock them down. And the thing that I'm worried about here for T1 fans is the fact that Hammer Life Esports are all on their comfort style and comfort champions. T1 gonna have to come out swinging here in game number one. Let's get under the rip for the first one. Oh my goodness, the KSPO Dome erupting in cheers as T1 and Hummel Life Esports do make their way out onto the Rift. And here we are for the very first game. I think when we're discussing the draft battle, I think we can be uh, pretty confident that Hummel Life has come out somewhat on top. I agree. I think there's a lot of ways for T1 to, to make this work, and it does feel like they got half of what they wanted. It's just that Guma UC Zeri that does kind of stare at you, feeling like, all right, well, Hanwood clearly knew you like to avoid this. They put you into this awkward position. Now you're playing Zeri Rakan. 
and a very uncomfortable matchup here into a Varus lane. And yeah. I do feel like that gives a ton of agency, plus the comfort picks you already mentioned does give a pretty massive edge to Hanwha Life. And the mounted engage combo here of Delight and Peanut. And Often a lane swap. Oh, this is a little bit clever. I feel like it's somewhat topical these days as well. As we do see Viper moving towards the top side of the map. And this is not unheard of either, to just randomly play your Varus in a different lane. Yeah, it's a bit interesting though, because we have seen this strategy. We've seen it in the LEC. Oh, Zayas. Oh, there's a crash down on top of Zayas as well. He's lit on fire. Delight making his way in. Viper trying to get that last couple of autos. But uh, Zayas is going to be able to make his way out. No teleport, remember, ah. as well. And now doesn't have Ghost. This is a huge win because you know there's no teleport on the Twisted Fate, so you can get this win. And the fact that he has to back even almost feels worse, you know? If you die, you get the gold. If you live, you have to back and then walk all the way back. And this is so fantastic into a level one Twisted Fate. The one lane where you do have a little bit of an extra edge, that obviously, is that Twisted Fate range advantage. They won't have it anymore. Now Caria going to come up here to try to support. But even Peanut starting topside Krugs here means Zayas is just out of the game for a while. Yeah, I mean, that's one thing with the TF is we've seen, uh, you know, as I said, a lot of lane swaps in the LEC. We've seen it in the LPL. Uh, and often you can kind of have... Oh, oh there's the flash forward with the crash down from Delight. Gold card has come on through there as Carrier going to make his way over as well. But now zero summoner spells and no way to get to this lane. Zayas, you saw, just missed out on a full cannon. The whole experience gone. This wave is also going to be gone as well. Yeah, he's still got no CS. And the thing is, with Twisted Fate, you want to farm and get the extra gold from your CS. So missing out so heavily in Huddle Life Esports, not even allowing Zayas to play lane 1v1, just really putting him in an uncomfortable spot right now. Oh, Carrier making his way in as well. Speaking of uh, uncomfortable spots, that's where Zekka is as well in this first block as Ona comes on over and is going to be able to take that one down. So T1 on the board despite the disasters of the top lane. The question is though, is this going to be enough to actually stop the damage that was already taken? You can see T1 take a gold lead here, but it's free farm on the top side. Zekka does have teleport, can get straight back to lane here. Faker going to be burning his as well. And yes, you end up getting that first blood gold here, but the damage has certainly been done. And I don't think this really undoes the fact that Zayas is sitting at level one and is still you know, just camped up here on the top side. No one's bailing him out. Carry is still level one as well. This game may end soon if they don't change things up. <laughs> yeah, you know, Carry has one CS and Zayas is behind that. He's just walked up. There's still no farm for him to take. He's just not even touched Dominion at this point. Okay, one farm for, from, the, from the ward. He got the ward. So, uh, yeah, this is just such a horrible position to be in for Zayas right now. And you can see on the bot side, Doran is just, you know, he is down in farm in this matchup, but he's kind of just vibing. You just have to be up against your direct opposition. That is the main thing, and I think he is he was doing better than Zero um, at that point in time on the bottom side of the map. It's really kind of clever from Harmalife Esports, but still, T1 being able to pick up that first blood, definitely important. We're going to check it out again. Yeah, so this is just, of course, three members stacking onto Zekka here who went for his Q3, so doesn't really have anything but flash here. Owner will flash to guarantee the kill. Pretty simple setup here, but the cost is so heavy. Four in mid for a player who has teleport just feels so bad as Zayas now hits level three here at five minutes. And this is just such a disaster here for T1 in this early game. Now, Zeri getting some additional experience, obviously, bottom side, and does have a lead over Cassante. They're going to have to turn that into a team fight win here. These upcoming dragons potentially to get back into this game. Otherwise, this is just rolling down the hill so fast, this snowball. And the other problem is, because Carrier has just gotten no XP, yes, Guma is higher level, but until Carrier starts getting some levels himself, you're not going to have an even 2v2, right? We've seen Varus come back to lane with a Dirk. It's a level 2 Rakan who just isn't offering much. So Carrier is actually leeching XP from other lanes just to try and catch up because you won't be able to match up against the Varus and the Rakan unless, uh, sorry, yeah, against the Varus and the Rel, unless your Rakan has abilities to use. Well, now you can see you've got Delight moving on over to help Peanut out with this Dragon. First one is going to be a Mountain Heal. See exactly what soul we're going to get. Zayas throwing some red cards out. Doran pretty happy with the fact that he's hit level six as Zayas has hit level four. So the control that you're going to get with a Twisted Fate in this matchup, not really there here. It's gone completely. And he does have his Ghost back, of course, now, so can you know relatively safely get out of any engage attempt that Doran has. But 
This is re basically removing the top part of the lane for Doran, putting Zayus out of early game skirmishes. He's still sitting on just that Doran's blade here. And look at what Doran can do! Yeah, he's just gonna go all out. And Zayus, yeah, he does have the ghost, but Doran's not really finding too many of these Qs, and therefore Zayus is gonna be able to run it out. But trading ghosts here, and also ult does come on through as there's Kerry getting stunned up once again. Of course, no access to the quickness here. He's still level three. Zayus still doesn't have ult and he still doesn't have teleport, so you don't kill him, but he's going to be losing even more farm here on the top side. He's essentially removed from game one here of the playoffs, and you know, Doran's just going to crash this wave and potentially grab some plates. He would consider the back, but he's looking for some money as well. Yeah, and the only edge you really have is that level advantage for Guma, but you're not really able to capitalize. You're not able to find an all-in with the level six from the Zeri, and it's the Light and Viper who have the pressure in the 2v2, so, you know, I feel like you've You've lost any edge you had in the top lane, but the compensation on the bot side isn't enough, isn't significant enough really for a payoff. Well, oh! there's an interruption from Delight. Does push Faker over the wall. He has to flash, get himself out of there. And so no ultimate and no flash up here for Faker. Definitely a good move. We do have to talk about the fact that T1 are still ahead in gold. Uh, they've still managed to, to fill up those co coffers regardless. But Hummer Life Esports is going to have a very explosive mid-game as Peanut steals away the red buff here as well. Knowing Faker has no flash. Yeah. Dash does come forward. Uh, Zeka does carry a stun back with him as he does rebind the soul, but Yone kind of okay with how things go in this matchup. There is a Q connecting here from Doran, who doesn't have the all-out. Ona turns up once again, but I think this is mainly just to stop Doran from doing too much more. Dash is on forward. You can see Doran unperturbed about this state of the lane. You just have to kind of babysit Zayas here, and you don't really have the potential to kill Doran, especially if his ult comes up. It's going to be very dangerous, but, you know, this is so free for Peanut. Uh, look at you. Oh, is man. unwinnable. Zayas is face on the player cam as well in that moment. He's just shaking his head. He knows he's not playing League of Legends. He's not allowed. They said no. And, you know, he's just denied additional farm here. Slow walking back to the lane. Look at his experience bar. He's two thirds to the Destiny. If your Destiny is to the lane and gets all outed again, who cares anyways? We we'll have to back one more time. The lack of teleport, you're the coal by the saddest coal you'll ever see in an inventory here. As they've just been duped early, the level one lane swap, so incredibly impactful here. And yeah, gold lead for T1 still, part of it that first blood, but it's diminished quite significantly down to just 200. And a 5v4 game, I think, says it all. If Zayas can't actually get farmed, can't actually be relevant, doesn't matter if T1 maintain a gold lead for now, it's not gonna last. Yeah, Doran just trying to push him away from experience, and that is going to be successful. The thing is, he has no idea that could be overlooking potentially yeah. for a dive. Delight is a pretty good bodyguard, but it's four versus two here towards the bottom side of the map. There it is! The sling does come back, but Viper will survive! And the turret is so angry! Zekka is gonna move in! He finds the ulti onto Faker, who does survive the engagement! Zekka still just trying to protect his bottom lane. It's working out so far as he unbinds the soul, finds the double knockup. Seismic shove goes wide. And T1 will not find a kill down here. Beautiful defense. Oh, oh and they get the kill on a Faker. Beautiful defense from Hunter Life Esports. T1 give up on trying to babysit Zaya. So like we have to make something happen. Bot lane, not only do they not get the kill themselves, but they lose their mid laner as well. It's a disaster for T1. Now almost losing more than that as uh, Peanut was very close to being able to this ult carrier there, prevent his back and take him out. We'll be able to secure the back, but it's a massive win here for T1, or for Hanwha Light rather, in the defense of T1's dive attempt here. Now watch positioning of Delight here and Viper. As you know the engage is going towards Viper, the first Q doesn't connect, then he ults, and then the shove back gives Viper the space. So Faker pushes him back, gives him dis additional distance, plus the flash there to get away. And then this is a very Zekka moment. We have Zeri modes, we have Zekka modes, Zekka's like, I think I kill all of them. Not quite <laughs> at this point, unfortunately, especially with Rox and Talia there. But he does put the health bars low so they cannot re-dive, and that's enough to deter this. And then, the ward here, oh. residual vision is going to give him the kill. The W empowered Q does absurd damage. I uh, hear from Viper, so very nicely done. Able to grab himself a kill as well. And 300 gold is going to be the lead here for Hummer Life Esports. A much smaller gold lead for what we think the damage done to this game really is. And you mentioned it already, the fact that Zayas is kind of out of this game. The main reason Twisted Fate is picked is to make sure that he can get the other top laner out of the game. And he's 
receiving a taste of his own medicine here. And also, whenever you look oh, at the total dear. gold, a team with a Twisted Fate should always be ahead in, in total gold, just because you're getting that free gold from CS. But when you're this far behind, you're not getting as much. Still, Zeus is expected to be getting a bit of gold from that. But you're, you're supposed to be ahead of the curve on this pick. That is how it functions. That's why it is strong. Any situation where you're behind like this just feels so incredibly punishing. And it's what we used to experience with Twisted Fate when he was a mid laner as well. The way that you would counter it is by, uh, okay, I'll hold that thought as Cease and Assist does come in. Seismic shove as well, the full combo, but from over the wall, there's Viper. Delight survived for way too long, but now Carrier has dove on top of Viper. He's trying to avoid the burst fires, as now the wall is going to come in and T1, they single out the AD carry. And are we certifying it, Wolf? I mean, I think I will. It's two kills here early for the Zeri. And what I was about to mention before this fight broke out is, yeah, the, the situation here for the Twisted Fate for Zeus is horrible. We haven't really seen any skirmishes, any fights yet around the Zeri. And this is how I was saying T1's comp can operate. They're so good at early game skirmishes. Hanwha Life Esports here getting a little bit ahead of themselves, trying to set up for this dragon, end up losing the fight. Now they will look to try to secure this now. Owner, very far away. Yeah, Carrier is going to get stunned up here. Delight just playing Bouncer. We'll try and get Owner out of here. They aren't not going to be able to find it. And Ox, you're right next to me, dude. And we've got a Chemtech soul. <laughs> what do you have to say for yourself? It is what it is, you know. Um, <laughs> I mean, I love the confidence from T1. If you're playing Sejuani e Rel as a duo, you don't expect to be engaged on like this. You don't expect to get violated, especially when you're thinking you can just go over the wall. And yes, the Vi goes down, but Carrier and Guma, this duo are, is so mobile. The potential to get onto a pick like Varus uh, is so easy. And they just completely shot Viper out of the fight, who's actually, he's gone edge of night into the Vi to try and avoid the potential Ooh. of getting ulted. But I love that. I feel like there's a lot of things that can potentially break yeah, it. Yeah, the old just, smite on the way in, is, yeah. uh, it does make it a little bit difficult for that one to work out. But if that button is down, it does at least put a little bit of a roadblock in the way. It's not the only thing that can, of course, uh, be blocked by this. You, you're dealing with Twisted Fate, you're dealing with Talia. True, true. And there, there are a lot of things that can break it, as you mentioned, but it's going to be quite useful if you end up getting caught by one of those stray abilities as they are going to be fishing for you. Uh, and, and Zeri, deceptively quite strong in early game team fights, as we've discussed quite a bit. That's why Zeri moment's kind of a meme, as it happens very often. Doran getting plates here, not as valuable as Guma picking up some additional gold. He now has the static shiv, and T1, despite not really having a top laner, are keeping themselves in this game, especially considering the two Drake lead leads to a Chemtech soul. You actually have some additional time for Zayas to catch up. He's going to cash in that call eventually here as well, and will be somewhat relevant as just a CC button in these upcoming fights. Faker's not massively behind either, so T1 hang by a thread, but there's still a thread there. Yeah, it just I think it's definitely the saving grace of Dragon, because if, if it ended up being like a Hextech soul, I really think the win con is so clear for Honor Life Esports. But in this situation, T1 have bought time, which is so valuable for them. And the fact that Guma is this strong already, it just means he has to be respected so much in these team fights. And the thing is, even though there's a lot of engage, even though there's a lot of lockdown from Honor Life Esports, not if it's point and click, you know, you have to catch the Zeri, you have to pick off Guma, and if you fail to do so, you will lose a team fight. That's first turret that goes to Guma as well. You know, Doran was heading down bottom side, opted not to teleport without a lot of vision. Oh, there's a flash out. Zeus not risking it. I had a feeling that maybe he was going to be able to walk his way out. Um, definitely like, one of the best avoidance of CC abilities, but yeah. let's play it safe. I feel like Zeus is uh, summoners per minute already in the series. <laughs> it's so high. Very uh, high. We need to get that stat. Um, uh, we'll have to get someone on it. Atlas it loves that stat. Oh, yeah. It's one of my favorites. Uh, that is efficiency as... Ooh, we're not going to find the grand entrance as he's slowed down as well. Seismic shove is decent. On to Delight. Both of our supports thrown around here a little bit. Carrier not really finding too much and now does put his uh, ultimate on cooldown. You can see T1 are priced into forcing these engages right now because they know they, they do have a hole in the top side. And even though the Herald already went over, if you can have that great engage with Carrier, Guma gets into the fight, slides in. He is so strong right now that you actually can accelerate the Zeri. So while it did miss and it did look a little bit silly for Carrier, you can respect the idea. Now that said, Herald is going to crash here into the mid lane as they try to take out this turret in response. Yep, that's going to do a decent chunk of damage. Not going to be able to take that one down just yet. Trade back as far as turrets are concerned as that top one does fall down. And so we've reached basically gold parity once again. Two drakes in comparison to about 500 gold here uh, for T1. And so very even here in this mid game, I think, like you guys were talking about, the fact that Gumiushi is so strong, it's a clear win condition for T1. 
Life Esports, though, they just want to get into these team fights. They want to be able to try to lock down this area. Of course, Magnus Storm's pretty good, but so is this. The cease and desist comes in, and Faker and Ona just showing Zekka that this combination of Talia and uh, and the Vi is not to be trifled with. And yeah, that's part of the issue as well. Hunter Life Esports have two carries in their composition. If you target one of them like that, if you do that to Zekka in the lead up to or just at the start of a team fight, suddenly you're dealing with three tanks and a Varus, and it isn't that on her Varus. So the ability to have that sort of sustained damage in a fight isn't there. So Zekka, he will be challenged like that, I feel, throughout this game. And you can see how easy it was for T1 to pull this off here, but the setup really good. And even having Carrier there for the backup, just in case he and didn't die in that initial play. A lot of this is due to Vision that T1 set up after that attempted all in there from Carrier after Herald. They had so many wards that where are Hanwha Life's wards? Where, where's the Vision? Where's the shadowing there for Zekka? He has no one watching out for him. And T1 see their opportunity there. They seize it really well. And there was something set up moments ago. And with that death on Zekka and the faster wraparound here for Owner and Karia towards this dragon, they absolutely can contest. And I feel like with Runins now coming online here for Guma, this is a fight T1 are absolutely happy to take. You know, you think about the Yone, you think about Varus as picks that, that want to skirmish early into a Zeri before she comes online. She's online so fast, T1 are like, let's let's snowball this lead, let's get this Zeri into a position where she's so powerful that nothing matters, not even to Cassante frontline. Zayas still doesn't have teleport, of course, but does have his ultimate online. And T1 with a faster group, it looks like Hanwha. A little bit shy on the contest here. Zekka does have ult, does have flash. And they don't have the damage really to start this dragon up without any more control. Yeah, yep. and the, the value of the Runans in a fight like this when you have four melee champions in the enemy team is going to be absolutely monstrous. I think that has to be the game plan. Try and pick apart Guma, maybe try and get some Varus poke down. Both summons available is going to make it difficult, you know. The ult from the Yone, easily dodgeable, but actually it looks like T1, you know, kind of shows you the priority what it is at Chemtech Soul. Five members of Honor Life Esports group up, T1 don't even care. Yeah. Just look to get pressure in the side lanes, look to try and cement more for lead, bring Zayas back into the game. Faker is going to teleport out mid and maybe make a push for this T1. Yeah, they can actually wrap around here and potentially look to die Viper. T1 just playing the map way better than Hanwha right now, bouncing the way back into this game so quickly. They won't get the turret, but still a great response here from T1, getting a lot of value out of Hanwha, getting soul point for a soul, as mentioned, that just isn't very heavily prioritized here in the LCK or really anywhere. Yeah, it's a delayed recovery here from T1, but it is definitely working out. The one sacrifice that they had to make was that soul point. And even though it is Chemtech, it is still a soul, and it is still going to be valuable. We'll see whether that is something that they're going to be able to contest in the next four minutes' time. As we can see here, the gold difference really not going too far in either direction. Now T1 finally ahead by, you know, over a thousand. But uh, that doesn't mean that much here at 19. Yeah, I feel like the team gold isn't as big of a factor as just when you look at the scoreboard and you see the 40 CS lead, the two kills in the pocket for Guma. The fact that the gold is 1.5k ahead for T1 when they have a 60 CS deficit in the top lane really says everything. Yeah. You know, I can't imagine a bot lane going worse, uh, sorry, uh, an early game going worse than it did for Zayas, and yet they still have a team gold lead. Uh, so Hot and Life Esports definitely need to find a way to figure that one out. But it feels like the pressure has gone over to T1. They're the ones setting up vision. They're the ones getting control. On the top side of the map, they'll take away this blue. But if when Baron does spawn in 30 seconds, they're the ones with vision in the area. And I think something that's a big aspect of this composition is the ability just to get picks. You know, the engage potential from a lot of these champions, but also, you know, things like the Talia and the Vi the vision potential and the stone card from Zayas, all big threats if someone's out of position from Hanwha Life Esports. And for Hanwha Life, they haven't been able to set up real team fights. So they're just getting run around the map by T1. A lot of the time when you have a composition like what T1 have with Talia, with Twisted Fates, it's because they have semi-global ultimates, but T1 are just making better decisions. They're playing around vision better right now, and Hanwha Life have lost their firm grip on this game very quickly. And now to set up 5v5s on their terms is so scary against this really fed Zeri. Deathcap almost done here for Faker as well. He's gone that second item here. This Talia does massive amounts of damage, especially to turrets and sides as well. So T1, they're not letting go of this game anytime soon. And Hanwha Life need to win a decisive team fight with a strong re-engage with the Rel Yone. Or T1 may just run away with this despite not really having a top laner. And what a demoralizing loss it would be for Hanwha to start this series off with such a great start, such a dominant top performance, or lane swap leading to a top deficit and then to still lose out in the mid game. 
And I feel like we're kind of on the cusp of some big spikes coming in for T1, which will really be the signal to starting to look for, you know, either a setup to potentially get this Baron, or just a team fight in general. We're two minutes away from that Dragon, which would be Sol, and Fake is very close to having that Rabadons completed, and Zayus also close to having the Rapid Fire Cannon finish. Had just stacked up his coal. Second item comes in for Owner, so a lot of strength across the board, and I think it's a clear signal that they'll want to make something off this next Dragon fight. Yep, you can see the last whisper also done for Gumiyushi. So he's heading towards that Lord Doms as item number three. If he does manage to get that before the next big fight, then my goodness, he is going to be so much stronger. You can see two items done for Viper. Does have his tier still stacking, wants to put that uh, Mirror Mana together, but that feels like a bit of a distant dream here, especially if we're talking about the context of a fight in two and a half, in one and a half minutes on this next Dragon. There is that Death Cap that we were talking about here for Faker has now been built. Show the two lead, uh, or two level lead experience lead here for Doran and into Zayas, but they both made the same impact in this game, which is basically nothing. So it doesn't actually necessarily matter when T1 are winning everywhere else. And it's the Vi Talia that got them back into this game so heavily. It's Zayas, you know, who's just kind of been taking the, the, the waves on in the top lane, but they don't need him to win these fights necessarily. Hanwha Life aren't able to actually force fights on their terms or force T1 to take fights where they would really need Zayas on a flank, need Zayas to set up that CC. Just losing them front to back as Doran hasn't really been impactful in this game either. We need to see Hanwha Life win a decisive 5v5 fight either on this Baron or on this Soul fight. Otherwise, I think T1 just win this one. It, it, it's really looking like they have firm control and Hanwha Life, they need to see something big from them. Certainly do. And we are now gearing up for this fourth dragon of the game. 28 seconds until that one does spawn. T1 fresh off a reset. I'm like looking to try and grab some more items for themselves as well. An elixir of iron um, in the back pocket for Doran. He knows this fight's going to be important. He's going to have to show why he was the one given the advantage in the early game. Yeah, everyone is setting up for this. And I think a big thing with Hanwha Life, when they were having their successes earlier in the game, they were kind of chaining Summoner Burns together, you know, Ow. taking Faker's Flash, taking Zayas' Sums. Everything's up for T1, and when, you know, the Hanwha Life Esports composition wants to gas close, wants to commit these big ultimates like the Yone's, you really will feel frustrated if Guma simply flashes away from it. So I think this is definitely giving an edge over T1. Hanwha Life Esports are on the objective. Yeah, started this one up, Perry on a flank angle. We know that the wall can always come in, and there it is for Faker. He is not going to ride it through. He's just going to try and disrupt us. There is the Destiny to light off on the side, but there is the engage from Carrier. The seismic shove and Viper is going to be wiped out. Sorry, Tessa has already gone down. The Drake is going to be secured, but that is sold for maybe just a team fight loss as Faker will take down Doran. All of that money, meaning not that much, and T1, they'll look to the Baron. And T1 never were really interested in the Dragon. They were interested in the team fight, and Hanwha Life just put Doran on the front line and said, you stand in front of five people so we can rush down this Chemtech Dragon. And T1 identified very quickly, this fight is, should be ours. Easy to take if Carrier gets the engage. He does, and now they get more than just the team fight. They're looking for Baron. Yeah, and you know, Pina is still up and available. Does have Flash, does have Smite. TP is available for Zekka and Doran, but the Baron is going down so fast. It is. Pina should be able to make it into the pit, but this is going to be a difficult 50-50 to win. He flashes forward, and they just turn on him immediately. Taken down before the Baron's in range. That's going to be the secure. And T1 just level-headed the whole time. They'll take themselves their purple worm, and now they'll look to take down the turrets. And that is the prize they were looking for on the back of that dragon fight, now with a 5,000 gold lead. And this setup was so good, you know, the wall comes in for some disruption, but mainly Carrier on this flank angle. And with everyone from Honor Life Esports in the pit, it's such a shooting gallery. They're not able to make the engage. Zeka gets deleted by that Vi combo, and then suddenly you only have Viper, you only have this Pope Varus, who's pumping damage into this Vi, isn't really doing that much, while Guma is free hitting the whole time. And here, the patience, they were waiting for Pina to move forward. Carrier forces the flash with that knockup, he knows he dies if he eats it, but the Baron's health never even gets close to a smite range. And you can see the problems in the composition here for Hanwha Life, you know, even with the, the setup they have, is Doran is a huge brick wall, but when you're playing Lethality Varus, you can't utilize that very much. It's not very easy to actually use Doran to get poke off, even when you have control over the objective. They just hunkered down on the dragon itself, but didn't leave themselves any outs. Viper doing very little damage in that fight. And T1 now is Baron here, ripping through these turrets. The real difficulty, that Weaver's Wall, just uh, used there by Faker to stop the rotation over here for Harmal IP Sports, but not really going to deter them too much. It is still 7,000 gold, approximately the lead here for T1. 
This amount of recovery, kind of unprecedented. There is a soul, which is still stats here for Hummer Life, but T1 with the Baron, he should be able to get even more of these items. Seismic Shot going to be picked up once again as Faker finds yet another one. That's a good Glacial Prism, though, onto Zayas. He's going to have to get out of there. As the Unbound Soul gets Zeka back to safety as well, but now the re-engage. Delight looks for it, but he's just dead before he can do anything. And so T1 with five men strong, still with that Baron for another minute. And there, they've already gotten rid of the horse. There's just not enough sustained damage in this composition for Hanwha, even with the re-engage. As you're looking at Poke Forest, you're looking at Ione, there's no mage here that can just layer damage upon damage upon damage. There's no real AD carry, not traditionally anyways here for Viper. He's got to poke his oh. way through. Yeah, Seismic Shove is going to connect onto Doran as he teleports in. That is not the warm welcome that he was wanting as he looks to try and help out his teammates. Looks to try and get out of there. Gumiushi taking matters into his own hands as the turret will be taken down. That is his prize in trade for his ultimate. This is a point where it starts to look so suffocating for Honor Life Esports, where every time they're looking for this engage angle, they're just being marked and it just feels like it's it's so hard. Someone goes in, but there's the Unraveled Earth, which blocks all those dashes. When they look for an angle, like look how hesitant uh, we see Zeka being here, immediately dashing back. He knows the threat that can come out from the opposite side. Owner goes for an ult on the rel and it's completely fine, but everyone in Honor Life Esports knows if they step even a step too far, as we saw happen with Delight, you just get deleted. There's so much lockdown, so much preventative. Uh, control for the side of T1, and when you're in a deficit, it is just suffocating. All right, do you want the Hopium, guys? Go on. Two minutes. Elder there is flip. an Elder. And Elder sometimes, flip. sometimes you just have to bring your spatula and see what you can get done. Well, you know, this time, if Honda Life just you know, grab onto that dragon and hold on tight, Let's see if Viper can layer that damage too with the Smite, and they look for the 50-50 on that one. Maybe the Varus damage will come through with the Elder Executes, but I've got to be will. honest with you guys, I, I don't see it. I don't think they even get a chance to really contest too much if T1 play this well. They've already got Vision set up so well all around this pit. Faker coming back with Crypt Plume. Oh man, that and is a, a strong three item spike that he's hit right now. It is yeah, just looking so rough. The bigger thing for me is obviously we talked about Guma being getting, given a lot of extra XP, but uh, currently he's level 16. And oh Viper just hit level 14. Guma's the highest level in the game and nearly has four items completed. Was obviously hoping to get IE in before this dragon fight, but regardless, this Zeri is ridiculously strong. Now, there's still 75 seconds to go before this dragon spawns, so you know, this mid push through here, some of this vision clear for Hanwha is useful and is very important to do. You know, cross your, your T's here, dot your I's as best as you can before this fight, but. It's really going to be about how the fight occurs, how it actually stacks up, because as you mentioned, Zeri nearly on four items here, Guma so massively ahead. If you don't lock this guy down and kill him instantly, no one will ever match his damage. Not a Yone, not a Lethality Varus here, not in a straight up 5v5. If they could fight in neutral, if Viper can hit a few arrows here before the fight breaks out, especially onto Faker or Guma, there may be a world that's going to pick up that fourth item now. You have to imagine yeah, just waiting in the last couple of seconds here, I believe the Infinity Edge will be coming in, though. And that is... Uh, where, Boris, where is it at, man? Come on, hurry it up. Oh, my goodness. He's, he's in the back room. Guys, we've got a game going, please. Uh, there it is. Waiting. Oh, okay, it's going to be the Quick Blades yeah. to come in. And of course, that is what's That's the often way. seen alongside the, uh, the Hurricane. I just get excited. I, I see a Crit Cloak and I see a BF Sword, and my brain just says Infinity Edge. It's locked in, you know, that's what yeah, you, you yeah. assume it's going to be. And now, oh, oh no, possibly with a bit of a face check here, will be oh. taken out two seconds before the Elder. And this is one of the issues, you know, they went in for the IE, but it took so much time, they didn't have presence on the map. Final Life East will set a trap, and because T1 are late there, Boris holding them back, it means they don't have a jungler now. Yeah, they don't have a jungler, and now Doran can do his work, and this time, it makes sense to sit on Dragon and have Doran hold the angle here. Now he's going to have to wrap around. Oh, no 50-50 with no smite. Exactly, let's see what T1 can do. They're gonna have to try and fight this to avoid losing the Elder. There's a seismic shove, and they are going to even out the numbers. It's no Doran. Okay, survives for a very long time, but then does go down. There's the Elder now, as they have the executed Zeka finds him, and a three-man shove from Faker is massive. And it's a double for Faker. They'll take a double as well for Gumiushi, and it's now only Viper left with this Dragon buff.
and I don't think they care. Faker's just gonna throw some rocks at him, and that's the ace. And even Elder isn't enough. T1, they lose the dragon. It seems like it's gonna be doomed, but they handle the fight. They manage to lock them down. The help on Guma was so close to the execute threshold, but not quite there, and Viper just cannot do enough. Viper can't do enough. He doesn't have the time. He's playing the Daldi Bars here, and even with the miracle of owner just stepping forward there and getting caught. Anwar Life cannot take the Elder fight. They do end up getting the Dragon. It's a close one there, despite there being no enemy smite. Peanut secures it, but the engage is straight into a Talia. We talk about the value of those rocks, the shoves into a composition like this all the time. He ends up getting serious work done now. Oh. Anwar Life to try to contest this Baron, but it's already gone. Yeah, yeah it's already gone. There's easy. A lot of these champions for T1 can escape over the wall, as you can see. So they just burn double TP and don't get anything for it. The Elder Buffs have all gone, and now T1 have an over 10,000 gold lead and a Baron in pocket. And see the replay. The I mean, Doran just gets brutalized. Yeah, Doran gets brutalized here, and so there's no front line anymore for when the Elder does go down. And Anwalei had to sacrifice him here to guarantee they can get this. And then when Delight's engage comes through, look at Peanut's follow-up here. And as Yone comes through, Baker, he's oh, not caught. It's the man. triple shove into the knock-up there from Karia. And without that passage of play, it's very likely Viper does get the damage done, hits another rotation of abilities, and then the Elder buff finishes them off. But Baker's positioning there so crisp, holds the angle. Zekka doesn't look for the one target, he wants three, but it puts him and his team in shove's range. And Hanwha Life dropped the ball there, 10,000 gold now behind. And you know, Zekka was just so close to hitting Guma with that ultimate. And you know, he, he was so close to going down without that. It was an easy secure. I mean, I'm not sure that would have been enough with Zeus and Faker still standing, but Definitely going to regret the positioning of that ultimate just a little bit off there. And now dealing with the Baron, we already saw how problematic this is for Hunter Life Esports competition, but the lead, uh, competition, but the lead has just gotten bigger. Yeah, and now you've got the mid lane. They have taken care of it somewhat, but still super minions will be making their way down. And for the next minute and a half, T1 will be able to put on so much pressure. Twist of Fate already in that OQ, just barely going to go wide there for Doran, hunting for any sort of way to find themselves an advantage. But every single time we've been into a team fight, it's just been T1 the whole way through. The difference between this first game and the previous series that we saw from Harmer Life Esports is night and day, as there is the Weaver's Wall from Faker. Just gonna put that one up to try and get some more damage down. You can see Peanut just standing in front, trying to keep this turret alive. As Destiny gonna be used here, move Zayas back into the mid lane as well, and he's just running Zekka around. So and he, he can continue to get turrets. He's playing a, a you know a very low eco twisted fate very well until now he actually has the eco. Now he has the lead. He's sitting on three and a half items here and is just being a side lane threat. We'll just go straight to top lane here, rinse and repeat. And dealing with this twisted fate so frustrating here for Hanwha Life. Now Hanwha Life may be able to buy enough time here. This inhibitor's up in two minutes just before the Elder. They may get another opportunity to flip for Elder a second time, but I don't think they're going to get that lucky pick onto Owner. And the itemization, as you mentioned, and the gold lead here for T1 is so much larger than it was before. And once again, you gotta catch Guma. You gotta lock this guy down. Oh, He's got GA, you oh gotta kill God. him twice. Yeah, he just got GA. That's and six Faker items. just got Zonya's. Owner also has GA. There's a Mikhail's on Kerry as well. The timing of the summoners are all coming back up. Guma's flash is gonna be up soon. Kerry's flash is gonna come up soon. Everything is stacked against Honor Life Esports right now. They really need a miracle situation. Uh, they got one last time and it wasn't enough. Yeah, it but still wasn't true. enough there. You know, getting the Elder and still losing the fight. You know, it does happen occasionally when the team will get the Elder, they're so low on HP, but it just felt like even cards up, uh, it just wasn't enough there. Yeah, and uh, when Faker hits a three-man seismic shove, with the fact that everyone is melee on this uh, Home Life Esports squad, the Talia value is very high, but hitting those is not something that happens every day. And I, I want to give credit to Guma, a player we often criticize for not playing Zeri. We don't criticize his play on it all too much. He hasn't looked as comfortable as players like Paze or Viper, right? But given the opportunity to play it here, and giving the agency those two kills in the early game, and he has run away with it. His positioning has been good. He's deathless here in this game. Full itemization, as mentioned. Level 18 now. And the guy has absolutely played this to a T. And I think shutting up a lot of the, the haters of people saying that this guy just can't play Zeri, he doesn't. But he will, and when oh, he yeah. does, you know, in a critical best of five like this, he comes up big. And, you know, it's Carrier playing Rakan as well. I, I don't think he played Rakan once during the regular season either. This uh, feels a little bit like a leaf out of uh, Humble Life Esports' book as far as their favorite champions here on the bottom side 
And T1 with a little bit of a anything you can do, we can do better uh, in this particular game at least. Feels a little bit uh, re results based, or what? What is it? What is it? Orcs? Results uh, based. Outcome focused. <laughs> ah, thank you, thank you. Our, yeah. our outcome focused. No, no, we don't do. We there. don't do results based analysis over here. Right? No, we don't. Only We're very outcome focused assessments. Very against that, but uh, yes, like you said. And you're right. Focus assessment. Very, very good. It's his. It's his first game of recon the season, uh, and he's played so many. He's he's played six unique champions of playoffs. So be his seventh. Oh, okay. Oh, no. Looking for that opportunity. Gets into the back line. They dive on top of Viper. He's able to get himself out. Now 1v1 and he finds it against Zayas, the ulti. And Viper's still alive. alive. He finds the double kill. And it's going to be the next to go down into the GA. Is now Doran is just playing bodyguard. And T1, they couldn't do it. They killed him so many times. Owner again. That time, they weren't able to get there. Owner again is, is, is picked here before the Elder. And it's a really nice fight here for Hanwha Life. But they get a second miracle. They get a second lease on life. Here. How many do they need? I mean, we already wrote the obituary. <laughs> yeah. We were memeing about Karia and stuff. We were talking about Gunasari. <laughs> I mean, they. I was ready for game two. They threw so much at Viper. I think they just expected him to die. And I'm gonna be honest, I did too. Me he too. got Miles'd. He got Rakanulted. He flashes away for a TF to turn onto him, and he just manages to fight his way out. It's crazy that he ends up living this, but we see him end up getting the Edge of Night proc here. They throw all the CC onto him, the flash is good. And then this oh loses the one there, but then look at Zekka, the ult comes yeah. in, the CC, the peel, and just in time to save him. The re-engage there from Delight as well. And I really just don't feel like you have to pick the Varus in this composition. You can slow play this, you got a Talia burn through that health on Doran, push Delight back in front to back, and you have a full item build Zeri who's extremely fed, level 18 has been for a while, rely on your comp, you don't have to pick just because you have buy, you can, but this comp is so good at re-engage, was what we talked about in the draft, I didn't think it was going to be relevant in this game because T1 had a 10,000 gold lead, but now the tables have turned and Hanwha Life, they minimize that gold lead a little bit, but they're going to get a decent amount of map control out of this Baron and Elder, with all these turrets still up, it's not game ending, but Hanwha Life back in the driver's seat. Yeah, they're gonna be able to get a lot off this. But this is Exodia. Thing. They've they've picked up everything. I mean, it we is. forgot about the soul. But that was years ago. The big thing, though, is that T1 pushed all the waves out as much as they can. There's only a minute 15 on the Elder. They haven't even taken mid tier one yet, so they don't actually have that much time to make use of these. They really need to start knocking on towers as quick as possible, and T1 have space to give. You know, obviously losing towers is never great. But it's going to be a while before they start getting up to your inhibitor towers. If they can thin out the wave, you know, they have Talia, they have the, the W from Zeri to help out. They might be able to defend their inhibitors at least until the Elder drops. Yeah, you've got to be so careful about trying to look for it and engage here as T1. Don't think it's going to be well faded for Karia just because of that Elder burn. You're going to get executed so quickly if he gets hit by a few of these arrows from Viper. And he's so careful about looking for a flank. Karia's fishing. We have to remember as well that T1, they don't have a lot of range either as far as defending against these barrened up siege minions. Um, not something that we've had to talk about really either as Hummel Life will now move towards this inner turret. They are splitting. We are, we are getting back to even territory as the Weaver's Wall is going to be just elected into. Faker not going to be able to convince them not to break open the base. It's like you say, it could be a trade of inhibited turrets, but Hummel Life Eastwards, it doesn't look like they're stopping as this Elder is still ticking down. Another five seconds on that oh! one. They find the engagement and they blow off Faker into the back line goes Curry. He tries to find that quick miss, but he's permanently frosted and taken down. The deletion on two members, is that enough for the end of the game? I don't think so. As Hummel Life Esports, they don't think so either. Yeah, so many cooldowns been there. They have to respect the Zeri. Guma's still such a threat with Flash available, with GA available. They will actually look to reset the back of this. Doran's going to TP in. They want to look for the end They want to end. They want to end. They don't want to deal with that Weaver's Wall anymore. Or rather the flip. Oh, no! they find the engagement! Able to get out of there though is Zayas. He did have that flash available as there's the teleport back in. Owner is going to be CC'd as well as he's going in, but he's by himself. T1 are just running in one after the other. The destiny is going to be popped, but I think their destiny is one dead Nexus and zero one in the series. Humble Life Esports were down 11,000 gold and they will kill the Nexus here in game one.
You know what? I think I'll take five of these, please. Yes, oh, please. Oh. <laughs> they take it in the end. Early game, the lane swap puts Zayus out of the game. Seems doomed, but some really good plays from Baker get Guma back online. You get two kills on the Zeri. They win the subsequent fights. They end up getting pretty large advantages, then turn that into a massive gold lead. Even with owner's death, they win the fight on Elder. It seems doomed. But another all-in on the Viper fails, and then Hanwha Life spin it again. At every moment of this game, you felt like there was a clear winner. There was a clear advantage and the narrative was changed. You can feel the pressure between these two teams is so high. It is not perfect League of Legends we are watching by any means. But what a roller coaster! And I feel like, you know, if you got all of that in a whole series, you'd feel satisfied. Oh and we got God. that in one game, you know? We got the lane swap shenanigans, we got the falling behind from an early lead, and then suddenly Zeri moments coming out, and then everything falling apart. We got an elder buff losing a fight, and then somehow managing to bounce back from the deficit they were in. Absolute madness, and yeah, it's just game one. Uh, and I think <laughs> T1, a lot to unpack from that. I mean, I, I feel like for both teams, so much to unpack for that. We've got a whole series like ahead of us, and they really need to be thinking, okay, what's the takeaway? What the change is? Is this Tenji going to be an issue for Zayas throughout the series, these lane swaps? I mean, Viper is just ridiculous on Varus. His late game lethality Varus, it bothers me how good he is at playing out late game fights because he was getting focused and targeted. It felt like it was over. And then he, in that last fight, being able to avoid so much and then carry it through. We are going to need one heck of a rest before we get into game number two, but I hope this series stays like this. Short break and then the space will break it down. あ、ライトロールで。あ、ライトロールで。あ、いくプロチェリアンポンケ。あ。え、よねよね。テペドプ。あ、こんち。テペソ、テペソ、トマトトニエ。あ、トマトトマトトマトトマトトマトトマトト
형 3명이서 이제 따로따로 원래 같이 했다가 이제 처음 하는 시즌이었는데 처음 했을 때는 이제 그래도 좀 서로 해왔던 게 있다 보니까 이제 그런 부분에서 같이 타협점을 찾는 게좀 힘들었었던 것 같고 어, 호흡이 조금 잘안 맞거나 좀 소통 부분에서는 좀잘안 됐던 것 같은데 많이 흔들리는 모습도 있었지만 워낙 잘하는 선수들인 만큼 음, 다 같이 어, 노력해서 여기까지 올라온 게 굉장히 의미가 있다고 생각합니다. 팀합은 게임을 하면 할수록 좀잘 맞아갔던 것 같고 서로 노력을 많이 해서 지금 자신이 있는 상태입니다. 그한 번만 진짜 잘하면 우승할 수 있다 생각해서 그냥 긴장 안 하고 진짜 할수 있는 거다 하면서 꼭 잘했으면 좋겠습니다. 전차가 그냥 시원하게 달려나갑니다 렉서스가 포함이 됩니다 세계 도대체 결국에 이런 식의 싸움이 되며 웃는 건 하나 생명이거든요 젠시케에서 꼭 잘하는 모습 보여드리고 싶었는데 이번에 보여드릴 수 있게 되는 계기가 될수 있으면 꼭 좋겠고 꼭 우승해서 보답해드리고 싶네요 멤버들한테 어, 항상 응원해 주셔서 감사하고 그 응원에 보답할 수 있도록 좋은 경기력 보여드리겠습니다. 항상 응원해 주시는 팬분들 감사드린다고 전하고 싶고 꼭 우승으로 보답드리고 싶고 노력 많이 하겠습니다. 어, 이제 시즌 중간 중간에 어려운 상황이 많이 왔었는데 그때마다 변함없이 응원해 주신 팬분들 덕분에 이 자리까지 오게 된것 같고. 너무 감사드리고 끝까지 최선을 다해서 좋은 결과 선물해 드리겠습니다. 스프링 시즌 제 끝까지 응원해 주셔서 정말 감사하고 올라가고 싶었던 무대 일이 만큼 좋은 모습을 팬분들께 보여드리고 싶고 꼭 우승하고 싶습니다. 내가 없는 곳에서 최강을 논하지 말라! 지지율이 많이 올라갈 것으로 예상돼요. 베스게이 최소의 3천 킬입니다. 메이크! 원! 원! 스탯! 이게 지원이라는 이름이군요! Hello and welcome back to the desk here after game number one. That was insane, that game number one. It was so back and oh. forth. We thought h o m a l i f e Esports were definitely winning, and then we thought T1 were definitely winning, and then h o m a l i f e Esports definitely won in the end. So, so we're sitting in the green room, right? And I swear, about five times we're like, okay, pack it up, it's done. For both teams! <laughs> it just kept going back and forth! We were just shouting all the time. Level, late swap, donezo. Yeah. Uh, 5k down, Duns are 11k down, surely that'll be it! <laughs> Elder g it, it just kept going. Oh, we were uh, kind of losing our minds at that game, as you can probably tell. Let's talk about the draft, though. We got a lot to get through here. We did have a pretty interesting one, obviously highlighted by the fact that Guma actually picked up the Zeri here for the first time in a while. Yeah, two picks that we're not super excited about. I think the Yone here, Zeka did not have any of his trademark impact. And, and picking it into what is already so much point and click CC, Ends up being a really big detriment, although him uh, being vulnerable to point and click to see ends up costing T1 a fight later on as he does get goal carded. And on the other end, the Zeri pickup I think is really surprising here given that T1 hasn't really been able to utilize it that well. I think Guma did actually have a good game on it. Probably could have eked out a little bit more, but I feel like uh, his performance was where it needed to be for the team to perform. But they got surprised, Huni. Yeah, I mean, the lane swap, it actually just came through. It was like, un actually prepared for a T1 at all. I mean, that's why the, the from the lane swap, it was like, really, like, they could, they didn't know what to do. I mean, the thing is like, before the lane swap actually is explaining started, the HLE 
They bring the, uh, they prepare the lane swap, but the thing is like the mid, they are having the losing mid lane. And also the fact that the TF, even though you're down gold, you could still be useful. That was like whole point. And that's why the T1, I think here, they are trying to block the top of top wave, trying to like, actually well, from here, it's just like Zeus just got chunked so hard from just the level one, being not be able to just like lay, uh, keep staying in the lane. That makes un defendable on top lane. But T1 actually managed to, like, they are trying to base the from the Rakan as you see. They checked the, oh, they actually lane swap, and they look at the where the carry is just trying to press B, but he was getting canceled, and he's trying to come top. But the thing is, like, here, if they want to defend top, the owner has, the owner had to be there. What is really big here as well is that Doran walks up to that brush, although I don't think he got spotted, but Viper also shows bot already. So I think that's really what caught T1 off guard. Obviously, we have seen lane swaps come up more and more, both in LPL and LEC. So it shouldn't come as a complete surprise, but the response from T1 really showed that they weren't ready for this. The fact that they then fought their way back into the game through, I think, particularly uh, the combination of the Talia and the Zeri didn't end up mattering. Didn't end up mattering too much. We do have to talk about a bit of what happened at the end of the game. There were way too many things to highlight everything, but we had multiple Elder Drakes and crazy back and forth moments. Owner, of course, getting caught in this one, and it was a big deal. Uh, obviously, T1 eventually did win this team fight as well um, <laughs> after with a crazy three man seismic shove from Faker. And then we had this fight. And this is where T1 thinks they can end the game. Gold card not going the right way means that Zayus dies, means that Viper lives. And with that, Elder ends up going over. And that's kind of the butterfly effect that then leads to T1 losing with the lead that they had. Yeah, I mean, two times in a row, Elder Baron, Elder Baron, that actually makes the where actually came back from HLE there. Yeah, it was quite a big deal. And guys, we do have the player of the game to see who did the best on the side of Homolife Esports. I feel like there were multiple different uh, people you could have gone for, but one guy kind of stood out in our minds, and it was Viper, who, you know, he wasn't a, a huge standout, but the way he just survived a lot of the times in crazy uh, moments was pretty impactful. Coming into the series, it was Viper and the Light, and I think they delivered here in this first series on a carry like Varus in particular. It's so easy to just end up back in his edge of night. I, I swear, it like saved his life three or four times. Rushed that first item on the Lethality Varus, ended up being a huge different maker. Yeah, I mean, it's really incredible. Like, the game was like decent, consistent, and it was like so volatile, but Viper managed to just like actually not dying this much. Yeah, and you see that he does get 12 out of 14. And uh, we did have some shout outs, one to Zekka and one into the jungle as well. So that was game number one that eventually did go the way of Homolife Esports. Let's see what the rest of the series has in store as we go back to the casters. Thank you so much, gentlemen. And we I think we're ready. Are we ready? Are we ready for game I think number so. two? I, um, I think I'm ready. I think we've taken sufficient rest. Um, Wolves vote for Zeka, I think. Okay, just probably more aimed at bodyguarding. Uh, yeah, I, I, let's just say, let's just let's just hear me out. Like the the one highlight <laughs> where he shot Faker, there were two highlights in that in that for <laughs> for one where he shoots Faker, the second time where Zeka saves him. Yeah, I'm just saying. Uh, <laughs> the, I, I thought Zeka had some fantastic ults in the late game and it was super clutch and super instrumental and they're coming back. Viper, I think, was the most consistent player, though, for Hanwha Life across the entire game. Positioning, damage output, we talked about it. It was between the two of them for me. Ultimately, ended up going with Zekka. The peanut vote, I think, also decent for what he was able to accomplish in the early game. But I think the draft is going to have to change a lot here for T1. They have blue side now, and we'll see what that is going to give us. And we thought that uh, blue side was going to be an advantage um, for T1 as we saw in the previous series, but it was back-to-back-to-back red-side victories for Hanwha Life. So not out of the woods just yet, although they are out of the Maokai woods as he is going to be banned away. The Zeri taken away as well as Goomer's like, nah, I'm done with this champion. Yeah, uh, we, can't carry hard enough late game, I guess. So a lot of 80 carry bans, but you still have Callista open, you still have Senna open, you still have Lucian open. There's a lot of things still available and the bans are thinning out. So with Nautilus banned away, at this point, what are Hunter Life Esports going to remove? Like, there's, there's going to be countless things up and available. Rek'Sai is still Callista. on it the card. Oh, Senna. Senna, Senna or Callista. Oh, now, God. If you, Senna, Callista, if, Rek'Sai? If you ban Senna here, they can pick Callista, but the Viper has been okay with playing the uh, Varus into the Callista 
Gonna be the Senna again, but remember, T1 have first picked this Senna when available many times, even against Hanwha Life, and failed when Carrier has been pushed off of these top tier picks. The Nautilus is banned, that's fine, but that means he doesn't get to play it. Now the, the Tom Kench removed here, we have not seen Carrier find the same level of success when he doesn't have either of these picks with Guma's Senna. Senna, for Guma, by the way, 10 and 1 this season, an incredible pick for him. It's his most played, in fact, leading into this series. What was the last time he lost on this Senna, though? That was in the last series yep. against Hummel Life Esports yeah. in exactly this situation where Carrier was forced to pick something else. In that case, it was the Scion. We'll see what he has this time around as Azir is locked in. I was really expecting just Sejuani Rek'Sai straight out of the gate here for Hummel Life. I think definitely the Rek'Sai, I feel like the Sejuani, I think maybe he can leave. But they're, they're going for what looks to be Azir Vi in this situation. That's an interesting one. Maybe they're ex hoping to take the Rek'Sai on three, but then your AD carry is going to get banned away. You assume they're going to want to lock in Vi uh, Viper's pick on that third point. So maybe T1 just end up going the Sejuani Rek'Sai themselves. And I then the thing is, with Tom and Nord already gone, I feel like there's less of a pressure to pick your pairing with the Senna this early. No, I think if you leave the Vi up here as Hanwha, they can go Vi Ari. You know, they can go Vi Talia. And that has been so common for T1. We know that Carrier's pick isn't coming necessarily in this part of the draft just simply because he can play so many things and Senna is such a he flexible may already champion. already have it. Yeah, he may have it in the Sejuani, in fact. Now, I, I kind of expected, rather than this quirky pick that Faker is on a two-game loss streak right now, uh, namely against Hanwha Life, that, rather than that, I thought we were going to see a strong uh, you know pick that works well with this Sejuani or you know, something like the Rek'Sai, as you mentioned, for top blind for Zayas, that's kind of been the MO. It's taken away now here, so you have a pretty flexible and strong early game here as Hanwha Life now. It's, uh, it's looking a little bit worrying for T1, I have to say. Even though, like, this is crazy, right? Because we're talking yeah. about a Senna corky composition that, like, this kind of draft, especially in the hands of T1, has looked very successful. But against Hanwha Life Esports, in the microclasm of this matchup, um, it's looking worrying for and T1. You know, we've seen the Senna Sejuani before. They're batting with the Xin Zhao, which makes me think that, you know, Xin Zhao Sejuani is a really strong pairing. Yeah. I haven't really been sold, especially you have a Corky and a Senna. You don't really have anyone fantastic to stack it up, you know? I mean, maybe you'll get some things on the top side, but that's the... Uh, obviously, having a top lane that can stack it up well isn't that useful for Carrier. I would love to see a Caitlyn ban here, too, from T1. I think that's one of the picks that's left here that Viper could play that could really give you a, a nice edge in this lane. Pairs with a lot of other supports and can just control that when you already have the pretty safe blind top Rek'Sai here. Again, it's not necessarily going to be that Sejuani here, but there's a pretty high chance that, that uh, Carrier does, in fact, play that. You just want to shut down what Viper and Delight can, can run into this. So it'll be the Jinx, actually, instead, another long-range champion. The Varus is still available yeah, as I, well. I feel like they might just go Varus Rel again in this situation. You know, I was kind of thinking, okay, you've, you've seen these Eddie carries banned away, Senna's been picked up, maybe we'll get targeted more in the second rotation, but to only ban Jinx, I think, honestly, Hunter Life can be pretty happy. They're just going to be able to secure that once again. I, I'm kind of surprised yeah. didn't end up targeting that. Clearly, T1 fearing other things, and now, you know, we'll see whether the Sejuani does get locked into that support role. I don't rate it very highly, uh, but again, it really depends what you're going to pick for Zayas. Uh, if you want to pair that Sejuani with some of the top lane, fine, but like, you're into the Rek'Sai, is it just going to be a TF angle Could again? Be. But we've seen that lane be a bit rough. Could be Aatrox here. Yeah. Lock that in with the Sejuani and play Orn bottom, play Sion bottom. Viego. <laughs> Definitely not what I saw coming in this one. And that is a tough pick to play out. How many junglers do we need? Hey, okay. all right. Well, that Zach is going into the top lane. You have to imagine the Viego will be the jungle with the Sejuani support here. But this composition feels so fragile. It feels so brittle in how its win cons have to be played out. It scales incredibly well, and it does fight decently early around package fights and Santa's roaming. But if it falls behind a little bit, if it if it loses a team fight or two in those early skirmishes, it's just done. You know, it doesn't really have legs to stand on, especially the Viego aspect of this composition. This makes me think because one of the picks we've seen, obviously everyone thinks Scion when they think lane swaps, but Zach has also been a really powerful one. The dive potential with the passive early very potent and he is a very low econ top laner. So perhaps T1 looking to sort of mirror the shenanigans we saw in game one. I feel like playing in a Rek'Sai is just very unfun situation. And I feel like Varus is going to have the edge over Senna, so maybe they look for an angle where they can navigate those lanes using this sack. We'll have to see, but T1's draft seems very new territory. I'm not really sold on it. Whereas I feel like Hunter Life Esports, a lot of power in their picks. 
and a lot of confidence with the players being on those picks. I can see a few angles where T1 can leverage their extra range. They do have. Faker, of course, has been a very consistent Corky player, especially in lane in the early stages, can often build himself up to those two items that are kind of required. As you say, it feels a little bit like Humble Life Esports are not in the experimental territory, but when T1 are experimenting, that feels like their bread and butter. Yeah, it has It has often been. They have well, not just been experimenters, really, but meta makers. Uh, it's so many of these incredible drafts we've seen from them that look silly in the outset, but end up being incredibly strong. I think this one definitely suits their playstyle. There's so much engage, there's so much skirmish power. The Corky, don't underestimate early team fights with this pick, with the package, with Santa's range. It's going to come online fairly early here in this type of draft. But if you mess it up even once, as we saw in the previous series between these two squads in playoffs, Palm will run away with it. Just have to see how it goes. We jump onto the rift for game number two. You are a good pick. And the KSPO Dome erupts once again as T1 and Hummer Life Esports make their way out onto the rift. I do feel like we had about four games worth of game in game number one. <laughs> and we'll see who has the longevity to survive here as Venom Zack to come on through. I'm more of a Margin Boo fan myself when it comes to the Zack skins, but this one is also pretty cool. And Zayus. He's no stranger to the Zac top. Of course, it is something that has been started to be played uh, elsewhere more often. But Zayas was playing it before it was cool. Uh, he's now going to get knocked up before it was cool. They both heal a lot. Yeah, they no, do. Healing, healing for healing. <laughs> uh, I think that's the takeaway. If one goes underground, the other one eats bits that uh, that fall off. Interesting. We aren't seeing any attempts at a lane swap. Any shenanigans coming out early. Oh. Um, especially, I always feel like something that's been talked about heavily is the fact that like there are players who have played a lot in the lane swap era, and there's also players who really haven't. But both these teams, I mean, I feel like Faker's been the lion's share of the experience yeah. there, but definitely will have that in the wheelhouse. But yeah, it's going to be standard heads up lanes coming out level one. Yep. Uh, Carrier, of course, has played this to Zwani alongside uh, the center once so far in the playoffs. He's been the only one to do so, but of course we know that he has an eclectic champion pool and one that kind of spans all of the champions in the game. And uh, some Biffo here towards the top side. Ignore the fact that they're taking damage, ladies and gentlemen. It's going to go away. As, yes, uh, it is something that they're just happy to, uh, to do for the entirety of the game. Doran, you can see, eating up that Fury. We'll get another knock up here. I'm not going to lie. Standing on the blobs. It's going to feel nearly impossible to judge who's like, <laughs> yeah, yeah. the trades. I, uh, uh, no one. <laughs> I think it's it's very clearly uh, one where you just keep an eye on what's on the ground for, for the Zac and what is the yellow bar for Doran. As I think Zayas is winning out on these slightly right now. But there's, of course, just the first two levels here. And look at the win rate here for Zekka on Azir. It has been a pick that he's found great success with in best of fives, namely Worlds, where he did level up on it massively in 2022. A pick we've criticized him for quite heavily in the past, but I think is no longer really a weak point for this incredible mid player. Guma Senna mentioned it earlier. It's 15 1 on it now, and 5 and 1 versus the Varus. Doran? Yeah, another knockup does come on through here as. Okay, Elastic Slingshot, the flash out from Doran! And underground once again, Zayas electing not to flash after him for first blood, and instead will just keep up that pressure. You have to be careful, you flash after he gets the burrow, maybe heals out of the auto range. It would be a ra waste for Zayas. Finding pressure in this top lane matchup, you know, the healing from Rek'Sai really starts to take off later in the levels. At this point, some bad trades can't really push things out of your favor. Doran will use the TP already to get back into lane. Yeah, gonna grab a refillable, so more healing in the conversation now. There's not really anything else he can afford here as he's trading with this Zac. And I love the Zac here for T1 for two reasons. One being, of course, the long engage range for those skirmishes we talked about with Viego. And with the early team fights is area. Yeah, a bit of a crash down does come on through there. The chains do lock down Delight. We know that Peanut's in the area. The Ignite ticking down. Now making their way out. Peanut actually deciding to get out of here and Ona knows exactly what's going on. Ward goes down. Peanut, I believe, is going to spot that as we can see right there. Another snare going to come on through as Gumiushi down pretty low on the mana as Viper does find a piercing arrow on top of the center. And the backs are going to come through, or at least one of them for Peanut here. Teleport back from Carrier, and they now Ona know. might have an opportunity. They don't know. They have no vision. Yeah, there's the flash forward from Carrier. Viper able to try and get off to the side. Good 
Crashdown to try and get him out of there, but there's the permafrost, and Bible will be taken down. Kumiyushi gets the first blood. Such a good read from Ona had complete information advantage over Peanut. Waited it out, you know. Peter obviously went away from the situation, but like, yeah, you guys have got the wave crash, you're fine here. And Ona manages to get in. It's a lot expended to make that gank worth, but they'll definitely appreciate the payoff, especially as it's Guma who ends up getting a kill, kills on a center when she ends up uh, needing the extra gold, really valuable. Oh, absolutely. This is exactly what T1 want out of a fight like this. And Peanut isn't able to get anything crosswise here. Now, Doran with the push that he has is going to come over here and see owner of path bottom side, whether he could affect him here. Peanut's coming over as well. Huge opportunity. Yeah, Peanut charging up that Vault Breaker as Ona gets into the mist. Doran going to come on over as well. Looks to tunnel in on top of the Viego. That's a lot invested for a Gromp, but they will be able to at least get the Gromp. As Gumiyushi now comes on over, Carrier just 1v1ing Viper here towards the bottom side. A little bit dangerous with the amount of minions that are stacked up on the Hamalai Esports side of the map. Carrier, he understands that. Yeah, so interestingly, we actually got Viper going lethal tempo here, but he's got a tier and is presumably going the lethality route, so maybe just wants the extra sort of sustained damage when it comes to those team fights, or even in lane, you know, if Carrier does go all in there and Viper stacks up the lethal tempo, is an easy way to end up losing that 1v1. Yeah. An interesting I, adaptation. I think it's absolutely an adaptation for laning into the, the Sejuani here, because as you mentioned, the CC, it's CC versus extended damage once he gets out of that combo. Ah, uh, do I? <laughs> Careful. Yeah, does manage to get the shield as Crashdown does come on in. And Zayas, he's getting very, very small. Still able to get a decent knockoff, but he's going to explode him. And now the Blobblet's coming on forward. Doran, can you take them down in time is the question. Only gets a couple, and now Zayas makes his way back in, but will not have that passive available for the next time. That was the second thing I was going to mention before we had that skirmish bottom. The two great things about the Zac, great skirmish power and also the passive allows T1 to make a lot of extended plays. They're so famous for looking like they've overextended on the map and then wrapping around so quickly. Zayas being able to have that passive allows you to make some plays like that. But if you lose it early like this, there's going to be a huge period of time in which that's not a tool that you're going to have. And Doran going to feel so much more confident in this lane. Would have loved to get the kill as well, but the passive also feels like a massive win. This is Carrier coming in here. The key part of this, which isn't really shown in this replay, is the fact that owner stays and they don't have vision. He's aware of it and they're able to punish. Yeah, and I mean, managing to just get the kill at the very end. The cleanse is good, the peel from Delight is solid. But when you're that overextended on a mobile carry, there's only so much you can do in that situation to try and get out. Uh, it does end up paying back in return. We do see the Bramble Vest come out from uh, Zeus and obviously Really strong item for the Rek'Sai. Uh, Rek'Sai is kind of forced to auto you uh, in trades and kind of guarantee the, the sort of healing reduction. But the thing with it oh. is you kind of just wait out the healing reduction before you burrow underground. Oh, this is a little bit dangerous. This Faker is going to get engaged on immediately. Flashes away the Glacial Prison. Going to go wide. There is the lockdown on the Dragon for T1. But Delight gets them on in there. They take down Faker. Empress Divide is massive. And it's two kills to start off the fight. Carrier is not long for the world either. And Hamalife Esports, they lose a Drake, but they'll take three. This is the main criticism I had with T1 in their previous series against Hanwha. They show up on these objectives before the comp is online, before they really have any semblance of control. And yeah, Hanwha Life, it looks like potentially initially, they're just going to look for a little bit of a rel steal because it's still, you know, 14.6, where that's not removed from the game just yet. And you end up fighting into this Azir composition here. It's got such a tanky front line. You stay too long. Corky doesn't have package, doesn't have any agency in this fight, and you end up giving over a massive amount of gold. It's just, it's so greedy, because clearly they're like, okay, we can try to sneak a, sneak a dragon in the situation, but Faker has no rockets, half HP. They get caught in this combo, and the arrow to follow does so much damage. And then as soon as, like, Zekka slides in, the ult comes out, you know it's just in a really bad spot. Especially as this is a composition with a Viego, you want to be the ones having the momentum in the fight. And I think, for me, this is just greedy from T1. It's greedy, yeah, absolutely. It's, like, uh, you'd love... <laughs> That was awesome delight, is what Peanut said. You'd love to get an early dragon on a Forky comp, but you're not forced into it. You can just wait for the package and have that big edge in the dragon fights. Instead, they opt to go for an early one and they pay so dearly for it. And it's, it's really reminiscent of a lot of the fights they lost against Hanwha in their matchup earlier on in the playoffs, where they opted into fights, got Viper ex extended, or rather uh, ex gave him a huge lead, accelerated him, uh, and this moment here, Zekka comes up big with Delight, and Goldie goes to Hanwha here. It's a small one, 
But these items, you know, breaking points when we reach the mid-game are going to be so critical. I don't think we're going to get a Chemtech soul twice, but I mean, Ox is sitting up here with us, so... <laughs> yeah, uh, we need you to focus. I'll do my okay? best. <laughs> uh, Ocean ticking down three minutes until that one is going to be on the Rift. Uh, quite a few uh, decent souls up and available as Gumi is going to walk back towards this bottom side. Information does go over to Hummer Life as they do have that ward uh, towards the Crybrush, so... Just some 2v2 laning down here. In the mid lane, uh, we have seen that uh, Zeka has retained a fair bit of control in that lane for the majority of the game, um, but has since just uh, equalized with Faker. Faker actually making his way back as far as the CS is concerned, especially now as he tidies up this wave. Oh. Might be face checking though, as there's the Vault Breaker in. The ulti comes down. Empress Divide is avoided though, as Faker able to get that Valkyrie off before the Azir swoops in. Close call there. <laughs> a very close call. Yeah, it felt like a little bit rough. Zeka could have committed the flash, but yeah, I right. think he needed it. And I think they were just kind of... I think they wanted a bit more time for Zeka to get a bit closer, but then Peanut, obviously, if, if Faker comes up and wards the brush, you just have to go then. Uh, unfortunately, aren't able to get it off. A couple of Void Groves picked up. Once again, similar to Game 1, just 3 for 3 trade on those, so no real advantage gain for either side. Faker, he's calculated, man. He knows the exact range. Look at that! We put the stats up as well. <laughs> yeah, there we go. <laughs> that's the timing for the corkiest. Yeah. yeah! And look, that's two ults down on a life without that pick. Can't contest top side. Oh, yeah, Doran in. Possibly a bit of trouble here as there's the Void Rush to come out. Dawning Shadow to keep them alive, but he tunnels his way and he survives! And Doran able to lap up these minions as well! It's just crazy how hard it is to punish this champion. You know, Doran actually was a little... He wanted to stack up his rage, so he went to cue the wave and he hit Zayas, getting the Grievous Wounds. It looked like he wasn't going to be able to survive as a result, and then he just flashed tunnels and he's suddenly, you know, on the other side of your screen and you're not going to be able to follow him up. So a, a, a nice attempt for T1, but this... This champion is just immovable. I feel like such a Doran champion as it well. Really because is. he soaks so much pressure. Absolutely. That's exactly what I was going to say. It, it, Doran's mastery of it, he's already shown in this playoff so incredibly well, whether it's setting up for team fights, objective control, you know, and, and surviving here when playing at weak side has been very effective as Baker survives, Doran survives. We go back to neutral here. 45 seconds before this dragon. See, Doran does have his teleport online. Ults for Zekka and Peanut coming back. Peanut nearly there. And T1 need to be a little bit more careful about how they want to approach this dragon fight because two team fight losses in a row makes this game snowball away from you so quickly. Right now, they're in a pretty good spot with the Senna, getting that early kill, scaling up nicely. Corky obviously going to be incredibly strong in the late game. Do not want to mess this one up, though. Yep. T1 with their first dragon of the series as well. In fact, didn't take any of the objectives on the bottom side of the map in game number one and now have turned that one around 100%. So being able to pick up that first strike, definitely good news. And they still have a slight advantage. Well, actually, no, it's just completely neutral yeah. as far as gold is concerned. The thing here is that they will have the package, but the strengths of the composition doesn't really come online. They don't really have the poke because Senna's not got that much range, and Faker's items are looking like a, a mix of nothing, if I'm going to be honest at the moment. Uh, nothing really completed, so don't feel like they have too much power right now, but they have picked up the package, they all have to set up. We saw Hong Life Peaceful start the dragon, then back away. Maybe I, hearing the package sirens, I mean, a bit concerned. I mean, there's no vision here whatsoever for T1 in this brush. Faker can't approach this angle. Oh, there is the uh, Soldier of the Wall. Faker taking a little bit of damage there as T1 will get their turn on this Drake. I'm to just slow play this. They have a Varus who's rotating over. They don't have to hard engage unless it's onto the package list. Faker, he's got it on this angle now. Yeah, this is so dangerous. They do manage to take down the second dragon, but they look for the engage. There's the package to live it over the top, and it's owner that goes down first. Zekka will find Faker's special delivery, and it's Onwa that managed to get it on over, and it's a Hextech Drake on top of everything. T1 pretty happy that they're at least able to get the Drake. Yeah, I mean, you know, you saw Peter trying to set up for the steal, but that wasn't really the focus. The engage comes in, and even with the package as appeal attempts, it only hits the front line as a Honda Life Esports. They just kind of shake it off, and the follow-up is so good. Zekka taking out Faker now. Yes, the fight goes in favor of Honda Life Esports, but Zayas gets a lot of gold, and they also, as you said, secured that second dragon into a Hextech Soul, so it's not all doom and gloom. But these fight setup coming out from Modern Life Esports definitely feels like it's in their favor. It does feel like at least the gambit of committing to the Dragons will pay off, as Atlas mentioned, because it is a Hextech soul. And if this had been Chemtech, you would feel horrible about this as a T1 fan. But Hextech. you're still scaling. 
and you still have the opportunity to give some of these up and allow this quirky incentive to come online later. So in the short term, yes, gold deficit here. Team fight wins for Hanwha. In the long term, T1 feeling, I think, overall pretty happy with this one. It's going to, of course, come down to how these next few team fights go as to whether we're going to feel like this is okay or not. But you watch this break out again. It's similar to the last one. Set up here. Very rickety here for T1. They secure the dragon, but the engage comes through from Blight. Tatsits alone isn't going to be enough, because guess what? Zekka's unaffected, and he's got so much follow-up, and the engage from Delight once again, just perfect. Yeah, and I mean, again, it's Rel and it's Vi. You're the one tank for the pack. It's not too big of a deal. T1 are going to pick up this Herald, but the mid-tier one for Hanwha looks pretty healthy, so, you know, obviously the, the main goal getting the Herald is breaking that T1, down, uh, T1 tower down, but I don't think they're really going to get an opportunity to do so, especially as any time you set up to look for a siege on a tower, there's so much easy engage threat from Hunter Life Esports that just has to make you second guess whether it's worth it. Uh, and oftentimes, that's going to be no. Yeah, Peanut able to steal away this red buff as well, takes a hex gate, get himself out of here, and the hex tech rift is also going to, uh, I think, move us towards a few more skirmishes as this mid game progresses. Late game, another thing that we do have to talk about, T1 still with a lot of power there. But I think with the amount of lockdown that Harmon Life Esports has, like you guys were mentioning earlier on, the Viego wanting to snowball these fights forward, Harmon do have answers to that. So I think as this game goes on, um, there is still hope here for Hummer Life Esports, even if uh, they are going to head towards a late game against this center court. And it's the Azir that's 100% KP that I really focus on here that's been the most pivotal pick in playoffs since being re-enabled. It's just been so impactful for all three of our remaining mid laners here in the LCK. Zekka did not go for grasp. He wants the damage. He's got Halo Blades here. And with the Nashers too, this turret's not long for this world. Neither is Zayus necessarily. Ooh, doesn't quite find the stretch Armstrong. And they are going to play it safe. It's now Faker Dove on here by Doran just a little bit. And he just already looks so tanky at this point. Yeah, no, this is kind of ridiculous. Is Gumiushi going to come on over? Piercing Darkness not going to work out. It's now, let's see whether Zayas is going to survive. He flashes forward, gets the head bomb. The Empress Divide is going to throw him against the wall as they focus the turret. The Bolt Breaker is going to get the shield for Peanut. And Zekka, he survives with his Shifting Sands sets up his own turret as well as they take down the Zac. Doran, he survived. His turret had already basically fallen down earlier, and the Rift Herald is going to charge into that inner turret as well. Doran actually having the gusto to take down Shelly himself. It's so rare that a champion can just walk up in front of three people, walk behind the Herald, and just auto the eye, but Rek'Sai is just that champ. Uh, and, you know, T1, they managed to get an okay use of the Herald, but realistically, half HP in that top tier too. A lot lower value than lowering the health of the mid-tier one, so I feel like the payoff is really there. It's a minute oh. till that dragon, though, and that's going to be a... Oh, TP coming in. Yeah, TP from Zekka here moves towards his top side. It's now Faker having to deal with it. Conquering Sand's going to come through, and of course there's Peanut! Turns up, and that is going to be just the last Sand Soldier auto, and Zekka just collects it. I mean, with Halo Blades here, the early Nashers, three kills to his name now. I mean, he's pushing towards the Leandris here. He already has his haunting guys online. Blasting Wands picked up. He's just so accelerated in this game. And yeah, sure, you win one fight, you lose the dragon. Not feeling too terrible about that. You lose a second one. But Hanwha Life just keep feeding this Azir kills. And this is, by the way, played so incredibly well by Zayas, all things considered. The ultimate is timed really well here. But they focus down the turret, so his passive isn't going to save the day. They don't get that counter kill onto Zekko. Could just put up this Azir turret. Guarantees the kill here. And then coming on to Faker without ultimate here. He's just so ahead, and Peanuts are able to wrap around. Doran's up here as well. It's just a mistake by Faker, not respecting how quickly you can rotate on this map with the Hextech Rift. He's shut down, and I mean, we're moving into this next dragon. It's going to be Hanwha's first Hextech of the game, if they can secure it. It looks very likely right now. Package spawn timer here, great for Faker. Well, they're very late to show up for the fight. Yeah, very yeah. late. And also, you know, Faker doesn't have that money quite stacked up yet. Again, Ooh, Zayas. This flank angle pretty big, big from Zayas, like you were talking about. Carrier making his way in. The Drake already secured. Han was first of the game. But there is the elastic slingshot. They dive on in. The package down as well. And they take down Zekka, the priority target. Doran looks for the backline and will be able to trade the mid lane in. And there is a great Magnus Storm as well. Viper, the next one that can try and carry this fight. His owner is starting to pop off, but the piercing arrow going to take him down. Zayas now just trying to peel as best he can. Peanut, how are you still alive almost? Man 
managing to escape as Viper has to flash away. Doran, of course, can just survive for basically forever. He'll make his way out as Viper was kind of baited into this one and will be falling down. Dodges a few abilities and T1 win a team fight. It's just tank diff. It's just tank diff. Both of these tanks, all three of these tanks, rather, running rampant in these fights. The initial kill onto Zeka is so huge, you know. With that, Leandrius, with that Nashus, would be someone who could cut through all these bulky members. I'm Taking pretty sure actually I built the, the Leandris after he died as well, so oh. I don't think he had it Didn't at all this fight. They managed to get on top of him, the lockdown follow-up is so good, the package as well. And then immediately the difference is, Owen is now starting to get resets in this fight, getting value out of the Viego and Viper. He's trying to do so much, but realistically, even with the lethal tempo, you're just not cutting through Zayas. It takes so long. And also with Guma's additional heals coming through in the fight, the Dawning Shadow coming through as well, he's not caught by Delight's ultimate. He actually ends up doing so much in this fight, not only in terms of damage, that the Senna is really starting to be a strong threat here, but heals his teammates up as well. And that sustain is just something that Viper, unfortunately, cannot break through. He's gone for lethality. He wants to hit those squishy targets. But as you mentioned, without the sustained damage from that Aziz, here. They just cannot get it done. Good plays there from Guma. Sana 3 0 and 2 now. Kind of matching in terms of the impact that Ze uh, Zeka has had in these team fights now in that last one. And T1 back on the board here. They failed to secure the Drake though, which is huge for Hanwha Life. Having that Hextech Soul Point above your head would feel terrible in the next three minutes. Yeah, definitely could have been worse if they weren't able to secure that one, but I think. The takeaway is, if you go on the Thali Varus, even if you take Lethal Tempo, it's not going to suddenly turn you into the on-hit build. No. Um, and you can see Zayas just really surviving such an insane amount of time during that fight. And the key thing is Zeka. Zeka needs to survive, needs to be that DPS threat, needs to be that stain damage for the team. As you said, Leandri is now finished, so we'll have that cut through ability. But Fake has now got that Man Immune stacked up, but he's going to start building the items where Quarky really starts to take off. I feel like T1 have been managing so far, but once Corky gets that power, once uh, Guma starts getting that range, that's when they become real threats in these fights, because as much as the tanks were kind of just running rampant, when Corky and Senna are able to lay down huge damage on the back of that, it's going to be very problematic for Honor Life Esports. You have to say as well that it was Gumiushi in the last game that I think was playing the most consistently here for T1. Once again, 3-0 and 2 on this Senna. And we know the carry potential of this champion, especially if she gets accelerated. Definitely a big lease on life here for T1. But like you mentioned, Hanwha managed to get themselves their first dragon of the game. And there's a Glacial Prison. That's going to connect onto Viper, who does cleanse it. Gets rid of it. And Carrier taking a lot of damage here from these Leandries up auto attacks from Zekka. Yeah, Zekka also flashing there. So that's another tool gone here for Hanwha. But Faker, he's just so behind in terms of his itemization. He does not match the poke of Zekka, ironically enough. Oh, no, no. Crash down Carrier, going to get knocked up and destroyed. They is diving on in there. Doesn't find the switch up from the kill back. Does come on in, though. And now Oda, he knows how to play the Rel. And Prismai does nothing to heartbreak and dies over it. And Faker will now get into that back line. And Oda, pretty good at the Azir as well. Very nicely done. He'll now just transform into everyone. And the snowball of the team fight is beautiful. T1, they love going to Baron. They're going to do so now. As soon as the momentum starts to go in favor of T1, the Viego resets come through. Guma and Faker are unchallenged. And I feel like making the play onto Carry onto this super tanky farm Sejuani ends up being a mistake, especially as you were already down tools in the fight. Zeka without Flash, Viper without Cleanse. And they just really weren't able to do anything on the back of that. Yeah, and, and it's not really a poke war that Team 1 is winning this with, with the Faker's Corky. Just follow up damage from this guy, and obviously the package on the last fight where they were able to take Zekka out of his door and just has to sit back and watch. You watch moments like this, and you have to remember that, yes, it is Lethal Tempo on the bars, but this is a poke composition here that Humble Life are trying to play with this front line. They have great re-engage, but when they're the ones who start the engage, the attempted blow up here of Sejuani is successful, but everything else is just super disjointed. The very split, as you mentioned, some of those summoners down. It's really easy for this Viego comp to say thank you very much for the free engage as you guys overextend on one of our tankiest members. Yeah, beautifully played here by Onerous. Okay, Hama, if at first you don't succeed, they're gonna try again. This time, Viper not in range of the Zack as Faker once again looking for a package angle. And this dragon is up and available. Hama still trying to fight tooth and nail for this. Yeah, he teleports got, for this. They're actually look. They have the package available. You see, Doran looking for a flank angle. Faker's oh, just taking mid tier one. They're pressured on both angles here. Honor Life Esports going to try and take the dragon and do what they can. 
Well, let's see whether they can actually get some sort of steal. As Faker still in that mid lane, Doran has moved back to try and contest. The Dragon is going to equalize, and T1 will start it off once again. And Zayas does take a hex gate over. That's a teleport in from Doran. Just gets into the pit. Of course, he can do this because the Rex Aishi is so incredibly tanky. And just now, going to be burrowed around, moving in. Let's see who manages to take it in. Peanut, the lock down the Dragon, but can they win a fight is the question. Doran unable to tunnel his way out. And that is going to be a kill going over to Zayas. So T1, that will take the fight but they won't be able to pick up the Drake. The Light's hovering around the edge of the Drake, and Hanwha Life, it looked like it was very clear they did not want to take that fight into Faker's package. They were just looking for secure the Drake and evacuate, and the second the smite goes Peanut's way, they bail out. Doran is a casualty of this call from Hanwha Life, but at least they're able to stack, stack two Dragons here. Problem is that Baron is still up, and T1 are going to get more than just that pick on the Doran. Hanwha Life... Losing a lot of control over this game very quickly as Corky is starting to come online. And if Baker starts actually being a poke threat in these fights with how Hanwha is actually looking to just all in engage every single skirmish we see, this game can change. The game state already very heavily favoring T1 can change hey. faster. Oh, Uma. wow. Peanut? Oh, he oh, actually man. gets out of there. My goodness, that was almost the most ridiculous read. <laughs> but, uh, instead, ships in the night. No, I thought Pina was going to go for it because I feel like all these pick attempts, you know, the first one was on the Sejuani, not a good target. Then the Zac, even worse. I thought you finally found someone you can kill, but not confident the damage was there with Pina by himself, so ends up backing away. And T1, the Baron is close to fading out, but still just have the pressure on the map here. And it's going to be hard to set up against this team. They might just have to look for this tier 2 in the bot lane with the last of the Baron. Oh, that pull. Yeah, that's a lot of damage, Faker. Throwing out that fast bomb and some rockets. Really going to do a lot of work. Three items now done for this Corky. And every one of these rockets that Hummer avoids, they're going to feel very good about it. There's an ulti. It is going to connect somehow onto Delight, but he's not exactly the primary target. T1 not going to follow up on that one. 50% of the health bar here on Faker as well. They are just going to play it safe. I think game one is really on the minds of both of these teams right now. Yeah, you could really feel the pressure the Hanwha are under here as the Baron gives so much additional gold over to T1. It's a 6,000 gold lead now. They, obviously, they can't see those numbers, but they know they've lost control of the map. They know they're behind in terms of the advantage they had early. Zekka was so huge, now is getting outplayed by the Corky in these team fights and the poke. But when it lands, you could feel the damage that Faker is starting to come with. And as you mentioned, Ox, as we've been talking about, the engages from Hanwha have been very lackluster onto the wrong targets. They're forgetting that Sejuani is incredibly tanky. And also the engages onto the Zac, who has an ultimate, has a passive, it makes it very difficult to blow him up, just doesn't feel ideal here. And Hanwha not playing the slow poke game with Viper either. And I think that T1 have just had so many great opportunities to re-engage and win those fights. And when they have Baron, they're just like, yeah, come at me, bro. And as a result, you know, we're looking at two and a half minutes until this next Dragon spawns, but T1, they have complete map control. They get to dictate the pace of this game. Yeah, and I feel like the two Dragons for Hanwha really just aren't doing much. It's just the fact they've denied T1 is obviously very important to keep their hopes alive in the game. If you give Hextech Soul over the quirky center, the game is just over. But T1 are fine with this game going later, you know. Fake is approaching level 16 where you get a massive spike on the Corky Rockets. Guma is stacking up those souls, has the Rapid Fire Cannon as well, so it's not getting easier for Hanwha Life Esports. Yes, they bought time by getting those two dragons, but time isn't necessarily going to help them. I'll just have to see how Hanwha's going to be able to mitigate this one. A minute and a half, so not exactly coming up anytime soon on this dragon. In fact, first on the chopping block will be the Baron. We'll see who's going to be able to retain control. Looks like T1 for now. And Hanwha Life Esports just trying to get as much money as they can to be able to stand toe to toe. I think their composition can still team fight at this stage, but uh, their use by date is swiftly approaching. And with the fact that they are still already like down in gold against this center Corky, it is so, so dangerous. If we turn back the, the clock, if we turn back time and think about game one, there were two miracles given, right? Owner's first death, the attempted kill on the Viper that was shut down by Zekka's re engage there. Owner was picked twice. T1 made some big mistakes with the lead they had. I think if they do not make said mistakes in this game, they're on a great pace to finish this one out. Obviously, Owner is going to be not uh, the same type of engaged champ in this game around as he was in the last one. It's going to be more of a facilitator follow-up, and then, of course, it's going to get those resets to kind of carry the team fight. T1 
I really think it's going to take a big mistake or a miracle play from Peanut Zekka or maybe a Doran flank to win this one as Guma still has flash and cleanse. Baker's got flash. The Valkyrie. Oh. There's the engage attempt on the Gumushi, but he just flashes away. Slinks into the mist as well. And Guma is not going to be killed that easily. They do manage to get the flash. That is definitely important. But now the re-engage comes through Doran. He manages to grab it out of thin air. That was amazing! Even Viper didn't trust that was gonna block. <laughs> and that's that's the rough thing, is it was such a good play from Durham, but the cleanse still goes down. Yeah. Astra Guma obviously more impactful, but uh Hunter Life Esports trying to be in some sums. Don't think they got enough that I really favor them in this next fight. Dragon's up, but they can just try to burn Baron here. I mean, they have this Zekka damage that's pretty insane on this Azir. It is very true. If Viper and Zekka can get on top of this Baron, it is gonna be a lot of work. But Faker goes back, collects himself the package. And look at this, immediately, Hummel Life Esports scatter. Yeah, it's just too dangerous. If you end up in the Baron pit against the package, it's just game over. Uh, and T1 actually potentially looking towards it themselves. Your expectation was they would go for the Dragon on this package. But they're starting the Purple Worm. Hummel Life Esports all kind of retreated. Now right. they have to move in and respond. All right, teleport in. Yeah, Peanut has Flash. Looks like they're they want to just group. Over the wall as Delight. He has an opportunity as well. Peanut gets into the back of the pit. This is dangerous. Has to flash away immediately. Now Doran, he's able to take the front door. And T1 are going to peel away. Faker still with that package up. They want to get that turn. And they're going to need to do it sometime soon. Now the package is going to be used just to try and route Dor Doran here. But it isn't exactly the most. He actually just decides to go back on top of the package. I don't know about that one. That is going to be Ona getting his first kill of the fight. Takes down the big tank of this one. And both flashes from the carries are now on cooldown for Hummel Life. And this may just be both objectives to T1 here. They can rush down this Baron now. And with Doran down, it's hard for Hummel to stop. I mean, he doesn't have flash. They don't have vision. All right. Peanut and Delight still here. There's the CC onto the buy. He is very tanky, but the rel is going to go down. Faith is just executed, but I just don't think it's enough to win them this fight. Viper cannot turn up in time. Another teleport. Zekka going to come on in as Zekka. He could be the hero, but full information is there for T1. And they will be able to take down this Baron. Zekka unable to get in there, and he may not be able to keep himself alive. He is. Not enough cooldowns here for T1. What a scrappy series of events. I feel like Doran really let Hunter Life Esports down there, getting caught out, trying to find an engage angle when no one was in position to follow up. Overestimating the tankiness. And Baron now goes over to T1. Look at it get set up on the Dragon. It will just be Ona taking the scuttle and securing that. You see Hunter Life Esports flying out to contest. It's good to get back to back fights, I feel like. Here. Yeah, it does look like that. Is Eka down flash, but we'll have his ultimate available for this one. Yep. And, you know, Faker is respawning here. He does have teleport. He should be able to rejoin, but what impact will he have is the question. As of a lot of Baron time is also being wasted here. I love that we see Karia with TP since he is playing TP with the Sejuani lane or with the uh, Senna lane. He actually is going to be able to push this top lane out and be a bit of a side lane threat here. Put a clock on Hanwha Life and that Baron buff will slowly but surely push HLE away. Faker gets to show up without using the teleport. And that's just going to put them on slow point. And this is just a chain of events, a domino effect of what happened with Hanwha Life trying to stop that Baron. Failing, unfortunately, miserably. And then then. Doubling down on it, Zekka going for the TP play, pushed away, and everything is coming up T1 now. One of the problems as well is because Faker's package was taken so much before the Dragon was, they're going to have package and be able to, you know, we often see the Corky like pick it up last second and come over. T1 will have ample time to set up for this soul fight. Now, Hanwha Life Esports are trying to attack Carrier, but you're going to take so long to kill him. Yeah, this is taking forever, and there is no damage here in this fight. Remember, this is a lot of tanks. Of course, there is Peanut there. They will be able to get through the Sejuani, but they have to invest everything to take him down, and they'll lose an inhibitor for it. They may even lose the base, as the backs have now been started for Hanwha Life Esports. Dory Cattle just to stop them, and they'll take the first Nexus turret. There is so much damage under these turrets as well with the Corky in the center. I don't think that was worth it, Hanwha Life. Absolutely not. And I think trying to set up an engage would have been a little, a little bit more successful. Just sit under the turret, try to look for a Zekka flank. They shut them down. You end up losing inhibitor for this. You get the kill on the support Sejuani. And that's all you get. Great ultimate there from Guma to guarantee they get that one Nexus turret. And this game is just off the rails here for Hanwha. Their agency is so low. And when they try to make an impactful play onto the Sejuani, Carrier just looks up and says, all according to plan, this is exactly what I wanted. I wanted to be that side lane threat. He still has that teleport, mind you. Oh. Now, um, 
I don't, I don't think I really want to say uh, who is favored in this game because I feel like as soon as we talk about who is clearly favored in a game, then it's then it's just you know the what? other team that I'll wins. I'll do it. It's definitely T1 favored right now. Oh god! Really? Okay, or wow! That There's is no a way. Blatant Hummel Life esports bias there, um, but I think you might be right that uh, T1 do have a clear advantage. Yeah, because it I is nine thousand gold the lead. It's uh, pretty it's just, big. We, we ran into that problem and in the last game as well. I think it's easy to focus on the carries as well, but Zayus has four full items. He is, I think he's hit an immortality at this point. Yeah. Uh, and we normally talk about the Rek'Sai being hard to kill. Rek'Sai doesn't scale as well as the Zac. Uh, and I think that there, there's just not a whole lot of agency here for Hanwha Life. And like I mentioned before, Owner's not going to overextend and try to kill Viper. He doesn't have to. The, the goal difference is basically the same as what T1 had last time, but the map control that they have is way more oppressive. Threatening that bottom inhibitor, taking it down. Is Peanut now in trouble? Yeah, Perry just going to interrupt him here as Peanut tries to take the hex gate, but it is not going to work out. He gets himself a big old shield and is just going to be taken out. There is now Ono turning into the vine, looking to try and get a little bit of a re-engage. I think Peanut trying to buy some time makes a bit of sense, but feels like a little bit like he was throwing away his life there. Yeah, I mean, he could, could have maybe tried to set up for a sandwich, but there's just no control. He's identified early. Oh, God. Oh, Goli taking so much damage here is now T1 pushing down this mid inhibitor turret. That is going to evaporate. And this feels a whole lot cleaner. There is the engage. The elastic switch up fantastic by Zayas to make sure they're all CC. The Empress Divide tries to get something done, but it's from the grave for Zekka. And once again, just engaging with reckless abandon is Zach. Gorgeous this game. And T1, they will answer back and make this best of five a best of three. And win one against Home Life for the first time this playoffs. And I feel like. You know, game one, we saw Hunter Life composition kind of lacking damage. It was enough to get them over the line, but this time they just could not kill this front line for the opposite side. Zayas was basically just flaunting his immortality in front of them. And it feels like once the game started to started fall out of the control, yes, they got some good early skirmishes, but as soon as that team fight came in when they killed Zekka, the game felt more and more painful on Viper. The virus could do nothing. And I think that Hanwha really didn't play to their win cons around a lot of these objective fights. Sure, you win the two fights on Dragon, T1 get a two Drake lead, but you have a pretty nice advantage. Zekka was massively ahead, but they just constantly kept hard forcing engages into the enemy tanks. As yes, the tanks are exposed, they're your best engaged target there. But it's like they didn't trust their ability to just play slow and poke with this Varus and chip away at the T1 composition and use their re-engage, which is so strong with this comp, especially with the Hextech Rift. I think they could have done a lot more. They, they felt they saw blood in the water. They, they saw, okay, we have this advantage. Zekka's going to go in. And there were many times where those engages took so many critical tools away. And then Faker and the team showed up and came up big with package team fights. A very good game from T1, all things you know said. And I think a really well-rounded game as well. T1 kind of hitting the mark across the board. Yep, certainly this time around, it was the blue bar going up for the remainder yeah. of the game instead of the, uh, the heart monitor that we saw in the last one. Much cleaner this time around as they even out this series you know, up against Humble Life Esports. This didn't feel like a 35k damage virus game. Um, no. You know, I, I, how much of that stuff? Very little. Yeah, I think a lot of it was into a Zach that just um, picked up a blob and then uh, was absolutely fine. But it is now time to go to a break. When we get back, the desk is going to break that one down and we'll have game number three.
파가볼게 파가볼게 어어어어어어어어어어어어어어어어어어어어어어어어어어어어어어어어어어어어어어어어어어어어어어어어어어어어어어어어어어어어어어어어어어어어어어어어어어어어어어어어어어어어어어어어어어어어어어어어어어어어
티어넬 전 서프터이자 지금 집에서 중계하고 있는 울프 이재환입니다 아 이번 시즌 진짜 쉽지 않았습니다 저도 그렇고 우리 응원해주신 팬분들께도 그렇고 그리고 열심히 연습한 우리 선수들에게도 그럴 것 같은데요 지금까지 너무 고생 많았고 오늘 이번 경기도 너무 파이팅이고 우리 5천만 6천만 아니 더 나아가서 60억 티원 팬들이 파이팅이다 열심히 응원하고 있으니까 하나가 되어서 파이팅 했으면 좋겠습니다 저는 비록 이제 현장에서 응원하지는 못하지만 이렇게 방송에서 시청자분들과 온라인으로 열심히 응원을 하도록 하겠습니다 저희 현장에 계신 팬분들 끝까지 우리 T1 선수들에게 힘을 나눠주셨으면 좋겠고요 정말 우리 T1 파이팅이고 우리 민석이 파이팅입니다 저희 그러면 다같이 힘차게 한번 외쳐볼까요? T1 어, 둘, 셋! T1 파이팅! 저희 T1 많은 응원 부탁드립니다 정말 열심히 준비했습니다 마지막까지 우리 T1 많은 응원 부탁드립니다 팬분들 항상 응원해주셔서 감사합니다 오늘도 팬분들의 응원의 힘이 꼭 승리하겠습니다 경기장에 오신 모든 팬분들에게 감사드립니다 여러분의 응원이 정말 큰 힘이 됩니다 함께 우리 팀을 위해 응원해주세요 하나 둘셋 티원 화이팅! 파나 생명이 스포츠입니다 내가 없는 곳에서 최강을 논하지 말라 지지율이 많이 올라갈 것으로 예상돼요 베스트게이 최소의 3000킬입니다 메이크! 원! 원! 스탯! 이게 티원이라는 이름이군요Welcome back to the desk. We are here at the desk, and uh, that was game number two that T1 was able to pull back and give us a series on our hands. Guys, thoughts on that first or second game, I should say? Uh, not as much of a roller coaster as the first. Still pretty close. A lot of ups and downs there, but in the end, T1 are able to make it through. Very, very beefy uh, front line with Senna can feel extremely uninteractive once you get to the late game and we got there pretty early it was a pretty high paced game early on so a lot of kills being fed at that point i think it's really hard to play out the game for hanwha yeah i mean i didn't really expect it is going to be coming one more time like sena and sena said johnny bottom and also quirky pair within the mid lane like it was a really slow paced game but i think the day was bring up the Zac into the rec side it did so work well and that helped so well that again especially against the immobile carry virus yeah, and it's one of those picks that is going to give Hamlet like, Esports trouble as the game goes along because now T1 can say, yeah, we can leave the Rek'Sai available. That's been a big pick for the top lane, and we have an answer for that. And you don't really feel good banning Zach if you really no. want to, like, hammer home that Rek'Sai top. So, yeah, kind of an interesting one that T1 wins here in that draft. It's a bit rough, and we saw some early game tr uh, struggles because, for example, you don't have the, the Viego and the Sejuani actually playing together the way we used to previously. You do really need to sync up with the bot lane. Viego enablers early on, you also don't really have. Ideally, you want something like the RA, but once you get to mid-game, comp still works. Absolutely. Well, guys, let's take a look at our highlights here just to talk about what went right for T1 to win this game number two. I mean, I think T1 start managed really well. It's just tipping behind, and it's extremely well the, the deceased Saint with starting with the Zaki, and also there's the package on the top of the Azir. Basically, Azir get the pop evenly, and that's how they turn around this fight, because they were like, oh, few thousand go behind with this competition winning this team fight it's so huge three big things in extended fights zach viego and senna all go absolutely nuclear really hard to fight into that secondly viper also ended up playing lethality varus with lethal tempo and i can sort of understand the reasoning because walking up into this comp is always going to feel like a nightmare but simultaneously at, at the very least on hit, you can even go AP if you really want to go for the tank busting because you didn't really get to have a big impact. And you see here, the moment that Zayas ends up in the back line, whether or not he hits with the E doesn't actually matter. Yeah, he just need to be there and it's like just a heal up a Zeus Tannin and it's like just shooting the, uh, the rocket there and it's like, it's just so easy. Like as you kind of mentioned, the little tempo with the action, the lethality item, like it just, it just doesn't help at all. Like I might as well just see like probably, I think the attack speed of the item would have been probably better. Yeah, it definitely feels like that, especially as the game comes along, because if you don't have the tank busting, you're just kind of sitting there getting dove over and over again. And uh, eventually, T1 got there. In the end, they scaled up, and it was looking a little bit dicey in the beginning as well. You know, there were a couple of team fights that Hamalife Esports actually were able to take on the Dragons, even though T1 were stacking the Dragons. It felt like Hamalife Esports were in a strong spot, you know, getting a bunch of Hextech uh, Dragons themselves, but it wasn't quite enough to get them across the line, as we talked about. So the teams 
you know, obviously pretty stressed at this moment in time, and uh, we'll have to wait and see how they do for game number three. But let's take a look at the POG here for game number two and see who does pick it up on the side of T1. As uh, thinking about that top lane almost definitely, as uh, we should be getting that on your screen here in just a moment. There it is, Zeus gonna pick it up. Zeus having a really good game, almost solo killed and the amount of threat that he provided, exceptional. I think we saw Owner also in the team fight really have a good bounce back after a rough early game. And then we were big fans of Guma, his positioning in the team fight was also impeccable. And I think it's that core that really ended up being the difference maker here. But Zeus picking up a team fighter shows that T1 with a front line can definitely match Humble Life when it comes to the team fights. Yeah, I mean, especially the TPing behind and just like the actually pop the Azir, I think that's so big. Like, if, like I think the, especially after the, they get the Baron, like with the, this competition, like with actually having the Santa Quirky, I think it's just like the complete over. But we did something. <laughs> We did something. You guys yeah, did something. I, I, well, I mean, I stand by shout it. out to Guma, though. Like, he played so well. He had a 100% KP. Yeah. He, he didn't make any single mistake. Yeah, it isn't what it used to be. Yeah, I kind of agree with you guys. I think it's fine. Either way, guys, that was game number two. Let's go back to the casters for the third game of the series. Thank you so much, gentlemen. Um, shout out to you, Orcs. Thanks for, like, throwing our boys a bone um, on the desk there with one of your media guys throwing a vote over to Gumushi to make them not look as silly. Yeah, the problem is now they just look like the three media uh, together. Yeah. Um, so... Yeah. I don't know, man. Media's making a comeback. Before I asked Orcs who we voted for, which is the first thing I did as soon as we went off air, was I thought I was going to be in the minority for voting for Zayas. I thought most people were going to vote for Guma. I think it was pretty contentious between the two of them. As Guma made such a big impact in that last fight, or the first fight rather we saw there on the space was really the, the first big step. And I mean, there's a ton a ton of things that went wrong for Hanwha in that last game. But I think blue side, you have a lot of agency in draft. The Sejuani that they were able to pick up is not going to be available. I don't think T1 are gonna give that to Hanwha this time around. As uh, into and out of darkness, this fan. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> a nocturnal cooldown got really yeah, low. I was going to say. Ultimate Hunter's fully stacked there. Uh, yeah, I mean, I think, I think ultimately, even though they won game one, let's let's all be real. It was a hope and a prayer uh, that they managed to fight their way out of that one. It definitely was looking rough, and I feel like the damage profile for Hunter Life was lacking so heavily. It just feels like you know. The fact they're just sticking this this super tanky front line in front of them and they just cannot figure through it, it's it's looking so rough. Now uh, Zeka's parents, I believe, here in the audience as well. I think we've had a few pans over of uh, of some of the families of the players that are participating here today. Zeka's parents have been super supportive. You know, they were there when he won his title uh, in San Francisco, yeah. 2022. And he has had such a glow up in terms of consistency. A player often criticized for a narrow champion pool, a very one-dimensional play style. And I think this year has been a year of great development for him that we haven't seen from him in a while. You know, he was relying on the Akali. His tier stepped up a little bit, but a lot of people called him a patch zerg, you know, in terms of what he was able to do at Worlds. But he has really turned things around quite significantly. As Talia, to me, is one of the big standout picks that he was pretty poor on even early in the season, but in playoffs, he came up big. And interestingly, Hunter Life Esports picked red side. You know, yeah. they obviously had a great win rate against T1 when they were on blue side in their previous matchup, but even so, when they've had selection, you'd expect it to go blue side. I mean, game one, they went blue side, but clearly thinking they have a better handle things, handle of things on this side, despite having just lost here and won that blue side map earlier. But I think it's kind of showing that even though they won that game one, I don't think you can really call that a convincing victory. And bans will follow the trend of the previous map. Exactly. Tom Kench here was the ban for Honda Life. They might just go for the center instead, because yeah. it was definitely a problem. Oh, never mind. They are still just going to opt in. Feeling a little bit stubborn here as the center, obviously, going to be the first pick once again. Is it Zeka picking away the Corky that might be their answer into this one? Because it did feel like that was also a bit of a problem. That is Jinx just immediately locked uh, in. Now, the gate. you can take away the Sejuani. This is going to give Carrier the opportunity to lock this one up right now. We'll go into the Orn because he doesn't want to get banned away. Oh. And I was thinking Zeka was going to play maybe a Yone here with this lock into the Sejuani, but it's an old favorite, oh, the Silas. Oh. We talk about that narrow champion pool. Back then, this is one of his best picks. But they will lose the Thresh if they lock it. 
And so we'll then just leave that one to Delight here, who's at arguably the best Thresh we've seen of the season in an individual game. You know, I feel like a hover like that, it's kind of showing, like, I'm not even sure if they'd want to play it, because I feel like yeah, hovering yeah, yeah. like that, you're like, oh, wouldn't Silas be great? You should ban it. You know, throw that one in, because I think the Thresh is essential, especially with the Orn being picked on the other side. The safety net against the ult, very valuable in this situation. And they're really setting this one up to be a big Viper carry game. I imagine T1 will probably ban away the Rek'Sai in this situation. I'm not sure they'll throw a bone towards the Silas ban there. Maybe they'll consider banning away the Yone, which could obviously pair well with the Sejuani. Yeah, have to see. I mean, there's a lot of other picks, too, to consider here. That Doran can play the Jax, for example. Works extremely well with this Sejuani. The Renekton that's been pretty quiet in playoffs is another pick that works quite well. So the Talia is, in fact, banned instead of more classic response to the Azir recently. Doesn't work as well with Sejuani as a lot of those other melee picks that have the perma permafrost synergy. But I do like how T1 have responded. They instantly get the... Uh, Orn, so that Karia has a pick to play here. It's going to be very relevant in the late game. It's Twisted Ooh. Fate, rather than the Rek'Sai, is what T1 are concerned about here. I feel like it's so difficult, because if you pick Rek'Sai, Zayas is just going to go Zack again, and he looked perfectly fine in that matchup. But if you don't go the Rek'Sai, they might just pick up a T1, and are we confident Doran can match up for the same way Zayas just did? So, a lot of things to figure out here. I do think at least with a Thresh on hand, you're a lot more comfortable into the Zack than you were last game. And you should be able to cut through it with the Jinx now. Looking like they're going to lock in the Yone for Zekka once again. And now T1, a lot of junglers banned away. The Vine since out taken away in the last rotation of bands. Thinning out the pool, there is still that Viego open and available. Sin, also a very strong pick, I feel, with this composition. The Viego, though, worked, with them, uh, worked very well for them last game around with this slow Senna comp. And looks like he's looking towards it once again. Problem is, it is a very squishy jungler. And against this Jinx composition and Yone and all the CC, if he ends up getting caught first in a team fight, Jinx gets excited. Viper does have so much agency. So double-edged sword here uh, that he'll be wielding in this one with how squishy uh, our favorite Paperman can be. And the final pick here to come through is going to be the blind pick. Yeah, or it's going to be an on top lane. I mean, Could there are be. theoretically a few options that they can go for with an Aatrox lock-in. That is certainly looking a little bit like a Zayas. Zayas special will be Cassante in the end. Yeah, so wanting to bulk out the front line a bit here, although I think Han Life have better tools for it. You know, I feel like in a lot of minds, Rek'Sai would make sense here, but they are lacking AP damage. Gwen is good into Cassante. was picked as that old school counter and would stack up well with the yeah. Pikrani. So they will lock that in. A lot of power to cut through these tanks. And also it means you're not dealing with a full armor, Cassante and Orn, which I think is very important. My fear for T1 in this competition, like, I think on paper, you just remove the, the right side of your screen and you look at only a T1 strap. Fantastic grab. Great scaling. Ornament's going to be fantastic. You have front to back that's amazing. Gumusi has so much agency. But in the early game, I look at what Peanut could do with Gwen Yone. I look at what Owner is going to be trying to accomplish. The fires he's going to be trying to put out here in this early game. He is going to have to level up massively, I think, going into this one. These are the types of games where Peanut has had Owner's number. When they have permafrost synergy in both solo lanes, and Owner is playing a squishier jungler, very fragile. And if he gets put behind early, then the rest of the map can also fall behind with him. I do think it played well. T1's draft, arguably superior. But is a lot of this game going to be about the solo laners for Hanwha Life and what they can get done, what they can accomplish. And I think giving Dor Gor Doran the Gwen, uh, Gorin in this case, <laughs> uh, is, is a really great move in terms of the counter pick. He has fallen, though, in best of fives on this pick before. Yeah, I'm a little bit worried about the, the Doran Gwen just stylistically, not necessarily with as much of a safety net as <laughs> the celebration. I'm on TV! He's done it. But like I was saying, I think that, you know, Doran is going to be under a lot of pressure in this game to try and win out. A lot of late game security, but this time around, Viper is on a crit eddy carry that should be able to get stuff done. Resets versus resets. I think very even when it comes to the draft. Top of the rift for game three. You are Alright, here we are, ladies and gentlemen. It is now a best of three. Everything tied up between T1 and 
HLE. You know, I'm just glad that we've had so many games this season where you have Sejuani and no one really good to stack it with. It's kind of like, you get things like Sejuani Azir, Sejuani Corky, and then you have like a top laner who's kind of whatever, sometimes even like a TF. Yep. It's nice to have like a top side where it's like, they both vibe hard with the Sejuani here. And especially there's a lot of champions, like if I'm playing Orn or Cassante into the solo laners with Sejuani backing, definitely going to feel painful as the game goes on. I am interested though that it feels like even though the, the lane swap was a thing in, the, in game one, like a, a Gwen being lane swapped against would be super punishing. Uh, but it appears like T1 haven't shown any intent to implement that strategy themselves. And Hard Life Esports haven't seen like they're too afraid of it either. So it may just be, it came out game one, it gave them an edge in the early game, but after that, they, it's kind of been left at the door. We know stylistically in Korea, a lot of teams have shied away from it. It has been more of an LPL, LEC thing. And so I think teams just aren't ready to pull that one out necessarily in a best of five. Now we did see it in game one, and while it found success, it didn't necessarily lead to a win for Hanwha. It was clutch plays later on that ended up giving them the critical edge to win that one. As we could be looking at a world right now where T1 have a 2-0 lead in this series, had certain events not yeah. come to pass in game one. I think a lot of fans would say that it should be a 2-0 lead right now for T1. As I think, you know, looking at this draft, I really think Doran and Zekka have to come up big, as we know that Viper will carry late game if he's given the opportunity. If they can set those picks, get the Jinx excited. I'm never really worried about Viper's Jinx. I'm never worried about Delight's Thresh. But it's the inconsistencies we've often seen for Doran on this Gwen that have me the most worried for Humble Life. I'm worried too. I think Carrier back on a champion that he's very happy with as well as uh, Zeus and Doran just fighting one another here towards the top side of the map. Something that we do understand. But I think there are a lot of changes that have happened here in this game. And I think we have learned why Hummel Life did decide to move back towards this red side as well. Even though the bans didn't change, and I was very worried after that, it looks like they have come in with some answers, which I think tells us that they are willing to fight once again here in this game and haven't got out of resources as far as figuring out a way through this series. Yeah, I really like the bot lane setup because, you know, when you go for the center Orn, as opposed to, you know, like things like the center Nord or the center Tom, it's a lot less lane pressure. We've kind of seen this before. In fact, against T1, when T1 went against Bro, the center Orm was picked on them, and they went Kate Lux and stomped it in the ground uh, very unceremoniously. Yes. But the fact that you have a Jinx Thresh, obviously a pairing that scales so well together, and you saw Viper being the one with lane prior, has even had a chance to back off and pick up the call. It's like, you're not really too worried about going to the later stages of the game, uh, but you also still have an edge, which is a rare thing for a Jinx lane to necessarily have, especially when we have so many picks like Kalista and Varus in the meta. Yeah, it, it is a pick that feels very Viper as a Vision Toggle. Yeah, it's going to be, of course, Peanut lurking here in the top side, trying to bait Zayas in. He's a very aware, good game sense here. Yep. Manages to throw that ward down, spots that uh, Peanut is going back. It's a lot of valuable information, in fact, yeah. as Ona can have free reign here towards the bottom side. Decent amount of vision now put down by T1. Flame Chomp has come in. Last yeah, team, be able to get out of the way. between these two, I feel like Peanut kind of had Ona's number throughout, but it feels like in this one, Ona's been pretty ahead of the curve. A lot of times we see Peanut doing you know, the old shadow, stay out of vision, recall, just make sure you're there in case something breaks off. But we saw obviously uh, in, the, in the earlier games when Ona was able to get a flank angle, uh, able to come through on the back end uh, of last game uh, after Peanut had recalled. So that extra information, obviously very valuable. We'll see if Ona can find an opportunity to make use of that. And the next question is going to become, you know, when do we see the commitment to fights here for T1? Because this composition does have an Azir, so the ultimate there is going to be highly impactful in these first few dragons. But you're still running a Senna composition. Orn, though, does kind of change the exchange quite a bit because with the Orn ultimate and the Azir ultimate, you can fight a little bit earlier and uh, uh, arguably better than the Sejuani ult is going to allow you, like we saw last game. Because it can just be fight winning with the Emperor's Divide paired with it. T1. Looking to start this dragon up already here, even with Zaka having a little bit of control mid lane. Peanut will come and suss this out, but he is on vision. Yeah, T1 with some priority here towards his bottom side. He'll move up as three. Try and answer this as Peanut pokes his head in. That is a decent searing charge, but Arc Consult gets Peanut out of there, but now won't have that Q available. That will be the Drake going over to T1. First mountain collected here for a composition with two tanks. That is scary as Needlework has come out here. Doran fighting against the Cassante and will be able to stay alive with that extra healing from the ultimate. Yeah, looks a little bit 
scary for a moment there. You know, Doran's angle on the second ult wasn't that fantastic. Um, it's definitely a matchup that the Gwen scales into, but even so, you do not want to be getting solo killed at this point by the Cassante. It would make your late game much harder to hit. And I think the big reason they were just able to pick up that dragon so free, Zeka ended up getting chunked out pretty heavily, has TP back to lane, but obviously as much as we've seen Yone being that uh, counter into Azir, it's definitely not something that you pick for the lane matchup where you can just get pressured out early on, but will eventually provide more threat. Now with that ultimate available, that's where really the pick starts to come online. Yeah, there's the light. Nice, fellas. Breath there from Carrier. Pretty perfect. As Empress Divide is just going to push Zekka back. Ultimate now on cooldown, though. And Teleport had just been invested here by Faker. Yeah, same to be said of Zekka, who won't have TP either. And they will just choke at that refillable and should be fine here. Not going to be any kill pressure. But Peanut has been relatively invisible in this early game. And this is one of the things that, about this comp that we were talking about is so good with these two melee solo lanes. Baker not under any pressure here, despite Peanut kind of hanging out in topside early, didn't actually find anything. Zayas' game sense good enough, able to identify that, that Peanut was there, doesn't find himself in harm's way. And, you know, we're suddenly going to, you know, the first dragon goes over to T1, we're hitting the seven minute mark, everything is going swimmingly. The you know, Senna hasn't been punished in any way. And yes, it is a call by here for Viper, and he will cash in on that. And Hanma will st still have extremely strong mid game team fights with this composition. I think T1 really loving the position they're in so far. No, oh, I would agree. And I also think that, yes, it is a bit of a change up as far as where the power is going to come from. Uh, skirmishes, team fights, things like that, going to be something that Humble Life Esports are going to focus on in the mid game. But with that Drake being picked up and the fact that T1 just have so much late game insurance, it is absolutely disgusting. They've got not only all of the ornaments to come in from Carrier, but they've also got Senna stacking things up. Baker on so much consistent damage on this Azir. And Ona's Viego is going to be an, a legitimate damage threat with two tanks. Yeah, I just think the fight's going to end up being so explosive with the double reset mechanics on either side uh, that I feel like when you get to that point, you know, it, it's, it's really just going to come down the showdown who can execute better on the day. Because even though, obviously, you're going to have a lot of scaling elements on the side of T1, if Guma gets hit by Zekka's ult, I think that might just be game over in a fight in a big one. Uh, so have to definitely be wary of that. Yeah. I think the same could be said as if, you know, Zekka whiffs his ult. Yeah. You see the Emperor's Divide counter engage with a strong frontline. It can just as easily be a free win for Guma, who has, you know, so much range later on. Plus that extra healing we talked about earlier. Yeah, that control would actually surviving. Uh, kind of big there. Unfortunately, Peanut not able to get over there, but he's going to walk around it. Uh, it's not going to quite work out. Let's see whether he can actually help Doran achieve a first blood here on this top side. Nine minutes in is what we're approaching. There was a question mark ping on the tri brush. I think Zayas is aware this could be a possibility. Oh, Peanut, I believe, has slinked towards the north of this lane right now. It just wants Zayas to commit to a trade. The some ability aggressively. Oh, there's the hook! And Zulai throws out the lantern there as well. I don't think they'll require it. Isaias looks to try and charge up that dash. Just amazing. Oh. The ult is going to go wide as well. The all out to bring Zayas out of there. And he didn't even need Ona's help. The massive outplay there from Zayas avoids everything. Yes, thank you for all your resources, top side. I get out, I press ghost, easy peasy. Now he's putting the pressure on himself. And we're going to shove this wave in. Huge dodges there. You can see how precarious it was. Honda Life Esports really scared of getting ulted through a wall behind the tower. Always something you have to be aware of with the Cassante, but that, you know, evasiveness to committing, I feel, ends up going in Zayas' favor. And once he dodged the Sejuani, although there's really nothing to be done. If you have to get a melee range off him to stack up, he will just pop the ultimate. Yeah. Really beautifully played. Zeka is going to be able to get on top of Faker here. He does find a decent combo before he does rebind. Is the back actually going to come through there as Light unable to quite find the play? That could have been a kill. Um, kind of crazy. Kumiushi nerves of steel, as we can see. We'll clear up some vision. It's been a relatively quiet game, you know, compared to our last two. Not so much the bloody as uh, we will have the comms here. But look, the box is committed here from Delight. Gets the dash away. And then everything avoided, including the ultimate, which is the most critical part of this. And they see the only here in the way. we got to get out. So no chance. the crowd as well. Knowing how important that would have been for Doran to pick up a kill there. Yeah, and losing a play on the bot side as well is is the cost of that play. So, full calm collected as well from T1. See whether they can secure this Drake at the same time. You can see Peanut making his way in from the south. 
as they do get the ward over. Faker will be able to move first here from mid. So let's see what the light can actually get done here. Chain. Not quite going to connect, but there is the ram. It's going to get called, gets a knockup only on to Delight right now. But his owner goes down so incredibly low. Super Mega Deathrocker coming in. Dawning Shadow to try and keep them alive. And Doran is just dashing around with reckless abandon. The Drake goes to harm a life. And they manage to pick up Deus. Empress Divide used just to get them the heck out of there. As off, what are you doing, mate? Oh, I'm sorry, you know, I was focused on the fight, wasn't thinking about the dragon. Uh, but Doran there, enough. you can see the plan from T1 was chain the CC onto the Gwen before Doran has a chance to do anything, but the follow-up wasn't there. And if you're not going to chain the CC, Doran can obviously just press W and disengage. They all end up a little bit clumped up, and Zeka finds a great angle to engage. It was really just a nice setup for Hunter Life Esports. They'll take the Drake, the Soul, not going to be the most impactful, though. I think that the problem with that, that exchange there from T1 is just the fear of committing with the Empress Divide to try to kill uh, that enemy top laner who's teleported in, Doran, is, uh, is we're gonna have a bit of a fight over this. Um, yeah. It's just that you, you don't know exactly the angle Zekka's gonna take, which still ultimately was their demise there, and the Empress Divide is used so late just to secure the rest of the members retreating. Could have been even worse there for the side of T1. Just a great angle from Zekka, and it felt like a heavy committal until it was a half committal there onto Doran. Now has his Rift Maker online. This is going to be a big threat in upcoming team fights. At the end of the day, when the dust settles, because it is that Chemtech Soul, the Dragon Skur isn't going to matter that much, but the kill here is going to be quite massive. As you can see, the timing of this is so perfect, but then Doran just gets away. There's no Empress oh, to buy ball, but at the angle. I think the Chompers are so huge at actually stopping some of the follow-up from the melee members trying to go in. So, you know, credit to Viper for seeing his teammates TP come in, throwing the Chompers down preemptively and I think being a big factor in saving Doran. Yep, heads up play as well from T1 to know that once the Jinx gets excited, please get the heck yeah, out of there. Yeah, there's no way you win yeah. that fight after yeah, yeah, that yeah. kill goes over. Yeah, they were instantly just uh, turn on the heels, uh, summon the wall of Sand Soldiers, and get the heck out of there. To try and minimize the losses. 2,000 gold is approximately the lead here, though, for Hummel Life Esports, as that was first blood on Zayas in that fight. Kind of nutty, as we have a minute until the plates fall off. Yeah, you are starting to see, though, farm advantages picked up. You know, you expect the Jinx to be up in farm compared to the melee on, but, like, there's a pretty sizable CS lead in top and mid as well now. Hunter Life Esports allocating these resources pretty well. Now, we will see them attempt, maybe, to make a play on Azeka, but I think it's so dangerous when he has ult and flash. Thorn, of course, not having teleport here from the previous dragon fight, but not going to commit. Ooh, Peanut does move his way in, but Ona able to get himself out of there. And we'll be just fine. Um, okay, I'm going to stop him one more time. As this is getting a little bit rough now. Zekka moving on over. There's the ulti. It does come on through. They dive on in. Empress Divide going to be avoided here by the Yone. But it comes to Miyushi. Over the wall goes Peanut. And he's once again met with another T1 member. And they are routed where they stand. I mean, this is a huge overcommitment there. And there's a reason why Owner is going to back in that location and not feel too afraid. His ultimate there helps buffer him away. He still gets caught, of course, by Peanut's ultimate. It gives him a ton of distance there. The Empress Divide is going to be massive in turning this fight around, and it's just hard forcing when they don't need to, and this has kind of been the story of Hanwha Life in these last two games, is forcing fights here on the targets, but they don't have enough information. Look at the vision that they don't have anywhere to the far left here of Owner. You've got to remember Faker is also here, and this is just a huge overextension. I don't, I don't understand the sequencing, because Ono was one auto away from the passive being stacked, and then, you know, we saw Peanut opt to go for the ult. Like, Q in, get the final auto, stun, then ult if you want to kill him. If you're just going to throw the ult out, then back off if he ults it away. Like, they committed so much, and I feel like they could have just burned his ult and backed off, uh, especially since they didn't have backup on the play. They are now looking for this Herald, though. Do you want to move and try and follow up? Zekka does have TP. Yeah, Doran has made it in. There is the teleport for the Yone. Zayas off on an angle, has a Mega Blast turn to get himself into that front line exactly where he wants to be. Death Sentence goes wide, and now Doran into the mist. Has been a bit immune, but Kumiyushi, he's not. The Yone dives on top of him. Super Mega Death Rocket needs yet another fight. Started off with a Jinx getting excited. His owner not able to get his own reset. Great hook, but it's onto Zayas. That's not a priority target, and that movement speed for Viper is now wearing off. Oh, that Q, but it's a great catch from Delight, and Peanut's going to lock down that kill. Now, Kumiyushi running for the hills, great lens, but it's not going to dodge a rocket. 
That is going to go into the back of his head, and T1 once again going to lose out on the fight. Good flash from Faker, but these death sentences are just magnetic. Delight's thrash has been so good in playoffs, and you look at this, this situation here for, for T1, and yeah, you trade kills, but it's never a trade up when Viper gets excited. With that death sentence connecting, he can follow up on such high range, gets excited again, and T1 never going to win that extended fight. Anwal Life with a really nice front to back there, and it's, I feel, really telling of what we may see in the late game once the, the crit items are really finalized here. This is Viper just sitting on Kraken Slayer right now. Later on, a trade of picks like this could be even more devastating. And I feel like it could have gone so much worse if Zeka had ult here. Like, he gets the double knockup, doesn't have ult to follow up. Guma could have just been dead there and then. Doesn't even get him. They isolate the Gwen. But the thing is, like, this is a 4 for 4. They could have just backed away from this situation, but Zeus goes hunting for more. And it's just so well played. This is kind of the Viper delight we were looking for in this series. Delivering so well on this duo of picks. And then here, pushing forwards, Guma tries to cleanse, but doesn't get it. And I just feel like the value they're getting on the back of these two picks is just massive. Yep, Sejuani value for Humalife Esports cannot be overstated. And once again, this time Peanut having an even better performance than what we saw in game number one. I feel like he's much more present, maybe too present, if we're going to include that uh, play previously. But it's definitely better to go that direction than it is the direction of passivity, I think, especially uh, when you have a composition like this put together that thrives in the chaos. See whether they can keep it up, though, because, of course, this series is not necessarily one that has been predictable outside of, I guess, the last game. Game one taught us anything. It's uh, just expect the unexpected. Uh, Zayas going to dive out of the brush, and Zayas, uh, sorry, Zeka seems like he's just not too worried about the whole situation at all. I will say, and I, I think we can all pretty confidently say this is not either of these teams' peak performance we've seen in playoffs just yet. I think T1 is looking a lot better than they did in their last two series, but I don't think this is necessarily their best as nerves are so high. You know, it'd be T1 yeah. breaking records here if they go to another finals. Hanwha, first finals for the org, and new finals for us as well, of course, excluding the Rocks Tigers. And, you know, there's so much on the line here. And we are seeing some quick and hasty decision making. Yeah. Definitely, you know, it feels like sometimes a lot of back and forth. It feels like one team makes a questionable decision than the other team does. But I think one thing to be said is that they are very quick to punish when these mistakes do come out. This really looks like these teams are very evenly matched as well. Just on the neutral play around the map. So. I think both of them feeling like they need to make like that play to get to that next level, that unexpected play that could possibly just create that edge. That might be throwing Shelly down here towards this top side as Zayas deals with the minion wave really nicely. The ulti is buffered and it's thrown out by Zayas as well. So he's not going to die and not going to be able to catch the Yone as T1 looks to go for the counter punch here in mid lane. Teleport to come through from Doran make sure that they are able to hold on to that and they will be able to do so. Still getting a teleport, big news. Yeah, ends up being pretty favorable. The fact that the Herald was being top and you don't even immediately get the tower, you know, Zayas doing a good job of dealing oh. with the pressure there. You do see them moving over to capitalize, so now with this pressure on the top of the jungle open. Yeah, Gumushi actually sticking around for a little bit longer than he needs to as the Permafrost and Super Mega Death Rocket to give the kill to Viper. So that's a play you make if you have cleanse, and perhaps a thrash on your team to lantern you out, but the cleanse was a few seconds away, oh, and you don't no. have the safety net to get you out of that situation. Oh, and they're just pushing a uh, carrier out as well here. Viper is already so big, and went for the last whisper second here. LDR are going to be finished soon. You have to imagine with that additional kill, he's backing now, and that's going to make breaking through this tank line, the Orn, and this Cassante so much easier. Love it as a second item choice here with the Kraken Slayer. And Guma tries to clear this ward here, sees Peanut, and he does not have cleanse, as you mentioned. You can see it there on the bar to the bottom of the screen. It's so easy to follow up. The kill going to Viper is well worth his ultimate. And this is a really nice pick here. Now, no objective up just yet. There's no capitalization here for Humble. It's just an exchange of gold here, really, as this game is still so close. Yeah, but it is now the LDR. And I feel like if I'm a tank, if I'm in Zayas or Carrier's position, and I look at the enemy team, and there's a Gwen, and there's a Yone with Play the Run King and then a Jinx with Kraken Slayer LDR. I'm not feeling like a tank anymore. No, no. Realistically, they're very much... Do you just go back and build a BF sword at that point? What about... Like, I'm just play. not even going to try. What about Kraken Slayer Viego? <laughs> I mean... Paper Man, he's not so tanky as he is. No, that's true. Yeah. So he's going to benefit um, from the fact that Hamalife Esports have indexed so hard into counter tank. 
But I love it because this is a reaction from Hamalife oh. Esports about not being able to deal with tanks at all just in the previous they just game. Double TP. They know Doran doesn't have TP. They just double TP to start it. This is a wild attempt, but it's going down fast. Yeah. The uh, control one in the back of the pit is going to be taken down, but it does give Homolife Esports full information. Hook now going to come on through. Flame Chompers go down. They do manage to secure the Baron, but can they find the fight? As they split the Red Sea is in goes the Yone finds absolutely no one. Double knock up from Carrier is fantastic, and they're on top of Viper in an instant. Double kill for Faker, and this is on top of the Baron they've already taken. Homolife Esports just caught napping. And this is how you know, I mean, Faker ends up picking up the kills here, but you know this is a Faker call. This is his experience. They know they're tracking the teleport on Doran. He's not there, and T1 make these calls all the time. It's a trademark T1 moment. 20-minute Baron set up for it, forced them into a poor fight, and Peanut not able to get anything. No steal there. And then Zekka decides instead of saying, oh, we have to cut our losses here, maybe leave the Gwen on the side, and just try to defend. They hard commit, and his ultimate, as you mentioned, parts the blue sea here, essentially. Yeah, sorry, blue sea. That's, it was it red on the red colored, They're red colored <laughs> jerseys. It so. ended up yeah, being yeah, yeah. a double smite there. Carrier had the summoner spell, so the, there was no chance of Peanut stealing. Yeah. They had complete confidence the 50-50 wasn't going to come through. And the Orn, or, or Horn that comes through the call, the Forge God completely denies the right side of the fight as Faker follows up with the Emperor's Divide. A beautiful Baron take for T1. Absolutely gorgeously played. They'll now move over, even out the Dragon count as well. The kill count uh, actually just evened out there by T1, but I feel like it is so much more. The amount that they're going to be able to pick up off the back of this one, gigantic already. The outer ring has been removed. Two turret the lead for T1. And that may have just been the straw that breaks the metaphorical camel's back here. Yeah, I mean, in this one. the map control that you get with this is more valuable than the gold you get from the team fight. They get both. And this means that it's so difficult now for Honda Life to set up four objectives. This is Chemtech Soul. So, you know, they're not going to feel too horrible about that. They can sit back and farm a decent amount here for Viper to get that third item online. But it means that Gwen is not a side threat. She hasn't really been this entire game and was abused because she didn't have teleport in the last fight. And that Baron attempt ends up coming successfully through here for T1. And now as Hanma, you're just kind of sitting on your hands here for a little while, not really able to engage or flank with no vision, no teleport wards for Zekka. Yeah, they do have the teleport. So there's at least that. He can teleport onto the ward or something like that. They get a nice knock up onto Doran, but he's just barely inside the mess. They do get the Glacial Prisoner's Carrier. They have stepped too far forward. That is a lot of CC, but he just baited them in. And then the ram comes down. Viper trying to dodge, but he's going to get thrown back into the waiting arms of T1. It's more kills for the god of the mid lane. And T1, they're looking to take more. It just feels like Honor Life Esports aren't prepared. T1 firing on all cylinders. They're the ones setting the pace of the game. Where is Zeka in that fight? They're just not present. It feels like they kind of have the game too, just fallen out of control. And T1, they are driving the pace of this game, driving the pace of the series, and looking to end here and now. Yeah, and frankly, after the beginning of game one, is Zeka here not going to get anything done with this? Yeah, Doran, he's, uh, he's inside his mist, and he will be able to at least protect this Nexus turret for now, 23 minutes into the game. And so uh, it is pretty difficult to push Nexus turret. You look at that top fight, and there's no there's no great flank angle for Zekka. There's no way to engage except to just brute force it. And they're trying to, once again, just like they did in game two, oftentimes force it into a tank here that is itemizing its support, yes, on the Orn, but he's very tanky. And the idea here is if we burst him down, if we kill him, Viper pops off. And if Viper gets excited, we can actually chase down these kills. We can win this fight. And it's the knife's edge that T1 walk here with Carrier. He's super low, gets ulted here. This kite him back, and this is unfortunately for Peanut. Big overextension. Zekka not able to do anything in this, not present at all. And it's just a really easy cleanup from here. If you get that kill onto Carrier, maybe you have a prayer in the fight, but he lives. You know, yeah, and the Yone like, teleport was so late so as well. late. It's like, if you're going to commit to that play, it's very clear they thought, oh, Carrier's overextended, we'll just kill Carrier and, and disengage from the play. But if you're going to commit to that play, you should go all in. You should be like, okay, Zekka, TP now. We're trying to kill Carrier. Zekka could come in. There was a ward uh, near the red buff where he could have come in on a side angle, finished the kill, and provided some pressure. I just think Hanwha Life Esports aren't respecting T1 in this situation, and T1 are uh, really just finding any window to punish them, and now the gold lead is blown up to 4,000. Yeah, it's not, you know, completely game-breaking. The Ram is going to come on down. Doran, even hit by that one, does have to put down the miss to make sure that he survives. As Carrier, once again, just soaking every button he can find. Peanut's ultimate now on cooldown. 
which is a big one for trying to get these resets in order. Viper turns up into the team fight. Let's see whether Hummer Life Esports can stand their ground here on this inner turret on the bottom side of the map. Hook isn't is actually going to connect, but Zeus just does not care about it. They've got two tanks that can eat CC. Yeah. As owner isn't one of them. Um, you know, the light's hitting a lot of hooks, but not not many no really follow followed up on. Not really any where they're like, okay, this is actually our go time. He's it's just the press W and I'm fine uh, and composition there's, here from T1. There's so much disengage here for T1 if Zekka ults in to try to follow up on the Viego. He just is going to get instantly popped. The fact that Faker can sit back here with Ember's Divide and Flash is so horrifying. Another hook this time. It's on to Faker. He finds the playback as well, but the sands can be shifted. And a Faker is going to be all right. I'm like, really excited because Delight's landing so many of these great hooks. I feel like the only person they would want to go on is Guma, but Guma has cleanse. So even if he does hit a hook on, on Guma, it gets cleansed. They're probably not going to go in on it. So the fact he hit two hooks onto Faker in that passage of play and neither of them was the signal to go just shows how rough the state of the game, in, game is for them now. And how powerful Baron is into a composition like this that doesn't have amazing wave clear outside of the Gwen who wants to be trying to deal with this top side wave, the super minions coming through. It's really easy for T1 to just carefully siege. Leandri's format upgraded here with the ornament, right? So you got the Jack Show's upgrade and T1 just gets stronger from here. The Senna gets scarier and scarier to deal with and this Cassante wasn't put down in lane, has a bounty right now, is also being such a big threat. Here you go, extra attack damage 60, the extra range here is gonna get bigger and bigger with 80 stacks online here for Guma already. Hanwha Life need picks and they need to secure the elimination. Hooks alone won't get it done. They need to fight on their terms with Zekka having a big ultimate, but he's been so invisible in these fights because T1 have just never allowed him any flank angles. Look at the map. There's no wards. There's no teleport flanks for Zekka as his TP comes back online. And Baker can just solo this Baron with the upgrade of Leandris. Yep. The uh, Dragon is not going to be long for this world. Dragon, yeah. As Hummer Life Esports, they definitely need to be towards that Baron, like you were talking about, Wolf. That is exactly where they are. Drake is going to be secured. That is going to be sole point. Not exactly end of the world uh, losing that here, but T1 just have all of the control absolutely everywhere. With the fact that the top door is open here for Home Alive, and they are just really in a rough spot. You've got to be so scared, because if Carrier ends up being able to rotate Smite again, and the double Smite is there for T1, it's going to be so hard to steal a Baron, you're going to have to commit TPs if you've got, like, Yone and Asylum. And you can see now, they're actually just not putting anyone bot because they're so afraid of this. But if you end up burning TPs, then we're going to repeat of the previous Baron. Really, Hunter Life Esports have the work cut out of them trying to prevent this objective from being taken, but T1 are just waiting for that window, waiting for the opportunity. Carry is positioning so good here. And, you know, owner's not really in danger at all. Look at the lack of vision here, trying to identify where the best target is. Peanut does have flash. So yep. one smite, so don't have to threat the double smite. I think it still still needs a while before you can rotate it through again. T1 playing very respectfully, making sure that they're not going to overstep, not giving Hummer Life Esports a way back into the game, and not allowing a repeat of game number one. I imagine there's a lot of T1 fans out there that are very happy about that uh, approach to this game because it wasn't exactly the cleanest then. This time, certainly looking a whole lot better as Ona looking to come over. Clear out some vision. And Peanut going for that reset angle. Put a few extra items together, as we can see here, about two and a half. Um, but that is going to be mirrored pretty perfectly here by Ona right now. Three items for both of these tanks. Three and a half for Carrier, who has so much money, even if he has been flame horizoned by the Jinx. It just doesn't really matter at all. Because Viper, he's only got three items himself. The Infinity Edge is going to be really important in this fight as T1, they will find Delight here as they round the corner. Zekka's not here, he's gonna have to teleport in very likely. He doesn't have a ton of time. Yep, they do have information that this is going down. Mega Scryer is going to come on in there. Carrier doesn't have the smite available as Control Ward will go down. Ornhorn sounds here as they look for the turn. Knockup is going to land, but it's on to Zekka. It's not Viper this time, but they have now split up Homo Life Esports. Haven't quite been able to find the engages. Doran, not exactly an optimal target. As he does get into his mist, does have some immunity, as they say. Looks like we might just rinse and repeat here, set up for another start on this dragon, because there's no vision for Hanwa. This brush, so scary. Look at Peanut skirting around the edge. Yeah, the multi-man knockups that can come on through here as the hook is going to connect. Carrier breaks his rock the last second. Yeah, the Great Bellows Breath there knows he can just walk into the chain range there of the death sentence and just walk it off. So many, uh, such a tanky front line, and that fact that he could just become unstoppable 
makes it really tough to engage onto him. He's one of those tanks that's just never going to be broken. You have that plus the Cassante, who also has his own unstoppable. You can't get that pick on the tank to then get the reset for the Jinx to then pop off. If it's yeah. just carry on Zayas is rotating that unstoppable constantly. You see a really big wave actually stacked up in the bot lane that Hotline Esports just aren't dealing with while they're waiting over here. The waves are in favor of T1. Viper actually back, so... He did. I wonder what he was actually going back for. As the Super Mega Death Rocket comes on in, it just sails over the top of the Baron as T1 do back away. But you can see this gigantic wave that you were talking about is going to crash into that bottom inhibitor turret. T1 running out of wards, I believe, something like that, just making sure that they go back, get as strong as they possibly can be. And yeah. kind of the whole passage of play there on a knife's edge between both of these teams, no one really able to commit to getting any big advantage. Yeah, you can see Honor Life are really cautious about actually committing someone to the side lane, because if you end up doing that and being the TP, then we saw earlier how much you can be punished for lack of the resource. So they kind of just hung around. It did mean they missed out on a lot of side wave golden experience, but at the end of the day, they didn't let the Baron get taken. Dragon spawn in a minute, which they can obviously pull them towards. Oh, that's a little bit scary, although it was there. So he's not too worried about it. T1, all grouped up once again as the ramp not actually going to connect. Carrier, going to be interrupted on that one. Got the lights flash, at least. Yeah, thankfully they do have one other goat on the team. Not going to have another one for this fight coming out of Beyond. I feel like Delight's doing a really good job of fishing for hooks, but the problem is if he's on the front line, he's the person who can't be Lantern, so he ends up losing his flash there. If Peanut's the one who's like stepping forwards and the Lantern can be thrown, chances are if the enemy team throw out some abilities, you only lose that cooldown. You don't have to burn anything more, but now Delight being flashless when he's often the one stepping up to secure vision when T1 have been starting Baron. I think this might be the signal for them to make a pick. With IE available here, it has been for a while for Viper. I mean, he does so much damage if he can get that first reset and get excited. I think T1 playing so respectfully around one pick and they probably lose the fight. So even though it often looks like T1 have a really nice angle to engage or Emperor's Divide, if one target gets picked, if Delight is able to set that hook up into a Sejuani ult or vice versa, Viper gets a kill. They almost never win those, even with late game Senna here. Does now have the upgrade of opportunity though. And I mean, T1 just getting stronger and stronger by the moment. They can stall this game out. It favors them, especially when Doran's not able to side lane. Yeah, just finished Rabadons as well for Faker. Time to back in on that, so. And uh, we do have Zekka taking down this Drake, so that's going to even things out as far as Dragons are concerned. If he stays on it, does have Teleport, can join this fight at a moment's notice. As T1, they have got this Baron down extraordinarily low. I think it's actually going to be taken this time. Never mind, they are going to turn the big Teleport as Empress Divide. Going to be flashed out of the ulti avoided once again. As Zekka also gets himself out of trouble. Doran going golden, but he is so incredibly low and will be taken out. The hook comes in and there is another ram to come down. Peanut flashing away and this time the Searing Charge is not going to do it. But Delight is not going to be oh. so lucky. The double knockup is gigantic from Zekka who once again drifts away from the fight. But Humble Esports have lost too much and T1 have lost no one. They lost no one, no kill for Viper, no reset to come through. And it was so close there. The angle for Zekka, he had it, but he whiffs it. Faker mistimes the ultimate, but Zekka's not able to follow up with anything there. And it's not a trade. We've seen so many of the trades go on life's way, which one for one, Viper lives. Oh, Peanut possibly engaged on here, as Jonah Strong is giving us the full zoom. That is massive, the snare is Zekka! Gonna be taken out at the same time as the Baron! Kumeyushi with the fancy moves! And T1 are gonna march up the mid lane. And now without the Yone, who has been that threat on the back line, every time we've seen Guma in trouble, it's usually been Zekka, the one providing the threat. Hard Life Esports in a much worse position to try and fight this off. I think they just have to give up the mid inhib, but their top inhib is open, so this could just be double inhib for T1 before Zekka's even back up. Whoa, uh, Doran not immune. Uh, I can confirm, taking a lot of damage here from Faker with that Leandri's anguish and T1 gonna take their first Nexus turret. That was dead in a blink of an eye. One they cannon still minute in here. Position, yeah. Still allowing them to continue to put the pressure on. They can take out this inhibitor here in top side. Two inhibs down, waiting for that next wave. Hanwha life, seven seconds for Zekka, but how much of an impact will his ult really make? It hasn't been. 
his day here. It hasn't been his game. Yep, there's the Ram once again. It is the ulti from Peanut, but not able to interrupt the call of the Forge God. Now Doran doing a lot of work with his scissors as Peanut able to get back, but that's not a reset for Viper. Just barely not able to get it done, and the Yone falls down. It's under the locks, that one up, and now it's his turn to pop up in the fight. Vega finds a triple just immediately, and T1 moved to match point. What a great game. What a great game from T1. Yeah, man. I, I mean, everything, everything they did was so clean. The carrier, Zay is staying in the front line, absorbing hooks, absorbing pressure, non-stop all game long, and controlling team fights with the Horn Horn as well. Just locking them out of any play, any agency. I just felt like there was nothing Hanwha could do start to finish. I think the Senna deserves a real big look coming into this potentially final game of this series as T1 just dismantled them two games in a row with it. Yep. You know, it feels like they keep banning the Tom because they know the Senna's coming. And you could just ban the Senna. Why deal with it? You're like, oh, if we take away the Tom and the Nautilus, it's going to be weak enough for us to handle. Two games in a row, that's been proven wrong. And I think going into this series, everyone knew Hunter Life Esports had looked in better form, but we always were aware that T1 has this ability just to level up. That was the caveat. We're like, okay, can T1 level up to the form we know they can perform at and challenge Hunter Life? And this series could have been a 3 0. You know, if it wasn't for a clutch moment from Hunter Life Esports in the early game, this could have just been a 3 0 for T1. They are driving the pace of this game, they are the ones ensuring that they. Uh, are in control throughout the entire thing and Hunter Life Esports, it just feels like they're falling apart. It's the prophecy of T1 leveling up in lower bracket once again. It's, the, it's what the believers said would happen and it looks like it might come true. It may, but there is another opportunity for Hunter Life Esports. A short break from us, we'll be back with the desk and then match point for T1. いや、もう俺今日で。さっさと、さっさと、さっさと、さっさと、さっさと、さっさと、さっさと、さっさと、さっさと、さっさと、さっさと、さっさと、さっさと、さっさと、さっさと、さっさと、さっさと、さっさと
포스트맨아! 내가 없는 곳에서 최강을 논하지 말라! 지지율이 많이 올라갈 것으로 예상돼요. 베스트게이 최초의 3000킬입니다. 메이크! 원! 원! 스탯! 이게 지원이라는 이름이군요! Hello and welcome back to the desk here. After game number three that T1 was also able to take down, now taking the lead two to one in this lower finals. Not exactly what we were expecting, but able to win this one with another kind of beefy composition with the Senna. Mao, you like this draft from the get-go. I really did. I think that T1 have figured out that with the style how our life like to play, which is front to back centered around Viper, having Senna plus frontline just is so insanely difficult to chew through. If you look at this draft as well, Senna gives so much extra sustain to the frontline that you have. Viego is extremely slippery, and it leads to a situation for Hanwha where the only one that you can really try and engage on and start these fights with these high threat solo laners is the Senna, which with Guma and how he positions generally wasn't an option. And even this Viego pick that I, I don't, I'm not super excited about, I think Owner has been able to at least not be a liability and once you start getting the kills and fights, ends up being huge. Yeah, I mean, I was a, I was a kind of actually scared of the picking Viego, but the, actually, they since they have the Orn and all the Cassante, the double front line with the... Also, if you pick one more tank on the jungle, the balance is like probably too much front line. Also, they have a Senna AD carry as well. So I think it was like really kind of... Like, it fit really perfectly well. And also, if from HLE, like, they have a Zinx Thresh, they have to keep their the pressure, the prior on the bottom. At the same time, they, they, they can't lose a single fight on top side with these traps, otherwise, as we said, like they're gonna be full behind, and like no matter what, because they have a Senna, I was, I was killing, and also Azir, who can actually just deal with the whole time against the Dismal champion. Yeah, and they absolutely did. We should take a look at the first highlight, which was this Baron that T1 started up with 20 minutes into the game. Uh, Doran with no TP in this one. Just an amazing call, because this series has been on the knife's edge, and even this game felt like it was very close. But the moment that not only did they try and get the Baron, that alone I think they could have gotten away with. But Doran isn't there, so why are they in a position to get engaged on? Like, getting hit by an Oracle is one thing, but being caught in that choke point at the Baron ends up being, I think, one of the big factors as to why T1 was able to pull ahead here. Well, I mean, T1 already managed so well even before they're hitting the Baron, like with these compositions that they are being able to actually match the goal, match the prior, match the vision fight. Like already is so incredibly well that, that it opens up the opportunity they can actually do the Baron when they don't have a TP. Yeah, and that was a great call. They also made a good one about 32 minutes in as well. Another Baron play that did happen in favor of T1. And we need to talk about the problems on Hanwha, which I think are mainly Peanut and Zeka. I don't think either of them have really shown up. Peanut in this game didn't really make it work. And Zeka, even on his trademark picks, just doesn't get it done. For Doran, I think this like you know, sometimes it works great, sometimes it doesn't. That's kind of Doran always. But if they don't start showing up, that's, this is going to be a free one for T1. This team made Chovy pull out one of the biggest 1v9 performances just to get the win. And I'm just not seeing that here today. If they don't get it together, it feels like even in game number one, obviously T1 fell behind early, but they also got an 11k gold lead that they did manage to close out. <laughs> yeah. right? so it's, yeah. It's not looking good for Hanwha. I mean, I just don't see like the actual the clutch moment. Like as you said, like they pull the push until the Gen G, like as much as they can. I just don't feel their strength. And, and also like when they're trying to make a play, I just don't feel like they are making play. Like they are like it's sure like Zeus actually play really well, just juking all the like, pressure, the absorbing of the pressure. But it's just the HLE, just all the time. Like what, whatever they chose to actually the, making the play. It wasn't, it's just not 100% clear right now. That's why you never know until you actually get into the game, right? Until you get into the best of five. I think, you know, a lot of Humble Life Esports predictions, but it was pretty close. But T1 definitely showing up in a bigger way tonight so far. Let's take a look at the POG now and see who does pick it up on the side of T1 for game number three. Because kind of a team effort, but it did feel like, you know, there were a bunch of other, uh, a bunch of players on the side that could pick this one up as uh, let's see who does pick it up this time. And it will be Zeus on the Cassante. I mean, well, I mean, this guy, I mean, as I said, he's, he's just going crazy. I mean, it was like the, the actually juking all the play on the top, like especially that one. 
it just absolutely just it just end the game right here because the, they are pushing bottom all the time and they are pushing mid they are pressuring at all the other side of the map like he's just leaving here the game's over in a counter matchup in a counter matchup he got countered on what picked red side it just wasn't enough and i think faker was the one i went for also had a standout performance on for the sure. air but it had to be him or, or, or Zayus. Zayus, I'm 100% okay with as well. We actually went split seas on the vote. Feeling like both these two players were the difference maker. The amount of space. I know there's been a lot of space creating memes. But look at look at the fights. Look what he does. So, 6 out of 14. Oh. Uh, big split, you know, 4 for Faker. We also had 4 for uh, Karia as well. So, uh, pretty nice one. And T1 are now on the doorstep of winning the lower finals and making it to the grand finals tomorrow. Let's see who wins game number 4 as we go back to the casters. Much, gentlemen. Thank you so much, gentlemen, for the breakdown of game number 3. We are here for game number 4 and T1 with the first match point of the series. See whether they can secure a victory here, move to both MSI and the final tomorrow, or whether Hama Life Esports can show us some signs of life, a little bit of reinvigoration after the what feels like a distant memory, their victory in game one. When KT played close against T1, they figured T1 out. They figured out Faker's smaller champion pool. They were able to bring it to five. It was an exciting series last summer in the lower bracket finals. I believe Hanwha have almost declined in their performances game over game. I completely agree with what Chronicler mentioned. It's Zekka not showing up. I mean, physically not showing up in some of these fights, but also just not having a great performance. And Peanut, where's the shot calling? You know, Faker is just running circles around him right now in terms of where the map movements are, vision denial, and it feels like Hanwha Life have no answers. I want to see a different draft bio here. I'd like to see Blue Side and a Setaban, or at least one of the two here from Hanwha, because taking away the support picks for Karia just is not working out. Yeah, I mean, unless, like, it seems like the solution is just reduce the amount of picks you can pair with Senna, and they'll keep going and keep going and keep going and they'll just still be more brought out. They are going to move on the blue side in this game. Still think Senna just needs to be eliminated, and you can free yourself up a ban. You know, they've been banning this Tom Kenz to deny it. It doesn't really need to be paired up. I assume, though, T1 on the red side will ban the Senna themselves. Yeah, they banned it second time around in game number one, which is the last time we saw Hammer Life Esports on the blue side. And of course, so far, it's been blue side victories the entire way through. So maybe Hammer Life Esports have given themselves a chance to get towards Silver Scrapes here. But as far as the play is concerned, I agree with you guys. I feel like T1 has just been that little bit ahead, even with how incredibly close a lot of these games have felt. It has always been T1 finding that edge, finding those big leads outside of a bit of a throw in game number one. And this seems like it's the exact same balance from game one. They're banning the Ash instead of the Lucian here. Uh, it was Rek'Sai that was banned by T1 in game one in this one, but maybe they go in a different direction. Uh, obviously, Lucian left open now. Uh, could I have seen a trade between those, though? But I mean, uh, I feel like that would be more of a factor if uh, Baguma showed, even though it's not obviously a champ he's really comfortable on, he surely can play the Zeri side of the matchup. So if Lucian and Army does come out for Hanwha Han Han Life, I think T1 is still fine. Yeah, I think if you ban the Lucian here as T1, you end up getting Zeried. And now they're saying, we're taking away the uh, Vi, so if you want to lock the Zeri, or if you want to lock the Lucian, uh -huh. we'll have the. Zeri answer with no Vi available. Now the first pick of Zeri here is very flexible. They want to see, I think they're they're testing T1. Are you playing Lucian? Are you brave enough to play the Zeri? You have to take the Nautilus with the Zeri here if you do lock that in as T1 right now. Otherwise, Delight will be happy to play it. We'll see. Tough decision to make here from T1. I think not expecting this is your first pick. And they'll go Varus. They're opting out. Yeah, Varus not with the Ash this time around. Of course, one of Carrier's favorites. See what they do lock in alongside it because you were talking about uh, Nautilus. I think it's probably a bit of a good idea. You could go Nautilus. You could also threaten the Rumble uh, as a potential. Yeah, that's what I was thinking. Either here or on three. If they want to play a safe, they could just. I mean, they're going to go for the Tui here. I was going to say they could take like a jungler here, but they'll go for that matchup in the Azir. Obviously, something people have felt comfortable picking. And now Honwa might end up just going for the Zeri. So this could be punished heavily. Varus already a pick that's going to have prior and pressure on Zeri. If you pair that with something like a Rumble, you can have a bad time, and being on red side, T1 have all the power to counteract whatever Hunter Life lock in, but they just they, go to secure the Rek side. They prioritize the Rek side over the Nautilus here. So don't go Zeri Nautilus, and this means if you want to get the Rumble, it's a little bit of a tougher call. You don't necessarily know what the Zeri is going to be playing with, but 
I mean, it feels pretty good into almost anything right now. And as well, it's good in the Rek'Sai. We've seen it yeah. be one of the champions that can actually bully out the Rek'Sai. So if you're into picking up here, it has a lot of flexibility, but we'll see. Looks like they might just secure the Nautilus themselves and into the Zeri. This is a phenomenal pick. And Carrier has been, even though he hasn't played it as much recently, I think he's been overshadowed by a lot of other Nautilus players, especially Delight. Um, he is a great Nautilus player. He always has been. And I think this is a very strong pick here for T1 and maybe a bit of a mistake to give Doran the Rek'Sai when they've already shown they have the answers to it, including the Zac. Now we saw there in-game too that Zayas played incredibly well, so not 100% a big fan of uh, the way that this has been started off for Hanwha Life. Yeah, Twisted Fate going to be removed here though. Uh, the Rakan taken away from Delight, making sure that he has as little uh, comf comfort as yeah. possible. That feels weird to me because uh, I feel like into Talia already, into Talia, Varus, Nort, that doesn't feel like a fun game for Rakan. A lot of people respect Ban to Rakan from Delight, but I feel like Rel. I feel like Rel would have made more sense with something I'd want to ban here. Less bothered by the Unraveled Ears because you kind of just tank your way through it. Yeah, uh, I think the Alistair is another example of someone that does struggle into the Talia quite a lot. They, yeah. did, so. they did take away this uh, Zac here. They just want to take away, it looks like, just champs that Delight has been known for, right? The Alistair is 2-0 on in playoffs. See what that final pick for Zayas is going to come out to be as Xin Zhao will be locked in for owner. And we're going to find out now what the read is here for what Delight should play into this. Losing the Alistair, Nautilus taken away. Hasn't been put in this position too many times. The Rel, seen this a lot. You know, he's very comfortable on this pick. We saw it already in game one. Yeah, How I much mean, of an impact he can make on re-engages. Some of the highlight plays from him in playoffs have been on this pick. Um, so definitely something he's very comfortable on. Uh, and as for the jungle pick, there's still a decent amount of options open available. Sejuani is on the cards as well, although maybe at this point Peter's sick of playing it. <laughs> uh, does pair well with the Rek'Sai though. Yeah, that's the thing. I actually feel like leaving the Sejuani up and available is kind of something that could be considered an oversight, but Harmonite Esports taking a lot of time figuring it out, could be and the Nocturne's the decision. I was going to say, it could be Jungle Rel as well, and then they've got the secret plan for uh, Delight here, but no, it is just going to be the Nocturne here. Doesn't spark joy in terms of the synergy with mid lane. You know, we see this a lot with Orianna, obviously, but it is very strong in terms of setting up team fights and really weakening the Talia pick. As, okay, we saw this once before. <laughs> He's gonna lock it. Zayas in game four, match point for T1. And once again, it's the vein. This time around into the rec side. Yeah, he says, if I'm not getting a blind top pick, I'm playing vein. Those are the only two things that happen. <laughs> I either blind a strong top pick or I R5 the vein. That's who I am. My name is Zayas. And it's obviously going to be pretty strong in isolation into the Rek'Sai, but it can be very risky into this composition, especially if shut down early. I feel like one of the things with the Nocturne and the Rel, you know, it's a lot of threat onto a mobile carry. But if you commit everything onto Guma, it, like, it's not going to happen realistically unless T1 massively mi misplay that you're hitting Zayas and Guma and Faker. Chances are you're targeting one carry, hopefully. I mean, they have been targeting tanks a lot, but <laughs> if you put everything on Guma, Zayas is free reign, he has the damage to clean up the fight, so I feel like adding that extra carry potential does make things harder when you're approaching the team fights for Humble Life Esports. It's a, a very low range composition here for Humble Life as well, you know, with the exception of the, the Azir engage range and how he can kind of fight away with the Sand Soldiers. It's going to be very tough to actually kind of kite around this, this vein. You know, we didn't like the vein last time necessarily here on the global side because of the Vagar pick that Showmaker had, but the fights were so disjointed for D+, it didn't ultimately end up mattering. This time around, I like the vein pick a lot more. As you mentioned, the second threat in terms of 80 carries in the fights. And there's just so much re-engage here as well for T1. It's also a lot of extra consistent damage as well. Some tank shred, things like that. Certainly good news. Let's dive into the rift for game number four. Wow, the T1 cries are deafening here at the KSTO Dome. A roar, not a cry, you know? A yeah. Very, very, very loud crowd. Well, oh, that is uh, a Christmas <laughs> tree in the river. And if someone's moving around very, very fast, well, that's a lot of people. <laughs> yeah. It's raining. <laughs> yeah, Doran getting full information uh, so they can invade here on this bottom side if they would like to uh, on Armor Life Esports' side. Taking a little bit of time here for Delight to get on down there. I think that should be fine. We'll speed up to get away. Just want to see if he can get some additional information and potentially deny some backs. It'll be totally fine to get away there. 
the impact that Jin Zhao can make in this early game that a Nocturne cannot, uh, I think can almost not be overstated either. Obviously, pre-6, it's going to be tough for Peanut to get big advantages. He will be able to punish the, the Bane if she is alone topside, pushing very hard. But that is why, of course, you will see Owner play around topside here. You already have Varus in bottom lane. So, going to be a very comfortable early game here for Zayas. Assuming that it's an Whoa. there. There's a big old hook to connect there onto Delight. Carrier's Aftershock does wear off first, but Delight also going to take about the same amount of punishment here. Yeah, I also love the decision from Doran to reset and get the sweeper just to play on that ward. So, Pun Life Esports have information advantage. One thing though, even though as far as tank top laners go. Oh, another one. As Carrier going to be able to get a whole bunch of CC flash out from Delight, who's also lit on fire. Yeah, this is one of the dangers of going the Q level one rather than the W. You don't have that ability just to disengage from a fight there. And, you know, you have a Varus into his area, you're going to have a lot more power in those early levels. C1 definitely. Uh, working with that, and kind of thing I was saying in the top lane is obviously Rek'Sai does a decent job of surviving compared to like most tanks that are a ranged matchup, but it does limit your ability to ever stack grasp. So you see them not taking the grasp. We've seen aftershock uh, in challenges. We're seeing Fleet Fort with now, but losing a bit of that extra health you would gain otherwise. Definitely true. Owner, be observed here, just clearing his jungle right now. Not. Uh, hovering top side is obviously Peanut isn't going up there. It started top himself. We'll be coming down to the bottom side. So Vayne going to have free reign here for Zayas to continue to push this lane. And Doran cannot really do anything. He's not going to be able to answer this. Blind pick completely punished and no attention given. This Nocturne doesn't feel great at shutting anything down early. So bottom side is losing. Top side is losing. And Baker's right. got to push in mid. And Doran just missed a cannon. And he just missed a It is an absolute disaster across the board here for Hama Life Esports. We have seen, you know, top laners be put behind very considerably in the early game and still manage to be useful as the game this? goes on. That was relative. Yeah, that was relative. Yeah, yeah, that was yeah. relative uh, yeah, happened relatively recently, one could say. Um, but that was on the other side of the matchup. Um, Zayas definitely demonstrating his resilience. We'll see whether Doran can show his as well. And honestly, you know, we saw that big level one invade on the top side by T1. I wonder if that was them scouting out to make sure a swap didn't happen. Because when I look at these lane matchups top and bottom, uh, I feel like part of like esports could have gotten away from them. They definitely would have taken the option, but they didn't go for any setup for that. And now this is kind of more akin to what we've typically expected from T1: a bot lane two v two where they are winning and they are comfortably ahead, and a top lane matchup where Zayas just gets to kind of have his way with his opponent. And the problem with with Peanut picking this Nocturne is he is one of the only meta jungle champions, and he's fringe meta as well. Normally paired with picks like the Oriana, which they do not have, where you can't affect either of those winning lanes at all early. He's just going to be sitting back and farming, trying to get six as fast as possible, but the damage by then will have already been done. As you can see in the 500 gold lead, 600 gold lead that T1 are hovering right now, as Peanut will be seen as well on this rotation up top side is instantly pinged. And once again, no impact for the jungle player here for Hanma Life. Yeah, full information also goes over to the ward positioning as well. Um, just not exactly the greatest of situations. Another cannon. Cannon. Oh no, Doran. Uh, We've talked about how this player can be sometimes emotional in these best of fives. I would be emotional after that, I'm not gonna lie. Yeah, I am emotional after that. Uh, as Carrier is not gonna quite find too much there with that hook. I'm not entirely sure what the goal was there, but it's fine. Uh, he is able to just wander his way out. Yeah, I mean, bot lane, 20 CS down. He's gonna be able to pick up a little bit from this wave here. Top lane 10 gets down. It's just a, a rough early spot to be in. And I feel like the call just has to be, let's just try not lose the lose the game before level six. Uh, a lot of power given over to Honor Life Peaceful Set. Obviously the Rex uh, sorry, the Nocturne can start to make an impact, but uh, the game is quickly slipping out of control. And really for T1, I want to see them pushing as much as possible to set the pace of this game. You can see already owners starting up this dragon. Baker has Cryo mid, has level six. There's just no way that T1 could do anything. Uh, or rather that Hanma could do anything, and Peanut is not really uh, a champion that can impact anything except taking these grubs counter-wise, at least he's going to be able to get that, and with the full information, he should be able to get all three. Yep, does also, you know, manage to get towards level five. Uh, level six is going to be on the cards. As you can see, Doran, he has managed to make it there. With the back coming in from Zayas, doesn't get to take teleport, of course, on the vein. You do want to have as much mobility as possible on this champion. And so therefore, while he was back, Doran's able to equalize the lane just a little bit. So mid realms trading here. We'll see who ends up getting the better of this one. Baker goes back. Yeah, Zayas going to move on up as OK. Flash still available here as Nice Condemn into the wall. As Zayas gets himself the fleet footwork, and he is absolutely out. Still, Ghost had to be invested. The Nocturne's position not actually given away, I don't think, in that uh, little exchange. 
I mean, and Baker still has Weaver's Wall, and I would argue that Orexai getting some pressure on this top turret versus Ivaris getting it and denying farm from Zeri. Definitely advantage T1. Yeah, I could, uh, I could see that. I, 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 <laughs> Doran just equalized the lane, whereas Yuma just feared that, like, feared the lead significantly. And especially a pick like Varus, who... Oh, no. Oh, there's a knockoff. It's the flash forward from Kerry. Immediately, Doran's like, no, nah, ain't dealing with that one. He is going to be out of flash his way out. But, but like still, like flash for flash. All lane, you're getting harassed, and you're like, finally, a window to jump <laughs> on his ass. Well, you know, actually, that's because Kerry is there. So, uh, unlucky, Doran. Uh, yeah, a bit messy up here, hasn't he? Yeah, definitely set up some tunnels in, in the vicinity. Yeah. He has to be very careful about which ones he clicks on, because... Um, I don't, I don't necessarily know where, where that network is going, you know? I'm just really trying to figure out the full reasoning behind this Nocturne pick. And it's going to disrupt team fights. Obviously, it could be good to shut down the vein early. You know, that's the one lane where maybe they could have been able to do something with a fear or at least draw the, the uh, Condemn, and then maybe Rek'Sai gets a knockup. There's some angle there in the early game, but otherwise, just not it. You know, we've seen Peanut pick these in best of fives across the last few years in some of Gen D's tougher times before they end up getting the back to back to back. You know, like the Kha'Zix pick where we're like, Peanut, I'm not sure about this hey, one. Hey, he always won on the Kha'Zix pick though. It was weird. Yeah. But, you know, this one, I don't know if he's going to be doing the winning. Right now, a little bit of a rough start here. And now he has level six. Now he is has the ability to impact these lanes and make ganks happen. Needs to get it done quickly. I feel like one thing is that normally with an Nocturne, we're always looking at the first ult, how much impact does it make. I feel like that's exacerbated so much in this game where you haven't had the impact and your lanes have been bleeding. If your first ult isn't impactful and it ends up backfiring, maybe you get counter ganked, the game is probably just over. Yeah. You just ganked for the enemy team, basically, if you if you fail it. Well, you can see Doran's actually able to uh, stay e even in farm, which is kind of nutty. Uh, of course, a lot of attention given towards that top side. That roam up from Zekka, very important as far as that is concerned. But it has somewhat equalized the gold. Only 400 the lead here for T1. I think as well, it, you know, Vayne obviously later on will shred through any tank, really. But kind of early levels for Rek'Sai, your passive heal is quite a bit lower. It's kind of about this point where it starts to gain just a bit too much for Vayne to cut through. Obviously, later on, Vayne will shred anything. But I think this is where Doran can really survive. So Honolai Esports allowed Doran to get to this point, but again, the sacrifice was Viper on the Zeri, who is going to be behind the curve and has big item spikes that you want to hit. I think Zekka has to be the, the hero of this game now. He has to have some great team fights for Zipper's Divide, allows Viper to catch up on the Zeri. Kind of like how Goomer, Goomer was able to pop back after Zeus was put down the lame swap in game one. They didn't ultimately end up winning the game, but he was able to get a ton done on the Zeri. Oh, they have spotted that Gumiushi is possibly alone. There's the paranoia as Peanut dives in. He flashes on top of the CC. He's going to be there. The Crescent goes too good from Ona. He's just going to get them out of there. Zekka will turn off. They do manage to take down the Varus, but the Zeri, nothing she can do, and T1 will win the skirm. And what did Ox just say? You know, the first gank, the first attempt completely backfires. And as soon as I saw the paranoia come out and things go dark, I had question marks over my head. Is this even work out? You don't have prior, you don't have control. And Delight will get taken Whoa. out here as well. No yeah, exit he's up, but well. I, I got a little bit confused. I looked over at you, Wolf, and then I'm like, wow, he's flashing under a turret. That was his turret. Yeah. And you can tell. Um, so do I really did. You could tell from how the, the paranoia actually went. The Hunter Life Esports were a little bit like, do we actually want to go for this? But it's like, look, if we don't get something from this, it's going to be really bad. And then they commit, and you know what? It went worse. It went worse? Just, if you just held off, if you got in luck, we got his flash, got his cleanse, take that small victory instead of giving three kills over, because now they are really in the hole. You have a team that has so much you know, built-up synergy, right? Seven out of the eight la last finals they've been in here. And Ahanwa Life, on the other hand, some pre-existing synergy from Gen G, but Peanut flashes in for this to try to get into the lights engage range, and then he's just Crescent Guard, and then Zekka, watch this. Looking for Guma here, does get the ult, gets the kill, but isn't able to impact the rest of the fight. We'll have to flash himself to get away, and Delight is just a lost cause in that moment. And if everybody's on the same page, if you're set up a little bit faster for that, maybe you actually get three kills and you walk away the victor, but this didn't have enough control to press R a second time when Peanut went for the Paranoia. Backfires completely here, and the shot calling really a miss here, the draft giving Hanwa very little agency, very little options in this game. Well, I mean, that was their option, right? Like, this was the fight that they needed to kind of win. T1 read them like a book. 
They are now going to be able to take themselves a Drake. They'll uh, convert that into pushing ever further in side lanes. And speaking of which, now Zayus, with the fact that Hummel Life Esports are going to be so distracted putting out fires elsewhere, he should have free reign. The thing is, if they had just taken the sums, they could have fought that next dragon. You know, Peanut's ult was coming up, and they could have targeted Guma without any summoner spells from a more even state. But by making that play, by backfiring, they were just in too much of a deficit to contest. So now T1 have nearly a 2,000 gold lead and have those two dragons in pocket. With it being a mountain soul, you're already struggling to take out these critical targets. Add that shield in and yeah, good luck. Yeah, I mean, when you consider the mountain will at least be pretty good for Hangul if they can start stacking those up. The Rek'Sai is going to be unkillable. Can be something that is a big boon for them later on, but Right now, I'm not even seeing dragons in Hanul Life's near future or later future. You know, stacking those up would be the dream scenario, but right now with absolutely no control behind so massively, basically across the entire map. You know, I'm not, I don't want to call this one over, and it, the first game was so back and forth, so exciting. The second game a little bit went out class from T1 game three. I felt like things were a little bit worse even, and now on this one, feels like just a whimper from Hanul in terms of this draft as well. A small lead for Zekka here is all they've got. Yeah, he's managed to pick up the kill that uh, Hanwha Life Esports have managed to collect. Certainly good news if you are a Hanwha Life fan, but he's going to have to put the team on his back, and he has not it hasn't been his day. And he is a player that has required a day. Now, that was a decent sidestep there from Kubiushi, but there is no way he's surviving this one. Peanut able to lock one down, and so there is the first one for the Nocturne. Good news. Wow, it's pretty easy to kill a Varus without Flash, you know? Maybe, yeah. maybe if they'd planned around that, then... Could have been in a better position than now, but at least they are making use of the summoner being down and get something out of it. Uh, obviously, not really able to translate that into anything right now, but uh, at this point, you'll take anything for Hunter Life. Yeah, a bit of a lane swap here as well, not the level one, but coming through here from Viper pushing into the vein here. A lot of lost minions in mid for Baker has to respond to this bottom push after the Varus is taken out. Could it be a plate that might go over to Zekka here if he can get into range in time? So that passage of play is one step of many that Hanwha Life will need to do to get back into this game, but it's a step in the right direction. Yeah, showing signs of life, and I think that is important because what we've seen is, like you say, Wolf, a little bit disappointing. After they sort of stole away the first victory in this series, didn't quite run with it. With a win here, game five could be absolutely anyone's. That's a nice size of shove onto Doran. Doran just gonna, yeah, eat through Fury, so just fine. Just Rex, I think, everyone. Coming into this series, for me, the big thing was T1 looking a little bit shaky, even in their 3 0 win against D, obviously getting 3 0 by Hanwa, beaten by Hanwa in regular season as well in round two. And it felt like the fundamentals were just stronger for Hanwa Life. And then in game one, they reinvented. They went for the lane swap early. And that gave me hope that in this extended best of five, they were going to have some cool reads. But it just has not been the case. Like this Nocturne pick, them a big hole in draft. This Carrier going in. Yeah, the hook does come on down there as they do get a stun. Carrier just all by himself. And he's really dead, guys. We'll see whether Hummel Life Esports can turn this into any extra of a kill. They give the kill over to Zekka there. You know, I, I really question whenever this happens, but it's been a bit of a consistent theme, especially since the champion has only shown up recently. But trying to kill a Rek'Sai in a side lane has just time and time again proved to be very difficult <laughs> and often just backfires. So maybe not the best, especially with how deep Carrier was. Really, you didn't have to commit to that play. No, definitely going to have to agree with you on that one, Ox. Yeah, I'm not sure about uh, yeah about that one. And neither was Carrier as the play went on, unfortunately. They weren't able to quite get there. Zayas, given some spare time here towards the top side, certainly good news has moved up about uh, 10 CS. And, uh, you know, I was going to, to say, and I, and I did mention earlier, that I think Zayas is the one that has, uh, or rather Zekka, excuse me, has the most agency in this game on this Azir, and he can maybe set up to get Viper back in this game. Now he has two kills, picks up a blasting one here, so decently ready to fight this next dragon. If they can actually get here and contest the Pryo, no teleport available right now. But if he can have a good Emperor's Divide, and we do see Viper end up getting some kills here, I think there is a way back into this game. This is a critical pick here. Uh, not really a ton of respect there from Gumiusi, unfortunately. And then here, um, not enough respect for how tanky this Rek'Sai is, Peanut being nearby. Yeah, just a bit of a bizarre choice here. They do get Zekka's teleport out, which he doesn't have for this upcoming Dragon, but he'll be happy to take the kill in exchange. Yeah, it might have been the teleport that just made T1 say, well, sorry, Carrier, you're dead. Yeah, um, a sacrifice. I feel like maybe the communication could have come easier, because I'm pretty sure Owen has full Pina coming down. Yeah. Maybe he could have signaled back off now. Dragon's up in 20, but they're actually setting up for the Herald here. Zekka's not here, doesn't have TP, so this is definitely advantage T1 as he's trying oh, to rush his way over. Hanwha, you can just give this up and go for the Dragon instead. 
Yeah, Weave as well. Coming on through as Faker going to join the rest of his team. Doran just uh, watching, well, actually not, tunneling around, borrowing. Yeah, he's just still dragging. Oh, here's another possibility as the Magnet Storm comes on down. Chains of Corruption are not going to be enough to stop this one as Viper gets his first carrier. Is now in the back of the pit with absolutely nowhere to go. It's a double as the burst fire rains down. And I, left, I don't know, and Wolf, Ox, like, do you have the pin out? I mean, I got the pin out, so the fire, you know, they did not go quietly into that bottom side dragon. Dog. Yeah, you know, <laughs> I was like, guys, take, take the free dragon. They're like, you know what, we'd like a little bit more. I think, like, T1 thought, not Zeri. I think T1 thought they were going to be pushing towards the dragon as well, and it's not the way I thought it was going to happen with Zekka, but it's in fact Delight who makes the clutch play there with the Magnet Storm engaged. Gets by for those two kills. And that is a very scary thing for T1 here. Is now a gold lead for Hanwha Life. The early game so much in T1's favor, but some overextended, some small mistakes. And now Hanwha back on the board here. And with this shiv completed, it's going to be really easy to sit in mid and farm now. Zekka does have his ultimate, so Observer's kind of tripping me out here for a second. Whenever he had these little zooms, I'm like, what's going to happen? Nothing's going to happen. Karia's a little bit late to make anything happen down here, but. You know, game stayed a lot better than it was moments ago. With so much gold being on Guma, I feel like we're going to have like a little bit of a repeat of that earlier game where like Viper just couldn't do anything against the Zac uh, and the Sejuani in his face. Now it's going to be the Nocturne and the Rek'Sai who are just too problematic. And I mean, speaking of which, this engage that comes in here, you know, T1 had already backed away, the carries win in position. The front line is kind of left to the Wolves here and carry with no flash. Uh, not sure what the cleanse was there from Viper. It was Chains of Corruption, but I don't think he necessarily needed yeah. it. Yeah, I don't, I don't think... About that, uh, I mean, oh. maybe scared no, carry with Hexblast, uh -huh. perhaps. And in the last moments there, too, oh, obviously there was... Uh, uh, I don't know what okay. he, I don't know what he did to say, because I was uh, talking over him. Oh, good that, fight. That fight was really good, and uh, I think it was Peanut just trying to give his team a little bit more reinvigoration yeah. in this series. I mean, the Chains of Corruption were all that T1 could offer back in that fight, and Faker had already used the Weaver's Wall. I think if you have Weaver's Wall up, you can actually turn that, maybe. And Hanwha Life just identified it really well. Peanut saying, hey, good calm shot calls there. That's the kind of shot calling we need to see. That's the kind of decisive plays Hanwha need to show us that they did show us against T1 and against Gen G. And they need to come back here if they want to go to this finals. That's a rematch against Genji. Like you mentioned, um, it was an okay series outside of uh, that guy in the mid lane being quite pesky. I mean, that's that's the thing is like, I feel like Hunt like make it, you know, if you if you find a way, I think like the, the tank is here for was so impactful. Like, I feel like they'd probably be pretty confident going in that rematch, you know, but this is the first hurdle and I think that confidence has been shaken. So it's good to see the comms, see that they're sort of building it back up. They are, the game is in a much better position now, I feel like, than we've seen and the fact that we pull those wow. comms as well means I think everybody, including the, the Korean casters, are all on the same page. Is just that the shot calling has been a little bit messy here. Hanwha Life haven't been decisive. We have not really seen them make good plays around these objectives, often picking the wrong target. But that oh. moment there brings them really back into the game here, still managing to keep that gold lead here. Yeah, not to mention the fact that it's about keeping them together emotionally as well, right? Yeah. That's something that uh, Peanut has been credited for in the past, but this is something they're going to need because it has looked like they've sort of emotionally got out of the series. Uh, especially in the last game. This time around, though, being able to grab those couple of extra kills and finding a 2-0 for their Azir. This is certainly going to be great if they want to get towards that Game 5 and those Silver Scrapes. But this is the thing. Right now is about the time that T1 find their first advantage in the game. It has been, at this point, very even between these two squads. And it's that first real leap that T1 has had for the last two games. And we'll see whether they can find it yet again. Yeah. Whether it's Harmon Life Esports finding their angle and trying to feed their Zeri. We'll see some big spikes come in. You know, the Leandri is finished for the Azir, the Runan for the Zeri. So a minute and a half until that dragon. It's Once a big end. I think all some going to be back up. Oh, oh dear. Empress Divide just going to throw Carrier back. That is going to be one pick, but the Baron just spawned 30 seconds ago. Possible opportunity here, as they have so much vision denial as well with things like the paranoia, the information from the burrowing Rek'Sai. They're going to move over at least. Yeah, it looks like that works just out of range of the control ward there, so that's a big boon for T1 here. They'll have that additional information. And this is a moment where you could make that call, but with Weaver's Wall being available, Owner having Flash, it's a really tough call to make. I think Hanwha Life probably rather just fight for this next dragon here with their item spikes that were just mentioned there by Ox. And with the extra kill there, they get a little bit more prio. They can push through 
and set up for this YB5. I think the Weaver's Wall is going to be their biggest opponent here, their biggest threat in terms of controlling the Dragon fight. Zeri so strong right now against this Poke Varus. She can get the agency. Is This is just Caria clearing vision here. Great trap set. And it looks like Tunnel Life just suddenly bounced back in terms of confidence, shot calling, trap setting. This is the team you need to see. They're going to bring it to five. Well, there is going to be some nice drifting coming on through there from Caria. He's yeah, trying to like send the Rift Herald into the turret. One thing with that previous play is you didn't get any summoners. You didn't really get... It's like too far before the Dragon, so I think... Yeah, it was what? a bit of an awkward time. And it's also the Baron had only just spawned. I was a little yeah. bit crazy talking about the Baron, but I think that this series has been enough crazy for that to almost be warranted. I think that's warranted. I, I think yeah. you're, you're definitely right. Is it looking to collapse on the door in here? They might be threatening the Baron. They're not moving towards the Dragon area, so this will be taken by Hanwha Life Esports. Maybe they're just going to take this top tier one. But the threat is there. I mean, Faker, they have topside push, and Faker can just put up a wall if they do want to start this, but they have not. So it's like they're just going to give up the Dragon here and look to try to push Doran. Oh, Doran could be in so much trouble. There are four people coming on over. That flash hook just amazing from Carrier, the seismic shove to push him back in. And if they just keep him CC'd, he is going to die. That is going to do it. The Rek'Sai goes down. T1 get their pick, and they might also get a Baron. Uh, tough call to make here. This is not the same decisive 20-minute Baron we saw in game three. Yeah, this is dangerous, because Peanut's still here, and he has access to a light switch. Zepka has Flash ult as well. This is really risky. Yeah, Paranoia does come down. There's a Flash Magnus Storm, but it's only on to two. Delight not quite, quite finding the same amount of value, and he is going to be taken down. It's now Viper versus Zayas. Zayas actually trying to tumble around this fight, but he's crashed into that condemn amazing onto Zekka as the Baron is going to go down. It's going to be Ona that takes it. Not able to find it is Peanut, and he's even taken down by Faker. Zekka gets rid of Carrier in the end, but they only lose one. Such a scrappy passage of play, but T1 holds strong, manages, manages to secure the Baron and trade up and kills there. It just falls out of control in this patch to play. Doran, you know your team have lent bot side. Let the tower go. You think him because you're on Rek'Sai, you can't die, but your tunnel gets interrupted. And this mistake is what sort of causes the dominoes to fall in the ensuing play. T1 do a pretty fantastic job of trying to limit Peanut's access, keeping the health at about 4,000. And Carrier, Zayas is just such a threat here. Carrier has Locket, so he can actually commit to that play there to deny them entry and then continue to actually tank up the damage. And then the Condemn here into Zekka's attempted shuffle. So well timed, so well played. Zayas knows he has it, gets an extra auto, sets up for the Condemn, gets a knock into the wall, and it's a free Baron there. Faker going to take Peanut out on the exchange. And yes, Zekka does get one kill here. With the Baron, they get the kill. And once again, just out-rotating Hanwha Life. Hanwha's so shaky on the call to contest there, so late. And then Delight just not having the follow-up there. And they wanted to make sure they could do it during Paranoia, but the follow-up wasn't there from Zekka. He wasn't in range. Didn't quite work out. And this is what we were talking about, right? This is where T1 just find these angles, find these avenues into the game. The first time, it was much bigger. The second time, a little bit smaller. This time around, only about 2,000 gold. It's not the end of the world for Hama Life Esports, but the problem is, is that it's happened the last two games in a row, and the more it keeps happening, the more inevitable it feels, and it must be so difficult to hold on to themselves in this game. They just test you constantly. They constantly test how much vision do you have, how decisive can you be in your shot calling, you know, how fast can you rotate, and T1 are always thinking one step ahead of Hanwha Life, and Hanwha are just trying to pick up the pieces, trying to catch up, trying to keep up the pace, and, and they're I failing so far. And I feel like it's always been such a common trade of T1 to go for these risky Barons, and you can kind of get a test of the team and how they play out, you know? We've seen them, at times, fumble them, then they end up backfiring, it ends up going really bad, but when they're on form, even when it looks messy, even when it looks hectic, the, the clutch decisive decision-making ends up favoring them, and now, what if I had, Fight over a red buff here. Not sure that's the objective. Yeah, you really care that much about. It's a bit difficult the uh, positioning here. T1 a little bit worried about these choke Delight. points. Delight has one heck of a flank angle. As information trying to be picked up here. Ona might be their target as Paranoia comes on in. Ona able to talk to the rest of his team. Crescent Guard does come out. He's taking a lot of damage, soaking a lot of damage, but it's not going to be enough. And the kill goes over to Viper. There is the pick on to the jungler, but I mean. The what what are you going to take? Yeah, Baron's already gone. It they, they was running out anyway, so T1 didn't have much time to use it anymore regardless. Dragon, owner's going to be up from that. Oh, oh, Baker. Oh, no, there's the face check. The crash down comes on in, and Peanut, he will be able to get the fear off. 
Yeah, he does manage to get the rocks down, but that is going to be the last auto, and that one might actually be impactful. That's a bigger one, because although he has TP, the timing is close to Dragon, so you can see Hunter Life Esports get complete control of the area before Fake is back up. Zayas doesn't have teleport either, and there's not even a turret of gold for him to pick up here with this, so he's going to have to back off here and try to group up to try to contest that prio, as you mentioned. And that was just a great set of plays there from Delight and Peanut. And they are just not going to give up on this series. They are going to constantly force, they're going to constantly keep T1 honest. Has been a very scrappy game. But you see this from Delight, he has the Hex Flash set here with the timing of the Paranoia. It's basically perfect here. Not much you can do, Crescent Guard's going to buy some time as Faker uses Weaver's Wall here in a feeble attempt to try to save his jungler. Then comes over here, looks for the shove. He's like, oh, I'm safe, nobody was in there. Well, this time, it, unfortunately, Delight avoids it and he is taken out. So we'll see what T1 opt into here for this next fight because they really just don't have the same control they had moments ago. But as Isaiah is pushing down towards bottom lane here, Delight is on that flank Ooh, again. The Azir flank, they're looking. Yeah, it's kind of massive. And Tremesense, remember, is going to be giving them a lot of information as well as T1 not going to be able to sneak in, find these angles if Doran is going to be underground sensing all of those vibrations. This is, this is Soul Point. This is a massive spike. This is Ie's area as well, so this is really fast. Yeah, really fast. And also, it's three Mountain Dragons. If oh, get this. Ona is likely to be able to get in there, though. That is going to be the secure from Peanut. And there's the Black Magnus off. Delight getting in there. Viper is halted as well. But the first kill is going to go over to T1. Delight now in trouble. And he is going to be taken out. And now Zayus, he is an AD carry as well. And he is looking gigantic in this one. That is going to be him hunting down Viper. He is going to be able to help take down Peanut as well. The hook from Carrier is just too good. And T1 are going to strike again. And cut your losses, take the dragon, and get and out the of there. Dragon. Doran, leave. Doran's going in on this fight. And yes, you got three mountain dragons worth of resistances of tankiness, but you're not going to live that long. There's no ult from Viper. It's a split call on the play from Han Life. Clearly so focused on securing the smite, but not what comes next. And T1 happy to punish on the play. As look at this. Set up here. Viper is in position when the Magnet Storm comes down to potentially follow up. But then he's like, oh, it comes through, not the greatest. And then they continue to try to push through and, and could have oh. just taken it and gotten out. And the thing with the Rek'Sai is you're only tanky if you're able to make use of the passive, make use of the tunnel. You have to get that healing in, otherwise, you're just not that tanky against his composition from T1. So Stone goes down quicker than I think he expected. And the chase down potential, especially with the Vayne in the composition, is so. Big and now I feel like they were, you know, gradually getting it back, getting control of the game again. They get the third dragon and then boom, they just throw it all away and it's T1's match again to win on match point. Yeah, this is nutty. And Carrier as well, I feel like this whole game is like, damn, yeah, this Nautilus guy is like pretty good. Because in that last fight, he just presses Death Charge and he's like, well, I guess Yuzeri's not doing anything. Oh, uh, at least not for the very beginning of that fight. That gave them enough time. And now Hummel Life Esports find themselves on the outside of this Baron Pit once again. It is pretty healthy at this point in time. T1 now setting themselves up for a little bit of a flank angle. As Faker is moving around. Carrier not going to risk taking too much poke damage here. As Viper takes down the blue buff. A little T1. bit risky. They are going to back away. Yeah, oh, they might just push mid. Yeah, exactly. I think this is a way better call. They have way more control of the mid lane. They can just shove this through. And then maybe even look for a collapse on the door And while Hanwha are split. Yeah, there's a Hex Flash over Look at Sans damage onto this turret as well. It's just gone. No, it's ridiculous. He's managed to complete his Trinity Force, now looking for his next energized item. And I think he's kind of at the point where who's really going to handle Zayas in the side lane? I think it kind of has to be Zekka, just clearing the waves against him. But if you ever let Zayas just get, you know, free time in a side lane, obviously it's tricky because he doesn't have TP, but he will just murder turrets. Yeah, Rapid right. Fire Cannon now completed here for Zayas as well as Okay, I'm like eSports. Looking to try and start this Baron off as Carrier finds himself a hook. There's the Blast Cone. Tons Trying of to damage. Interrupt the action. Yeah, this is going to be fast here. T1 have to be decisive. Weaver's well ready for Faker. Yep, Faker going to get that one in there as Delight off to the side. Not necessarily in the best position here. They dive over. It's actually Kamushi again! Taking the Baron with the arrow! We've seen that one before. It's now pressing on. Ona diving on in, and he just takes down Peanut. Matters into his own hands. And now Delight tries to go for the re-engage, but who's tankier? It is Carrier this time, and now Zayas, this is where he thrives. Viper just taking thirds of his health at a time, although dishing back a fair bit himself. And so Zayas going to retreat to the side lane, and the Baron now encircling T1. They're going to look for some turrets. You see so many calls like this from T1 when Guma's on the Varus, where they just count down. 
count up in Korean. Hana Vir said one, two, three. And that is it. The three, two, one on the call there to look for the smite and the steal. And they do it so many times. It's not even, it's not even luck. It's not even just, it, it's, it's just a T1 thing. This is so practiced by them. And they get it again. Eight that was perfectly timed from 1500. Yeah, yeah that's yeah. not. The thing is, I feel like if Honor Life Esports are going to make that flip, you need to light there and you need to try and sink the cube yeah. well with the smite. That is your secure. No one else really has the burst damage on your team composition on the Baron. So they miss the smite. And then here, they just don't have anyone ready to jump on Azaeus. And obviously, he does end up taking a lot of damage on the back end here, but whoo, dives away just in time to survive. Wow, just they just barely. Every, every time they get these Barons, they either win the fight on the Baron, or they secure the Baron, they steal it this time, and it just gives them map control. And Hanwha Life always backs against the wall over the last course of, I mean, the whole series, all, frankly, even game one, against T1's map control. It's going to take another miracle for them to bring this one back. Now 8,000 gold the advance, 3,000 on the Baron. And I mean, isn't I mean, that it looks hopeless. I think you always have to be a bit careful when Zayas leaves without having TP, because I think that's when a meeting tunnel like these people are looking for something. Well, they are definitely looking for it now. Tunnel does come in to flash out immediately from Faker. He is not risking it. He knows exactly what you say. But they just burn Paranoia yeah. with 10 seconds still dragging, so... Oh, the Black Hook, and he manages to find Seca! Free delivery with the Seismic Show! Carrier finding the angle! That may have been the game-winning play! Carrier, he's just taken this game into his own hands. He and Owner have had so many fantastic engages with his locket, with Owner's Crescent Guard. They just go in, they're hell-bent on making the engages happen, and it works out. Oh. Zayas, will he be stopped? Viper on a, a weird angle there, trying to see whether maybe they could layer some CC, but it's not going to work out. The Zeri with the man disadvantage is just not going to be as scary in these team fights. Unlike these boys, they lose yet another inhibitor this series. And now it's a 10,000 gold lead between the two teams. Absolutely massive at this point. They're going to be able to pick up that third dragon as well. And Honor Life Esports, it's feeling so rough. I think a big problem is when you fall behind with a composition like this, you're relying on being able to jump in on the Nocturne, having follow-up. A golden guy's target without summoners, but, you know, Faker obviously doesn't have his flash, but isn't an easy target to get on top of. There's so many threats on this composition. Faker has the Seeker's Arm Guard. It's just going to make it so impossible. And here, there's a beautiful combo. You know, we actually have a Zonia's Berserker, and he doesn't get to use it. Didn't preempt it against the hook, and once once you get hit by the first bit of CC, you got to change. Yeah, you, you're just not going to want to go golden there after you're already in the fight. It's going to be a waste of a cooldown. Not to mention the fact that it, the ult was on Viper. Still gets the knockup on Zeka, obviously, but it means that there is no re-engage opportunity nope. at all. Yeah. It was so like it's also, just like, checkmate. It's really fast for the travel time, you know. Yeah. If you, if you ult Zeka, it's actually a little bit slower. But if you ult through, there's no delay, no opportunity to even. Go golden, so and he has the locket instantly. So there's no there, there's no way to even burst Carrier down in this moment as he puts the shield on his entire team as well. It's just so clean. And once again, T1 just taking full control over the map. Two minutes until Baron. So just looking to threaten this top turret, but it's going to take a miracle again. Last time we've said we that before, haven't we? Yeah, in game one, you know, owner was caught. He was looking for an engage on the Viper. He was shut down a second time, and then Hanwha got the miracle comeback. You know, a game that seems surely lost. But this time around, it, again, I just don't see it. Owner has been so clean on the Xin Zhao this game. Yeah, uh, and also even able to soak so much more damage as well. Uh, Xin Zhao just has this habit of living, um, and he's been doing it again. Zayas as well. I mean, I think Vein Spotter's going to be quite thirsty. At this point in time, yeah. it's been pretty clean. 106 on the vein. His vein was absolutely extraordinary yeah, when he like played it last time around, and it's only improving. We haven't had that sort of result where he's just completely taken over the game, but the threat is always there. Like the, the fight starts to get towards the end, and suddenly Zayas is like, okay, cooldowns are unavailable. Someone, a couple of people are dead from the enemy team. Now it's my time to clean up, but it me makes it so hard. If Unlife Esports, they can't just lose a member, if they start losing a fight, T1 are able to chase him down and punish so heavily, which is typically a trait we attribute to Zeri, but T1 kind of giving them a taste of their own medicine with this much of an advantage. That's the thing, so Ox, hard. you know, I mean, Viper hasn't really been able to have that, that straight up long Zeri fight where he cleans up the kills because there's just too many threats, there's too many ways to kill him, and the fight is already lost before he gets to have that moment where everyone on T1 is low health. He just gets two tapped by the, the uh, Bane, and that's the end of him, so he has to kind of play back, doesn't outrange this Bane really either, and 
I mean, it has to be, again, a miracle play from Zekai. I feel like he has to have a Chovy moment himself. You know, he was sent to the lower bracket by such said miracle plays from Chovy. Now he's going to have to come up big on his own. An Emperor's Divide onto some of these carries or potentially knocking carry away when he's trying to look for one of these engages is Hanwha Life's best window back into this game. But even that seems like a far cry. You see the gold lead here across all lanes now for like, 2 one This is the problem is that, like, on life esports have Viper, who's strong, and that's really it. Whereas, even if, like, I, ha I honestly think it might take not only just, like, a good shuffle, but, like, you have to hit, like, at least two, I feel, of the key members of T1. Like, it has to be, like, Faker and Goom or Faker and Zayas or something. I think if you just get one, you just lose off the back of that regardless. Yeah, I think they have to kill someone within a paranoia. 100%. Uh, that, that is... That needs to happen, and then you need to try and win the ensuing fight after a sort of reset that has to come in. Like, yeah. there are a lot of boxes you got to take. A lot of ifs. is enough. It's a lot. It's a lot. Yeah. A lot of ifs, a lot of hopes, a lot of dreams. Whoa, that is a large amount. That's a lot of gold as yeah. well. Uh, for Zayas, who's now just completed his Infinity Edge. Um, They're doing door and dirty. It's not fair to compare the damage numbers. Yeah, there. that is. That's uh, a wreck side. <laughs> I mean, he's also been Flame Horizon. He's been giving all of his waves to Viper because he knows where his bread is buttered. He knows who's going to carry this in the late game for this team if they are going to get there. That cheeky little ward is certainly a good one, giving them a lot of uh, vision yeah, I feel like on this the, Baron. The changes to the Baron terrain that we got at the start of this year, there's a lot of creative spot checking rewards and we've seen both teams got to utilize. It's now being cleared out. They still have the scuttle. They'll help out a bit. They're just going to push mid and try to force T1 to respond here. Dragon's 50 seconds, so they yeah. can try and stall out for that where they have a bit more control over the area for now compared to T1. The problem is Hanwha Life don't really have poke. T1 do, so every time Hanwha tries to come over and push towards T1 and threaten them, T1 are like, I have Strong Engage, I have Weaver's Wall, and I have Varus Poke, so checkmate. Zeri just feebly trying to use poke here from Extendo Beam. And it's just not making the same impact here. Owner taking a fifth of his health, but it will be able to just walk it off here, does not care. T1 gonna back away. Teleport here for Faker. And let's see what Hanwha Life can get done here. They have insane speed in which they can take this dragon, but the timing window here, it's not like it's spawned yet. The fact that they have prior doesn't necessarily matter. They need picks, they need kills. Where's that Emperor's Divide, Zekka? Like oh, also, wave has been yeah. like a consistent theme yeah. of the games against T1, where T1 just have better handle of these side waves, set up the objectives. And it's just golden XP being lost from Life Esports, maybe even a tower if this goes on longer. They do have control of the dragon area, but. Dragon area control is important though, because Mountain Soul with a quad stack, that is a lot of defenses. Of course, they have a vein. They, uh, she can cut through pretty comfortably, but AK1 are looming. And yeah, like you said, I mean, Faker, he's got the wall. He can just build that. He is going to put that one together now as Peanut is now in this pit. Can they win the smite is the question. Great spell shield comes on down, and that's the engage here from Ona. He tries to hold on. Pump not really doing too much, but it is Ona that takes the soul for T1. It's gigantic now because they're the ones with the shield. They're the ones with the control. Oh, and the hook is going to find this area. She is able to press that cleanse flash button, try and get himself out of there. But it's Delight that falls to flank angle from Zayas to flash. The tumble and the vein is going to find the fight. He goes invisible and snipes out the Zeri. And this man maybe should just become the 80 carry. So There's good. the cleanup from the vein. You needed a fantastic grab from Carrier. Kicks up the fight. You know, on Life Esports thought T1 got the soul and walked away. But once again, T1 have controlled the game, controlled the series, and are now looking to end. 16 out of 18 KP for Carrier. And it looks like T1 have done it. Another finals. The Gen Z T1 prophecy, it just keeps delivering. And on the sixth time of asking, T1 will do it again. Another grand finals. A V11 possibility on the table. And look, everyone is going to look at this and say, well, obviously it was inevitable. It was going to be T1 versus Gen G. Just look at the standings. Yeah. But you looked at what happened last time around, and it was only those that sort of believed in the jinxes, that just believed in the fact that T1, they just get these done. And I think the lesson here is that this roster has had such consistent performances over a long term. Not because they've always looked cool, it's not because they've always looked like the strongest team, but because of, of their ability to sort of reanalyze what's going wrong yeah. and bounce back. And that's what we saw this playoff. Bouncing back from a 0-3 defeat to Honolulu Esports to now take them out of the running.
And Hummel Life Esports will take a bow. I think this has been one of the best runs in the organization's history, especially since the rebrand. We do have to stand up and recognize that. The last time we saw them, even in best of fives, was that world's qualifier and then the world's championship, and where they did make that miracle happen. Eight years ago, when Peanut played his first best of five, when they went straight to the grand finals of the gauntlet to face off against KT, he won his first LCK title. Back then, people said he was the hands guy. Now people say he's the brain guy. He's a stronger jungle player than owner. A lot of people who predicted Hanwha thought that he was going to win out that matchup, but it was not the case today. As it feels like for the first time in a long time, owner crushes Peanut. Peanut is just shut down. And that has just not really been the, the case. So much of Genji's wins over T1 pre this Genji roster was Peanut beating owner. That didn't happen today, and I think Zeka came up a little bit small in a series that was so important for him, despite having some of his most famous picks. And I feel like owner is the player who's kind of levied the most criticism about anyone on this roster. When Faker was out for his injury, a lot of eyes on him and his underperformances, but really this series he came alive, and I think his pairing with Faker in the early games when they played the Vice today, his pairing that game with Carrier's Nautilus was just expertly handled and really just showed he's coming into his form and he's ready for that finals matchup. It's, it just feels like fate, you know, every time we doubt. I mean, there were a lot of doubters last summer. KT's yeah. going to get it done. They're the stronger team. First All-Pro across the board. This time around again, with things stacked against T1, Hanwha ending up getting the win in regular season, the 3-0 in playoffs, and yet T1 advance. They show up, they have the better team on the day here, and these big crowds where the crowd, the audience absolutely favors T1. Fan prediction, 74%. These are the numbers that know that, that, that remind people that T1, the most beloved esports team arguably in the world across any esport, and the fans support them every time they trust. And even the doubters like myself, a Hanwha predictor, Get shut down again. And there's obviously the chance to take on Gen G in the finals once again is massive, but also securing that MSI spot where I'm yeah. sure they're looking to redeem themselves for last year when JDG ended up taking them out, when BLG knocked out both Korean seeds. T1 are a team who've always performed well at internationals, and I'm sure that one stings having that title go over the LPL, so a chance to fight for that once more. Yeah, I mean, it's the, it's the cup that is, has been very elusive uh, for the LCK. Of course, T1 have won one before, uh, but not recently. And so having a listen to the final moments here, as this might absolutely gigantic from Ona. See everyone. Yeah, slowly push, slowly push, it's that look from Carrier. Yeah, yeah, Viper even gets the clutch flash off to not instantly get one shot, but look at Zayas. A, a warning to not overextend that Zayas just absolutely ignores. And we love, we absolutely love. It just makes you question why they didn't prioritize the Nautilus for Carrier. So many opportunities they had, including the previous series against Hanwha. Yep. Uh, Vayne is great, and look at the smile on Zayas' face. And I think that we haven't really stated it enough. The fact that Zayas was on zero CS for the first eight minutes in game number one, and then has the bounce back Zach performance. In this game, the incredible vein once again. It shows, yeah, and it shows maturity from this incredibly young player that has struggled against Doran in the past. So getting a lot of demons off his shoulders, you can see he is very happy about this win. Look at that. They trust him. They trust him in draft, and he gets it done with these picks that win lane. They win bottom lane. I don't think Hanwha did themselves any favors with this draft, and it definitely showed in the early game. A few mistakes from T1 gave them, you know, a chance to maybe fight their way back in this one, but this series felt like, in a lot of ways, it's a 4-0 for T1. Yeah, yeah. I really feel like, you know, that game was so close, and I think it was a mistake from Zaya, so he actually stun carded Zeka instead of uh, Viper, that final play, game one. It could have just been a 3-0 on the back of that, but regardless, I think that's four games where T1 have looked like the stronger team. Yeah, and now we've got another situation on our hands where both of our teams making their way into the finals are looking absolutely unstoppable. I guess T1 had the one hiccup against Hummel Life Esports, but we've seen what momentum can do. T1 have been at the hands of it in the past, and they could utilize it here to try and take a victory over uh, Gen.G as both of these teams have uh, made it to MSI. But now it is time to throw it over to Helen to translate the interview with T1. Thank you very much.
This is Dear for the post-match interview translation with T1, who just defeated Hano Life Esports with a 3-1 score and qualified for the Grand Finals for the first ever in the LCK to secure the finals six times in a row. Please welcome Keria, uh, Zeus, owner, Baker, Gumayoshi, Keria, and head coach, Kama. Congratulations! First off, Zeus. With a 3-1 score, you have qualified for the Grand Finals. How do you feel? No, if we weren't to make it to the finals, I would have been really sad. But now that we made it, I'm just really happy. Um, you know, the air feels really nice. And in games 2 and 4, you gave the opponent high priority uh, Rek'Sai pick away and picked Top, Zack, and Vayne. We saw how well you played them in the past, but how are you able to lock these counter picks so decisively in such important moments? You know, I thought a lot about facing Rek'Sai with many different picks, and I, pr I put in a lot of time practicing all these different picks that I'm able to pull out. And I believe that with Zag, I was able to win against Rek'Sai, especially during team fight. And with your amazing performance, you were POG for games 2 and 3. And since T1's top side is so influential, it really called for the opponent to focus you down. So how were you able to perform so well? Yeah, they were really sneaky and tried to really focus me down. In, in game one, uh, I had it in mind, but I don't think I was able to execute very well. And after that, I think since I was able to counter their pick, I was able to perform pretty well. And in your per uh, personal career, you're looking at your second title in the LCK. I don't think there's anything special that I have to do for the finals. I think we'll be make we'll be sure that we're ready for tomorrow's match, and I want to do well. An owner, you succeeded in the revenge match against Hano Life Esports. How do you feel? In our last match against Hana Life, we lost 3-0, and I really wanted to do well today, and I was able to do really well. And I'm just grateful that we were able to do so and qualify the player with the finals. And with Peanut showing a great form lately, he must have been so tough to deal with. But your momentum was really something else. What was the main focus during preparation? I think Pina has really good calls and good teamwork. But I think today, luck was on my side. And your key pick today has to be Viego. With you leading games 2 and 3 to victory with Viego, what compositional strength were you looking for? In this meta, I believe that not a lot of teams are utilizing Viego. But I always rated him pretty highly. And with Viego being open, I believe that it worked really well for me personally. And you did so well with Sin Zhao. Are you just confident playing with him? Yeah, in terms of Sin Zhao, I think the champion itself is really good. I did have a lot of confidence in regards to playing him well. And now, you will face Genji at the finals for the fifth time in a row. So anything you would like to say to deny Genji from a 4 p title? Every time we met Genji in the finals, we always lost and that has been a, biggest, a big regret. So I want to make sure that we are the first seed at MSI. Give it up for owner. And next up will be Faker. Faker, eight years ago, you defeated Rox here on this exact spot with the same match score. And with today's victory, you have qualified for your 16th LCK Finals. How do you feel? 
I'm able to stand on the final stage again. I'm very grateful. And just the fact that I'm able to play on such a big stage, I'm very happy. And remember you said you had such premonition regarding uh, the finals and you winning the finals before you going to sleep last time in the uh, last interview. So it looks like it's going to become a reality very soon. Yeah, I think it'll definitely become a real reality. I think this is a really good opportunity for us to challenge ourselves and win against Gen G in the finals, finally. Now, you guys have T1's 11th LCK title on the line tomorrow. What is your resolution? We'll make sure that we're able to secure our 11th title and we want to make our fans proud. Next up, we have Kumayushi. Congratulations, Kumayushi. With your revenge on Hana Life Esports, you have now qualified for the title for the finals. So how do you feel? I really wanted to make it to the MSI. And yeah, I I think I really live for the opening, so I'm really happy that I'm able to make it to the finals. And yeah, just like you said, you actually had a great ceremony today. Did you have that just planned ahead of time? Yeah, I was actually going to do my ceremony and I saw the fog in front of me and I thought to myself, I need to show everyone something. So I actually came up with it on the spot. Yeah, it was such a cool ceremony. And we have some fog in the air right now. Can you reenact your ceremony today, right now? Yeah, it's but a cool ceremony. And you got two wins with Senna. And how dare the opponent leave Senna open? Did you expect that Senna would be left open? And we saw Hana Life Esports leaving Senna open and picking Zarya Nautilus, so I did think that they might actually leave it open. And I made sure that I practice Senna and just movements in general. And in the last game, you stole Baron with Baron. Did you expect that you would pull that off? Yeah, with Varus, it's really advantageous when it comes to smite fight. So I I communicated with owner, and I think that's why we were able to pull that off so cleanly. And now you will be facing Gen G at the finals, and this will be the same exact matchup for the fifth time in a row. Anything you'd like to say to Gen G? Genji, we will be the one to stop your four peaks. Next up, we have Keria. In the last playoffs, round two, with the 3 0 loss, we were expecting a new form from T1, a new uh, version of T1. So what kind of preparation process was there? There are a lot of uh, spots that we're lacking regarding this place and the communication, and that's what we really focused on for today's match. And the, both of the supports in t both teams were selected as, as the key player. Do you think the drafting went as, as you planned? I think we're pretty confident regarding what uh, any sort of draft that we were facing. And I think uh, everything went as planned. I think we played pretty comfortably overall. How confident are you regarding winning the finals for tomorrow? Genji is a great team, but I think we're able to face them accordingly. I think we're able to win tomorrow. And lastly, let's talk to the head coach, Koma. 
As soon as you returned to T1, it looks like you are able to qualify to the finals as well as, as advanced to the MSI. How do you feel? I think being able to work alongside such great players and great staff at T1, I think I'm just very lucky that, that we were able to make it this far. I'm just very lucky to work alongside them. And in the pre-match interview, it looks like you've talked about how much time you put into preparation. Do you think it all showed up today? Yeah, we put in a lot of effort into preparing today, and I think because of how great our players are, I, I believe that they're going to be able to show that a lot better tomorrow. What do you think you were most satisfied with today? Besides today, I think I'm always satisfied with our staff and players. I think just the fact that we, we were able to show what we've been preparing and practicing on stage is what I'm most satisfied with. And Koma, and you with Baker, you guys played at the finals six, eight years ago against Rock's Tigers. Do you remember that? Yeah, I do remember that. It's a good memory and I want to make sure that we recreate that and win tomorrow. Now, what is your resolution for your match against Genji tomorrow? So we had a 3-0 score against someone and a 3-1 against Hana Life Esports. And tomorrow, I believe that it will be a 3-2 victory against Gen G. And we wish you a successful journey in the LCK Finals. Congratulations. And that's the end of the interview with T1. Please give it up for the T1 players. And now tossing it back to the Spacers. Thank you. Here for that awesome translation. There we go. And uh, wow, T1, they actually got it done. We have another Gen G T1 finals. The prophecy was foretold again and again and again I, and again. I don't know why and they guys, did it again. I don't know why you guys hesitated. We talked about this in Talk State. <laughs> we knew we did. from the very beginning. I mean, it's just back to back to back to back. I don't know, man. We knew, and then, you know, there were some non-believers uh, somewhere along the way, uh, myself included. But yeah, I, I think it's just a it's, a, it's a form thing, right? T1, they come here on the day, they perform very, very well, much better than they did in the 0-3. Again, Life Esports looked like a totally different team. I think Life Esports struggled a little bit today. Don't want to take anything away from T1, but definitely felt like T1 were the better team on the day today. Especially compared to, even to the DK series, I think Huni said it very well when we came into the day. Even against DK, yes, T1 free zero them, but DK is a team that has a lot of innate issues that they haven't really been able to fix. And even in playoffs, we saw them still be plagued by those. Yeah, you're very, very, uh, very on point there, Huni. <laughs> uh, I, I, got, I gotta say, it's just, it's, it's just, yeah, just yeah. T1. I mean, Again. yeah, I mean, it was, I mean, the, the, as I say it, like even Gen G HLE series, I definitely saw, I saw a lot like of the inconsistency from the HLE, but I thought that T1 was also like, it wasn't enough, but I guess they were enough. I was wrong. But when every single time when I choose T1, when I choose T1, when I predict T1 rather, they always lost. The T1 fans, you should actually <laughs> like a legit. You should be happy. Like a legit. I'm not even kidding. Like that's, that's right. why, like that's why yeah. today I went HLE, even last one, even DK, I went DK for it. So what so what should I do? <laughs> so if I want T1 to win tomorrow, do I have to go Genji? What's your prediction tomorrow? Uh, see you tomorrow. I mean, I can't spoil. No spoil. No spoil. See you on final. See you, see you on final, man. Well, obviously he's gonna vote for Genji and Chovy, right? Because then T1 end up winning. That's just the way it works. Huni has the power, uh, certainly. But we'll have to wait until tomorrow to actually see his prediction. We did have a game number four.
uh, which, as the casters did say many times, kind of felt like the fourth time T1 won tonight, even though the first game was technically a Hummel AP Sports victory. T1 were ahead by like 11,000 gold. And this one was just another one, the R5 vein pick coming out again. Zayas, even though he got set uh, back pretty substantially around, I think it was like level 5, 6, when they played towards topside, he just, it doesn't phase him. The man is forged in the flames of solo queue. It feels like bringing out these really high impact tops that are, in theory, once you shut them down, able to completely lose their impact, but they just weren't able to. And outside of that, Faker, I think, I don't think he'll be picking up any POGs, but talk about the mid gap today. Uh, the Talia again coming out, being really big. Really, anyone, a, a, any sing, or every single T1 player on this, you can look at these champions and go, trust them to execute it, but they also all had their moments in this final game. It really came together, I think, as a team. I mean, I, this is like, at the game four, it's just, I really like just enjoy the T1 draft, like as I said, right? Like, they, they do have a mid control, like Oli pushing lane, and also they did bring the, the Oli strong jungle, and they have a top control, they do have a bot control as well. So it's order for T1 to actually just execute it. Like, this is like, what they're doing, they, they've, they've been doing it all the regular, the regular season. And then Nocturne did not spark joy. Yeah. Also, the Zeri with Nautilus available. I think there were a bunch of holes in this draft that were a bit rough. And T1 immediately pounced, like, every single time. You got Talia, you got Xin Zhao, you got the Nautilus. You control so much space and deny so much damage. That eventually, we got to a state in this game where T1, it did look like it was unlosable. And surely it was, as we can talk about uh, some of the plays that did happen in this game. We have seen teams try to make these side lane collapses on Rek'Sai, and she never dies. But guess what? If you have Vayne, no problem. I mean, it's a four people. Let's, uh, let's be even that. Let's I've be, seen them live. Let's, let's be honest. Like this is a, also 22 minute. Like it was too greedy, just like trying to save the top tier one, because the Baron's like right there, and where actually they, they get to pick the locations. Like it's so close to be Baron, and they're forcing the four v five. Of course, this is what T1 loves to do it all the time. Like when the Baron is, like they just hit it no matter what. And then they're, let's see what they're gonna do. Like, are you guys gonna fight for 4v5? Or are you guys gonna kind of contest? And also, we are fine. We're okay to, we're so confident just going smite battle. Because yeah. it's T1. And how many of our highlights today were just Baron fights? And like T1's control on Barons. And Hummel IP Sports like desperately trying to get in and, and take Barons down and try to steal them away from T1. It just, that was like. Most of the games, yeah. most of the turning points in every game today was like on Baron. Baron's so poor guy yeah. today. It really is, a, it's, a, it's a lesson, keep grinding. You know, if you, because T1, when they started out, how many games did we see them lose on 20 minute Baron flips? I, I've lost yeah. track. This roster has been together for a really long time. The amount of times where in 2022 spring, they're like, make it do a bet, and then they lose. Millions. Eventually they got there, right? They got there. This roster, I think you were right, Chronicler, they just, have something special going for them, and they just make it happen against all odds. Let's talk about this uh, kind of last fight that mattered for the side of uh, T1, I would say, as this engage was not really it from Hummel AP Sports. I mean, this is like probably last, it was like last hope in, uh, from HLE, at least uh, on their hand. But like where the look at the Zeka is like, he's so isolated, like he's so split. And actually they decide to go in while Zeka is not even landing single soldier auto. As, as Auni actually put it very nicely, he was zoning himself, unfortunately. <laughs> uh, well, Zekka, yeah. and, and, and Zekka, yeah. I think, uh, he might look at KDA and go, oh, it, he, was, he was the one trying to make it happen, but he really didn't show up today, unfortunately. Wasn't really his day, and that's the thing. You gotta show up on the best of five, you gotta be the one to perform the best, that's how you win them. Doesn't matter what the paper said or what the pred said, doesn't really matter. But guys, let's talk about the POG here for the side of T1, and again, it'll be Zeus, three out of three, for T1 wins. I mean, I win Zeus personally because like he's the one that never make a mistake in this game. Because like still, the game feel like maybe it was like one-sided after like 20, 20 minute plus, but still like in the middle of the progress, like well, there was uh, so many peaks that the HLE was actually doing a really great job. And then their owner got caught and Faker got caught and even, even Carrier got caught, but this guy, had a perfect game. Yeah, to the dismay of solo queue players everywhere, it's really easy to inch your face up on a ranged top laner like this. When you get locked down, when you go in in the fight too early, when you don't your, use your cooldowns right, you can just get focused and die, right? Like he went Storm Rage or Triforce. It's easy to kill him if he can get to yep. it, but his positioning was <laughs> impeccable. 
as uh, we do see, I think the, the carrier votes, I think his engages. He had a couple of missteps in the early to mid game, but his engages yeah. were incredible, makes a ton of sense. Owner, same. I, I think a really good game on the Zinzao here. I mean, guess what? I'm going I'm going home right now and queuing the paint top. No! <laughs> oh! oh! not, not you too, Hooney. Actually, you're probably one of the only people that is allowed to do that. That's uh, fine, actually. Don't you guys that. watching, generally. <laughs> uh, maybe some of you out there. Um, so, yeah. That was the T1 victory, three to one. Started off with a very crazy game one that Hamalai barely scraped by, and then T1 just Man. kinda put it together. If I had a, a nickel for every time that Hamalai wins game one and then gets three zeroed afterwards, and even game one it feels like maybe they shouldn't have really won, I would have had two, which is two nickels many, in this it's, uh, it's playoffs. Kinda, it's yeah. kind of weird. Yeah, I mean, I, I'm just gonna I'm just gonna say it in the air. Like I have zero percent prediction right now at the T1 series. <laughs> Let's see what's going to happen tomorrow. Yeah, uh, me too. Um, so a lot of Hollow Life Esports predictions, I think that's fine coming into today. But uh, we also understood the T1 predictions, right? So Chronicler, uh, you did go for it. Also, Jason, Atlas, and Jonah Strong getting it exactly right with the 3-1, which before this series, I was like, there's no way. Like, I think this absolutely goes to game five. But T1 just kind of were the better team today. Nice try, though. Yeah, I'm happy. <laughs> I, I, knew, I knew it was going to be T1 one way or another. There's no way we were allowed to have other matchups. It's just not a thing. Can't can't have it happen. I would I would like to though. Nope. Maybe. Nope. Not happening. N next year. No. Still no. <laughs> two two this years. This is just the LCK uh, now, Brendan. Oh. So um, if you guys didn't watch these playoffs and you're just going to show up tomorrow and be like, oh, of course, yeah, Gen G T1 finals is the way it was supposed to be. Gen G almost lost to DK in a best of five. Chovy carried them in the upper bracket. They got there, obviously very well deserved. T1 made it through. They had some three zeros. They had some zero threes. They had some really up and down matches, but they made it there. And that's all that matters. They qualify for MSI. They make it into the grand finals again. And we'll be here again tomorrow at yeah. uh, 3 p.m. Tomorrow, T1, it's it's going to be battle of the Chovy. So if they can handle, <laughs> as long as they can handle the Chovy, they may take a game, but if not, Toby will take the rift. Yeah, for, for, T, uh, for T1 fans in particular, it, we are still domestic. We're not at internationals yet, so you're not going to feel too good about that matchup, <laughs> given how it's played out over the last couple of years. Yeah. So where does this leave us for tomorrow? Is Chovy just going to carry? It's, it's, is it actually going to happen? We talked about T1? this in Pock State Valdez. The plan still right. stands. 3-1 Gen G. You know, I've been so off with my predictions this playoffs. So maybe I'm just going to go back and watch that episode, because we were right then. And then I just kind of got confused somewhere along the way. That must have been it. So any final thoughts before we close out before tomorrow? I mean, today was a great, uh, still, it was a really great series. Like, because the game, like, we kind of joked about it. Like, we kind of, like, you know, it was like, could it be 4-0? Like, we I definitely saw the, the T1 moment a lot, of, like, a lot of time. Like, I could actually see the T1 st the level up, like, by step by step. And tomorrow is the last day, right? So, like, I think it's got to be even more hype how actually they can be stronger. Might not have happened on my birthday, but maybe we get that extra fifth game tomorrow. Yeah. No, they'll, they'll, they'll do me a solid. Maybe a little Chronicler bonus it's birthday fifth, moments. Fifth game. Um, yeah, we'll have to wait and see, guys. Make sure you uh, make sure you guys are joining us at 3 p.m. tomorrow. Same time, same place for the Grand Finals. Gen Z versus T1. We couldn't avoid it this time again. And we'll see you there. It's going to be really hype. Take care. Mama said it ain't over till it's over Make a move, start living Don't play it safe now, cause you're getting closer It's a new beginning Only a blink away No, it can be hard, but we're here to stay Don't lose sight, see the miles you made today
take a trade of heaven Dream big like you'll never die You got goals, go get them필요하겠습니까? 네. 그냥 최고의 팀, 최고의 선수들입니다. 젠제 심장이라고 해야 될까요? 초비가 있었네요. 거의 완벽에 가까웠다고 생각을 해서. 아, 캐리! 이번 어. 봄의 끝으로 젠지가 갑니다. 다시 한번 태양이 뜨네요. 뭔가 우승할 것 같다는 생각이 갑자기 들어가지고. 역시 메이킹의 키워답게 순간의 수를 뜨니다 태왕! 